The Anvil of Ice, The Winter of the World, by Michael Scott Rowan, copyright 1986 by Michael Scott Rowan, narrated by Randy Week. This book was originally created for audio cassette playback. Any announcements concerning cassettes do not apply to this recording. This version contains markers allowing direct access to major portions of the book. Annotation First volume in the Winter of the World Fantasy Trilogy In a mythic ice age, young orphan Alv becomes apprenticed to evil, magic-working Milio, the Master Smith. When Alv discovers how sinister the Master Smith is, he knows he must escape to use his own inherent and acquired powers for good purposes. Strong Language, Violence, and Descriptions of Sex, 1986 From the Book Jacket At the dawn of a dark age, long before our most distant recollection, a great civilization thrives in the southlands of the world. There are heroes in the land, and ferocious deeds in battle, and marvelous creations of skill. It is a wild and perilous place. The oceans and forests are still filled with half-divine creatures, and many powers still war for dominion over all. Driven by the darkest of these powers, a massive wall of ice grinds inexorably southward, threatening destruction for the realms of dwarfs under the northern mountains, the elusive folk of the great forests, and the uneasy kingdoms of men. Yet not all the powers are against life, nor are all men helpless. For even in these dangerous times, destiny forges an unlikely hero in a foundling boy. Rescued from the smoking ruins of his isolated village, young Alv is trained in the secrets of the forge by a mysterious master smith, under whose tutelage he attains fantastic powers over metal and fire to create magical weapons of terrible purpose. The Anvil of Ice is the first volume in Michael Scott Rowan's spectacular Winter of the World fantasy trilogy. It is the tale of Alv's first wanderings, his flight from the master smith and his arcane teachings, his discovery of a wide world full of adventure, love, and enchantment. And finally, it is the revelation of his destiny, of his testing in solitude and his emergence as Elof Valentor, the salvation of his people, who must return to a fateful confrontation with the ice and the full powers of darkness. About the Author Michael Scott Rowan's previous books include a science fiction novel, Run to the Stars, and two non-fiction works, First Bite and, as co-author, The Hammer and the Cross. Mr. Rowan has lived in Edinburgh, Oxford, and Yorkshire. Table of Contents Chapter 1 The Forging, Side 1 Chapter 2 The Apprentice Side 1. Chapter 3. The Sword. Side 2. Chapter 4. The Smith of the Salt Marshes. Side 3. Chapter 5. The Corsairs. Side 4. Chapter 6. On the Anvil. Side 5. Chapter 7. Stone and Steel. Side 6. Chapter 8. The Wind Beneath the Earth. Side 7. Chapter 9. The Voices. Side 7. Chapter 10. The Tempering. Side 8. Appendix. Side 10. Chapter 1. The Forging. It was the chill before dawn that woke him, and the snuffling and stamping of the great bull in its stall. The dawns were always cold then, whatever the season, in the long winter of the old world, in the dominion of the ice. So the chronicles record, and though copied and recopied by many hands, the voice of one who has seen and felt speaks still from their pages. But now, on this day, it was newly spring, and the keen air was making the great beast impatient to run free in the pastures among its cows. So the boy sprang out of his pile of skins, wincing at the air's bite, and began scrambling into those of them that were garments. 
If he let the bull begin bellowing here so early, it would mean a beating. He swung the moth-eaten fur cloak round his shoulders and seized the long goad off the wall, the strange shapes and characters in the icy metal branding his fingers with unknown wisdom. The bull's tossing head, with its horns as long as his body, was no more than a lighter patch in the blackness high above him, but with the ease of long practice he slipped along the stall wall, a slab split from a sandstone boulder, and quickly looped the goad through the carved ring in the bull's nostrils. Instantly the outswept horns ceased goring the air, the great head drooped, and the bull stood docile while the boy undid its tethers and urged it out of the stall. It waited placidly while he untied the rest of the herd and shooed and bustled the huge beasts, white as soiled ice, out into the pallid air, their breath billowing in clouds as they lowed and snorted, their hooves crushing the half-frozen mud. Thus the day that was to change all days began, for him, like any other. Nothing else was stirring in the little town called Assenby. The very houses seemed asleep, shuttered tight against the cold. Even the wide-eyed faces painted in vivid red and black across their planks looked dazed and only half awake. The boy scowled as they passed the headman's great house with the painted whales framing its porch, leaping four stories to the roof-tree. When he was a few strides further on, he jerked the goad slightly. The bull snorted loudly in pained protest, awaking loud anxious lowings from the rest of the herd. But by the time the shutters slammed open he was already past, turning the corner toward the land gate. From the high old house on the corner light gleamed, warm and red as a breath of summer, running molten gold even into the cold puddles, and there came the low muttering of a chant. The boy scowled again, yet more darkly, and led the bull closer, so he could peer in the open door as he passed. Yes, Hervar was there, his lean shadow dancing immense on the wall of the forge as he squatted over his anvil, crooning and tapping away at a flake of blackened metal. The new hoe-heads that would be, new for the new-made virginity of the soil. In the working of the metal, in the quavering of the chant, lay potencies united by the power and craft of the smith to make the hose potent in themselves, a virtue of fertility, for the fields and perhaps also the women who would till them. That much the boy knew, but no more, for all he wished to, for all he had tried to puzzle out the markings on the goad. The wizened old smith had always refused him knowledge, even the simplest instruction in signing and reading that he gave every child of the town. Now he was looking up, glaring through straggling, sweat-plastered gray locks, and waving the boy sharply away without missing a beat of the chant. His plump apprentice came bustling out, brandishing long iron tongs and shouting, "'You keep off, Alv! Out to your work, or I'll scratch your pale hide for you where it itches, tinker's brat!' The boy sneered, twitched the goad around suddenly, and set the wide horns tossing a foot span from the apprentice's flattened nose. He retreated with a panic-stricken squeak, and the herd, moving close to the house, began to press against its walls and peer round-eyed and stupid into the smithy. Some beasts were actually scratching themselves against the timbers, till the house vibrated, and the chant inside rose to a cracked screech. That might be too much. Hurriedly Alv called them off, back into the center of the street, slapping at their grimy flanks with his hands and leaving the goad securely in the ring. The town wall was a massive affair, circling the little knot of streets and running straight out into the sea on either flank of the little harbor, acting as a breakwater. As long as Alv could remember, they had been rebuilding and strengthening it, thickening the broad dry stone base, shoring up the double rows of mighty pine trunks above, and adding towers on the rampart that ran between them, so that constant watch could be maintained on both sea and land. The watchman in the gate-tower ahead yawned when Alv hailed him, and made no haste about swinging the great bars up on their counterweights to open the narrow gate. The other herds weren't even stirring yet, though that would have been no defense for him if he'd been late. The cattle filed through in pairs, no more, and the gate swung to again behind. 
Alf dimly remembered it as wide and always open in daylight, but these were troubled days. Few traders' wagons ever rolled this way now. The cattle jostled and crowded on the uphill path, eager to get to their pastures, and when they reached the high meadows overlooking the town, they broke and scattered, some clumsily skipping and bounding as if they were calves once more. Alf clambered up onto his favorite rock seat and deftly flipped the goad free from the ring. The bull stared at him an instant in baffled fury, then snorted violently and went lumbering away across the meadow. Alf settled down to eat the chunk of hard cornbread he had been given last night, and the strip of salt fish he had stolen to go with it. He looked out, far out across the sea to the horizon. Soon the sun would arise and bring him warmth. Small birds were singing in the bushes, and the sky was filling with light that reddened the flanks of the cattle and the wisps of smoke that rose over the wood-tiled rooftops below, as kitchen fires were kindled. But the sight kindled other fires in him. How often he had sat there and prayed, to powers he did not know, that the calm gray sea beyond might leave its rolling and rise in wrath to sweep those rooftops away. He shivered. The breeze off the sea was growing strong, sending ragged banks of cloud scudding landward. In the growing light they cast weird rippling shadows on the waves. For a few minutes he amused himself watching them, and then he sprang to his feet. In those shadows under the clouds other, deeper darknesses were slipping across the waves, long sleek shapes lancing in toward the shore. Four of them, low in the water, where a watchman nearer sea level might easily miss them in this dim, hazy light. Without thinking, he cupped his hands and yelled. Nothing happened. If he was wrong, they'd flay him alive. He yelled again, and saw the landgate watchman look up and wave casually. No! he screamed so loud his voice cracked. Out there, you fool! Out there! Alv stabbed his arm out seaward again and again. The watchman turned and seemed to cock his head and squint into the low light. Then he sprang up, grabbed the huge steer horn that hung above the gate, and blew a loud, bellowing blast. The bull in the meadow echoed it, stamping the turf in challenge. Confused shouts rose up from below, and the rumble of feet on the ramparts. An instant later, another horn blew from the sea wall, and a drum stuttered. All over the town, shutters slammed open, voices squeaked and yammered. Men and women charged half-dressed into the street, colliding with each other and tumbling down in the mud. Bright gleams moved more purposefully through the streets and up onto the ramparts, armored men of the town guard marching to their posts, staring as Alv was, out to sea. He could see the ships more clearly now, sails furled on their low masts, foam rising along their flanks as long lines of oars dipped and rose in a fast, thrusting rhythm. For an instant, cresting a wave, a long, outthrust prow stood out, with a wide, flat platform just behind it. Along the black hull beneath the platform was painted an animal head with long, sharp-toothed jaws agape. Above the hubbub below, a single name rose, almost like a sign. The Ekwesh! Ekwesh Raiders! For an instant, Alv stood transfixed, staring. The Ekwesh, this far down the coast? But then he remembered his own peril. He went bounding down the slope, forgetting the path, arms flailing wildly to keep his balance as he skidded through the grass. But as he circled the hillside toward the land gate, a solid thudding sound came echoing up to him, and he saw the land gate quiver and resound as heavy logs were piled against it. Wait! he screamed at the top of his voice, hearing it absurdly thin and childish against the wind. Let me in! Open the gate! Wait! On the rampart opposite, only a little below him now, a burly figure in helm and mail turned and gestured sharply. No time now, boy, bellowed the headman. Should have got back at once. Get away, hide yourself out there somewhere, and have a mind to those cattle. But I gave the alarm. I warned you. The boy stood there an instant with his eyes brimming at the unfairness of it, his fists clenched. But he knew well enough there was no use pleading. If the headman wouldn't risk opening the gate for his own precious cattle, why risk it for one young thrall? So the headman would reason, and so his town. Why had he ever bothered to warn them? Wasn't this the destruction he'd been praying for? 
let them escape it if they could. As for himself, hide? Where? On these rolling hills? A little further up the slope, overlooking the seaward side of the town, was a clump of scrub. As well there as anywhere. At least he would have a good sight of the fun. The ships were nearer now. They must have heard the alarm raised and were plowing directly inshore to the attack, knowing that they could not now hope to land and take the town open and undefended, not without a long siege, which was seldom their way. Archers massed on the rampart, but they were not yet within bowshot, not quite. Alv was staring wide-eyed. He had never seen so powerful a force. Each ship bore at least thirty oars on each side, and there looked to be more than just rowers on board. Behind the low gunwales he could see other figures squatting and raising gaudy shields to protect the rowers. Suddenly, obviously at command, every oar swung upright in a great rippling movement like the flick of a fish's fin. In that moment Alv saw three outlandish figures step out onto the platforms. Then the oars swept down in a new, even faster rhythm, and a harsh thudding sound boomed across the water like enormous drums. Harsh voices sounded in time to it. The ships surged forward and the figures whirled into a dance. Alv felt his mouth go dry. Even he had heard of the shamans of the Ekwesh. Garbed as the god-spirits of their clan, they danced up warcraft before battle to set a fire in the hearts of their own men and quench it in their adversaries. And if the rumors were true, the mightiest of them could do more than that. Then he heard the sharp rattle of a drum from the town. Looking down to the harbor, he saw Hervar, draped in his gilled robes and bearing his iron staff, go hobbling across the strip of shingle where the boats were drawn up. He too was chanting, swaying, beckoning. Suddenly he broke into a grotesque hopping, swaying dance that Alv had never seen before, thudding his staff into the gravel, splashing down into the shallows. Beyond him, at the gap in the seawall, the incoming waves seemed to slow, collapse and break as they would around some underwater reef or rock. Hervar danced faster, hopping back and forth with little taut steps, working himself up into a frenzy of concentration. The water boiled, bubbled, and broke in a hiss of spray over something that rose from the depths, caked with weedy growths like the back of some crock and thing that had lain there for years uncounted. It was a huge metal-bound tree trunk, cut into the likeness of a tall pillar, its capital a chunk of metalwork. From this a network of chains dangled, swinging wildly in the boiling sea. They drew taut suddenly, then slackened again as another pillar rose to left and right of them. A fourth, and then a fifth, rising upward across the wide gap in the seaward wall and filling it with a many-stranded necklace of chain, studded with fine spikes and hooks, lethal to any ship that tried to pass it. Alv whistled with excitement. This was the sea-gate, pride of the town, creation of generations of smiths and shielded by their craft from the sea's decaying. He had seen it only once before, as a very young child, when it was used with great effect against a single corsair galley, dipping down to ensnare the hull and lift it out of the water, spilling out the crew. From the Equest ships a chorus of yells greeted this challenge, and for the first time Alv heard the sinister rasping song of spear against shield. Having missed their chance of surprise, the raiders would have to face the power of the sea-gate or go away empty-handed. But that, he knew, was not their way. The ships were so near now he could see the shamans clearly, stamping and whirling on the narrow platforms. The leaping figure was the bear, a suit of fur with huge clawed paws and a long-jawed mask that snapped and bit at invisible fish as the figure leaped. To the right, the gaunt, ugly likeness of the wasp cavorted, jabbing its stinger down into fallen foes. But in the lead ship, racing ahead of the others, the strangest figure of all swept out wide wings, far wider than the platform, under a mask with a curved beak and crest that each stood out a full arm's length, matching the image painted on the boat's flank, the Thunderbird. Straight in toward the rising logs the sharp bows came, and the marksmen's arrows whined and skipped across the water. 
One plunged quivering into the side of the platform, but still the Thunderbird danced, faster and faster, till the wings stood out and floated like an albatross's, white against the gray clouds rolling overhead. A shout came from the wall, then the flat snap of bowstrings, and a swarm of arrows buzzed down around the raiders, pattering like rain into the sea. Alf, springing up in excitement, saw a ceiling of shields whip up to meet them, saw the bear duck down, and the waspman, struck through body and throat, topple sideways into the sea. But the thunderbird stopped dead, the wings flew up and back like a stooping hawk's, and the great mask split and fell away to reveal another, glittering, hideous, distorted death's head in blue steel. There was a flash, a deafening crackle, and from the gray cloud overhead a streak of glaring blue light came hammering down into the town. Straight onto the beach it smote, onto the twisting figure with the iron staff. A ground-shaking roll of thunder drowned out the drum. Light seared along the beach and was gone. A blackened, beardless image of the old smith stood frozen in his place, the staff glowing molten in the rigid fingers. Then they crumbled, and the staff fell sizzling into the surf. Hervar's body fell backward, like a leaf blown from a bonfire, and lay stiffened on the shingle. From the harbor mouth came a sudden ominous creaking, and Alv saw the sea gate sway violently, its chains flailing and tangling. The defenders on the wall rushed to reach out pikes, spears, anything that might snag chains or pillars, and somehow hold them upright. On one side they caught the chain to the nearest pillar and hauled on it. On the pillar at the other side they sank long pole-axes into the wood. But then a new wave-crest struck, the whole mass swayed once more, and with a relentless grinding of iron the central pillar went toppling forward and pulled the others with it. One fell straight downward, plucking the axemen down into the churning water. The other swung violently in the direction it was being pulled and came smashing down on the wall itself. The logs split, the rampart splintered, armored bodies fell thrashing into the gray waters. The pillar rolled down onto them as they struggled and blotted them from sight. For an instant its weed-snared base reared up to the light and then everything was gone. Over the frothing gap rode the leading ship. The Thunderbird Dancer sprawled flat on the platform. The black and white bows ground into the harbor gravel, bounced once on the swell, and then the Ekwesh warriors were rising from beside the oars and spilling over into the shallows. But instead of rushing ahead, they stopped at the waterline and knelt down in the shelter of their shields. Then, as the defenders came clamoring down off the walls and from between the houses, the oarsmen rose from their benches with bows in their hands, and the long Ekwesh arrows went whistling out. The first townsmen fell, the others hesitated, and the kneeling warriors leaped up and charged as the other two ships came sailing in through the sea-gate. The few remaining archers on the seaward wall died as they loosed their own shafts, and then it was hand-to-hand -hand battle on the shingle. The black clouds opened and spilled dark rain over the scene. To Alv, Watching from the heights, everything seemed to dwindle and retreat behind the rain curtain, to become a scurrying mass of figures through the winding streets. Groups would meet and merge in violent action, but who was who, and who had the upper hand, he could never make out. Only when the groups fell away, and the action ceased, he could see shapes that lay writhing or motionless in the mud. But he quenched the horror of it with cold laughter, telling himself he cared not who slew whom. Tinker's brat, they'd called him. Well, maybe. As well be child to one of those poor wandering wretches without craft or art as to any in Assenby town now. Why should he care which of them lived or died there below? They were no kin of his. His skin spared him that, and his brown hair and lean hard features, wholly unlike their straight black hair and rounded coppery complexions. He had never seen anyone else who looked like him, though traders had said there were paler folk far in the south. A southerner let him be, then. He cared little for his unknown parents, since they'd abandoned him at the gate here. Here, where he was named Alv, the goblin, the changeling. The headman had taken him in and raised him, less from kindness than an eye for a cheap thrall. 
From his earliest memories he had labored, in the kitchen or the fields with the women, and with the cattle since his ninth summer, some three or four past. And yet all that time he had remained an outsider, taunted and despised by other children, unable to forget what was embodied in his very name. Alv. He slapped the goad down into his palm. It was no name he called himself, and the malice in it rang true, for he had learned to repay them with a hundred little irritations, the only defense he had. Why should he suffer for them now, or mourn? He watched and did his best to laugh. And when the cloud burst passed, and the sunlight sparkled in clear, clean air, it was all over. Smoke rose from some of the rooftops, but not through the chimneys, and no man moved to put it out. Three Equesh ships were drawn up on the beach, and the tall warriors went to and from them unhindered, unhurried, carrying great bulky loads. He could see the paintings on the black hulls clearly now, and they were very like the ones on the walls that now seared and blackened in the heat. The Equesh were close kin to the peoples of the north, the same cast of face and body, but save for a few words their tongues were different, and they were no simple farmers or traders. They came out of the west over sea, no man knew whence, they took and they returned. Rumor had it that their land matched their hearts, flinty, pitiless, blazing, or chill with the changing seasons, the shifting passion. They were great sailors and great warriors, but they respected nothing that was not theirs, not land, property, or life itself. And rumor whispered things darker yet. Behind him, the bush rustled. He half rose, turned, and caught a glimpse of black armor, copper skin, then a great weight thumped down on him and ground his face into the earth. Winded, blinded, he was only half aware that his hands were being tied behind him. Then a hard hand, twisted in his hair, hauled him upright and sent him staggering off down the path he could hardly see. He remembered, then, that there had been four ships. One must have landed down the coast to cut off messengers or fugitives. By the time the mud cleared from his eyes, he was in the town, stumbling along the streets he had left so short a time before. A nightmare had settled on the place. The air was warm and hung with curtains of stinking smoke, and it was no sun that crimsoned the puddles. The painted walls were scorched or smashed, and the people who had lived behind them lay stark and cold in their shadow. At the first house a man in mail lay curled up below a window, embracing the arrow that transfixed him. On the step a woman sprawled with twisted limbs in a red-brown pool, and in the mud at the center of the street a young child lay with a single bootprint the length of its body, still twitching faintly. Alv was made to step over it, and almost stumbled. These were people he had known, had seen the day before. He remembered the child's birth, the feasting, when even he had found a place and a full stomach. So it was throughout the streets and each sight worse than the last, a vision that shook the boy with pity and horror beyond his understanding. They came to the headman's house, many of the household dead about it. The burly man lay there under the crackling rafters of his own proud porch. His body made a spilled shell by broad stabbing spears, and his head half-hewn from the trunk. Staring at the ruin, Alv grasped vainly at all the hatred he had once felt, but it fled from him now. A harsh, unkind man the headman had been. There were few warmer moments to remember him by. But he had done no great evil, nothing worthy of such an end. What he was paled before what had been done to him. To Alv, staring at the ruin, the destruction he had once wished upon the place seemed a childish thing indeed, and he thrust it violently aside in his mind, bitterly regretting his laughter. His captors dragged him to the square by the town's main well. To his surprise, he saw that there were other townsfolk alive there, mostly younger women and children. Many of the Equesh were gathered there to guard them, and he had his first clear sight of them. They were tall men for the most part, and dressed much alike in rough leather kilts and stiff jerkins and helmets of heavier leather, studded with metal and painted with the same black and white designs as their boats. Sailors' armor, light enough not to drag them down. 
Their arms and hair jingled with ornaments, often of amber and precious metals, but their faces belied the richness, set scowling masks with cold eyes, and all seamed with great scars, even the youngest. In the center, near the well, stood a stooped figure in a long dark robe and broad-brimmed hat, leaning on a thick white stick and barking commands that sent the warriors scurrying left and right, occasionally with a crack of the stick on bare head or shoulder. Two Ekwesh were dragging a captive up to him, a middle-aged woman Alf recognized as wife of the town's sugar-baker. They flung her down on her knees before the man's feet. The hat bent over her an instant, then he gave a curt, dismissive gesture. One of her captors dashed his spear-butt into the back of her head, where it met the neck. The other flung her aside and passed his spear through her body, the broad blade eviscerating her. The huddled knot of captives set up a terrible wail. Then it was Alb's turn to be hurried forward, and the leathery hand clamped the back of his neck, forcing him to his knees. The face that bent over him, shadowed by the hat, was lean and hard, scarred like the rest, but made even more terrible by its eyes, yellow and cat-like under wrinkled brows, seeming to scan and weigh everything in their path. The sight made him kick out in fury, afraid above all of being slaughtered like a goat where he knelt. The grip tore loose, the rawhide on his wrists snapped, and before he knew it he was on his feet, panting. The old Ekwesh barked a word, and a spear stopped just short of Alv's throat. The man thrust his head forward like some ancient lizard, looked Alv up and down, and smiled, revealing a row of carefully pointed and serrated teeth. Strong, he said in a guttural accent, nodding to himself with satisfaction. Suthrin? Thrall here? So, good thrall for us. You live. Alv's anger boiled over onto his tongue. Amakak, swallow that! he shouted, and spat mud onto the soiled robe. Keep your mercy, eater of men's entrails. I know what comes of your thralls. Better dead I am than living a short life as your cattle. He was flung violently on his back, staring up at the spear that would tear out his belly. But there came a sharp command in another voice, and it did not fall. Alv twisted round to see who had spoken. Over by the well, lowering the dipper from his lips, was another robed man. But he was no Ekwesh, though they fell back as he strode forward. He was the first man Alv had ever seen with skin much like his own. His robes were the color of ripe corn, with a rich pattern worked into them that shimmered in the clear light. He looked down at the boy for a moment, and then said, Get up, in a brisk, neutral tone. Alf climbed awkwardly to his feet, uncomfortably aware of the spears still leveled at him. The newcomer looked him up and down, examined his hands as one might the hooves of an animal, and then jerked the boy's head round and stared hard into his eyes. The man's own eyes were dark and piercing, though the sunlight seemed to strike a cold white light in them. A strange thrall, he said in the same clear, colorless voice. Your name? Your parents? Alv, I was a foundling, a well-spoken foundling. The stranger sniffed fastidiously. A cowherd, that's obvious. Yet you were educated? Worked in the smithy? Never. The old smith, he wouldn't— The man gave a cool laugh. No, he would not favor someone he could sense might soon excel him. Well, boy, I am no man-eater, and I keep no thralls. I am a man of your own land, a master of the Guild of Smiths, one of those allowed by its rules to treat with the Ekwesh, to buy back goods they have looted. I have been away many long months. I go back now to my own new household, and I will need helpers in the years ahead, those who are like me, having no ties to family or folk to turn their hearts elsewhere. You have that in you that makes a smith, I can tell, but how much of one only the tempering of time will show. He glanced lightly around. Nothing remains for you here, if anything there ever was. If you will serve me, I will take you as one of my apprentices, for as long as you show promise. If that fails, you may find a place in my forge or go your own way. Or shall I let these creatures do as they will? Alv blinked, unable to form words. 
He stared at this stranger who was offering him life, a new life, as casually as a drink from the dipper in his hand. He cut an impressive figure, though his face glistened with sweat as if he had lately run a race. His skin was like Alves, but swarthier. His long jet-black curls were plastered over his brow, but hung free around a face regular and unlined, betraying no particular age, with a long heavy nose over thin lips and a strong chin. It was an easy face to accept, to believe in, and what else was there, indeed, beyond the blades that quivered at the corner of his eye? Yes, he choked out. The man raised a sardonic eyebrow, and Alv realized what he had said. I mean, yes, I will be your apprentice. I want to be. Very, very much. The man nodded evenly, clapped him on the shoulder, and spoke a few words to the old Equash. The old man took two short steps forward, robes rustling, the white stick whistled out before Alv could move, and caught him hard across the cheek, splitting the skin open. Alv staggered but did not fall. The old man spat copiously in his bleeding face and turned away to bellow at his soldiers. A pleasant people, murmured the smith and gestured at the bucket balanced on the well rim. Wash yourself. I would as soon be spat on by a rattlesnake. When you have done that, make your way down to the beach and find my servant there, an old man of our kind. Tell him my things are to be loaded into the ships and help him. I fear we must endure the company of the Equesh for a day or two longer, as by treaty they carry back what I have recovered. Alv looked at him a little dazedly, but he had long since learned not to question openly. Yes, Master. Master Smith. My name is Milio, but I prefer the title. As Alv wiped his face on his cloak, his eyes strayed to the captive women, mostly slumped in apathy in the mud. The master smith caught his shoulder. Leave them. There is nothing you can do for them. And if I read you aright, you owe them nothing. No particular sweetheart? He wiped his hand. Hardly. We must find you some better garb. Go then. Alv nodded. Yes. Master Smith. It was strange to walk through those gory streets, unharmed, ignored by the slayers milling around him. Alv felt as if he was somehow dead already, a ghost on his journey to the river, not to cross it, perhaps, but to sail away down it to another birth, another destiny, as the tales told of some spirits great or terrible. Certainly he was walking through death, for it lay all around him, and he had to avert his eyes from what he trod in. When he came to the beach and passed the long line of bodies, the townsmen who had fallen in that first volley, he kicked off his soiled sandals and wrappings and left them where they lay, though the shingle was bitter cold underfoot. At first there only seemed to be Equesh about, but then he noticed a small pile of boxes on its own near the last ship, and a cloaked figure huddled in its lee. He stalked over toward the pile, and an old pale-skinned greybeard, picked himself up slowly, and peered at the newcomer with dull, resentful eyes. Alv had met little else but forbidding looks. They no longer affected him. The Master Smith sent me, Master Milio. He has taken me as an apprentice and says you are to load his gear into the ship, and I am to help you. The old man considered slowly, chewing on nothing and gazing at Alv's ragged clothes. An apprentice, eh? And what might your name be? They call me Alv, here. The old man blinked around. None here will call you anything again, unless they walk by night, Alv, eh? I am Ernan, the master's only servant, save for my wife and a forge boy. There is another apprentice, too, older than yourself and well-schooled. But all are servants, even he, when and as the master smith requires it. Do I speak clearly? Alv nodded warily, and the old man picked up a bundle wrapped in skin. Well, then, remember that. Do you pick up one of those boxes and follow? Alv heaved the topmost box off the pile, a painted chest of bent cedar. It was the kind they made in many towns, he noticed, including here. It was heavy, and he staggered, but managed to hoist it onto his shoulder. Old Ernan was already striding around the side of the ship, canted sideways as it was beached. 
He walked right out into the shallow surf, and Alf followed to where the steep curving gunnels were at their lowest. There a short slatted board had been lashed to make climbing up easier. It creaked and flexed and shifted underfoot, almost spilling Alf into the water. Ernan reached out, steadied him, then took the box and laid it down in a locker lined with oiled sealskin. Now, Sir Apprentice, he grunted, do you come down now and help me with the larger chest there, and this time have a care. Alv followed gingerly, and as he stepped down into the water, his eye was caught by something a little way along the beach, black against the foam that washed around it. A few steps closer, and he saw with a shock that it was the old smith Hervar, left lying where he had fallen, scorched tongue protruding and charred arms thrust upward in a mute, meaningless gesture, as if to ward off the sky. Someone who might soon excel him. But he was past all enmities now. Alf turned at Ernan's angry growl, and hurried to take the other end of the long black chest. Equesh work, this, by the fierce bird designs around the huge and heavy lock. It was less weighty than it looked, though, and the two of them moved easily into the surf. But as Ernan reached the ship's side and Alv heaved the chest up onto the gunwale, a fleck of color caught his eye, a tuck of what the chest contained snagged in the throw of the hinged lid. He was about to tell Ernan when the color of the bright stuff awoke a memory in his mind, and he peered more closely at that protruding piece. It was soft and light like doe's skin, but with a pattern painted on it in stiff bright paints, blue and white. It was not something he would forget, that pattern of jagged feather shapes, for he had seen it so recently, dancing and whirling upon the prow of the leading warship till the very clouds opened and the lightning came. What was the master Smith Milio doing with the thunderbird dress of a shaman among the Equesh? He remembered the dancer, collapsed as if in exhaustion, and the sweat-soaked hair plastered to a high, pale brow. But then Ernan tugged impatiently on the chest, and Alv folded his thoughts away in darkness, determined not to leave even the slightest tuck of them for those dark eyes to see. He had much to learn and learn he would, before asking rash questions. So when, toward midday, the Equesh made ready to sail, and the master smith came back on board, Alv kept his peace and greeted him with respect. As the laden craft slid through the shattered sea-gate, oars creaking on their pivots, he stood at the stern by the massive tiller, drinking in the hundred stinks of salt and tar and dried fish, and finding none worse than that of the Equesh themselves, and watched the flames mount over the rooftops he had never called home. Suddenly the great gilded wind-vane stirred. The towering steersman sniffed the air sharply and bellowed something to the chieftain on the narrow foredeck. The oars were shipped, and the deck vibrated under the crew's bare feet as they ran to unfurl the sail from below the wide yardarm. The black hempen square billowed and drummed taut, straining against the web of tarred cords that strengthened it. A strong wind arose from the south. It fanned the burning buildings to a furnace heat, but the boy named Alv it bore far from that place. Wide though his life's wanderings were— that brought him at last to the very heart of the world, he never came there again. Chapter 2 The Apprentice The black ships ran northward on a following wind, and pursuit, if any there was, they left far behind them. The few small craft they sighted, put about, and ran for the shore, for there was now no power in this region strong enough to resist them. So it was for two days and nights, and throughout this time Alv was left on his own, for Ernan lay seasick in the stern, and the master smith was with the Equesh chieftains. Some boys his age might have been lonely, but Alv was well enough used to his own company, and content to huddle down among the cargo in its wrappings of greasy hide, think his thoughts, and stay out of sight. It was warmer there, and safer. He was in no real danger from the raiders. The Equesh treated the master smith with awe and left what he named his alone. A kick and a curse were the worst he got when he was in the way, like any stray animal on the decks. They treated their own no better. But from the other boats, where there were captives, he heard cries that haunted him. 
The Ekwesh were a fell folk, vain, proud, quarrelsome, and crueler than any other of that day. What he saw of them in the days after the raid only fed and swelled the hatred he felt, and it never left him. But at last, after what seemed like an age, the bows of the chieftain's ship ground into the sand of a narrow beach between high, cold cliffs. Then all the master smith's goods were carried ashore with great care, and stacked high above the tide-line under his watchful eye. The moment this was done a sharp word was given, and the warriors who had carried the last cases ran to the bows and began to push them free. As they scrambled aboard on trailing cables, the oars kicked up spray, backing water among the breakers. The rowers took up a chant, and without sign or farewell, the shark-sleek warship slid out to rejoin the others standing offshore. The watchers on the beach saw the black sails slacken as one, and thresh in the breeze, while the great yard-arms were canted round. Then the sails were reefed, and the raiding ships swung about before the wind, gunnels dipping into the swell, and went racing out north and west toward the horizon, as if they fled the sunrise that was coming. Alv shivered. The mastersmith had given him a good cloak and fine fur-lined boots, no doubt from among the Ekwesh loot, but in this dawn he lacked the shelter of walls, or his pile of skins, however dirty and the faint warmth of the cattle's bodies in the air. And the air in this new place did seem to carry some extra tang of cold. Beside him he could hear Ernan grumbling through chattering teeth. Only the master smith, bareheaded and lightly robed, seemed not to feel the cold. He was looking up at the dark gap in the rock wall, idly caressing a bracelet on his wrist, and listening. After a moment Alv heard the light clopping of hooves, and an instant later saw a soft lantern gleam in the dimness. A train of ponies was making its way down the path and onto the beach. The rider on the lead pony sagged sleepily, but gasped and pulled up sharply when he saw the master smith, and jumped down with a gush of apologies. The master smith held up a hand. "'You are early, my good Ingar. It is only that we were earlier.' for the barbarians were in haste to be away. But on with loading, for so are we. Alv watched the master smith drift away and fall into quiet conversation with Ernan, both men drawing strange, numinous patterns on the sand. He had not missed the vast relief Ingar, whoever he was, had betrayed when he was welcomed kindly. It could be a bad thing, then, to fail this strange smith, even in a small way. That was worth remembering. Ingar, as it turned out, was the master's other apprentice, a heavy-set young man about four years older than Alv, with dark skin, straight features, and blue eyes like Ernan's. He looked at Alv with something of the master's keenness, and nodded slowly. His speech was much like Alv's own. "'You're welcome, boy. At the very least we can use another hand in our new forge, and a less clumsy one, I'll wager, than Master Rock here.' "'Clumsy!' snorted a scornful voice from the darkness. It had a gruff tone to it, but its owner was obviously little older than Alv. "'If you'd leave your old books and lift a finger in the forge once in a day, we might see how deft you are, Master Ingar!' The speaker came strutting forward into the lamplight, and for a minute Alv thought he was looking at a round cloth bundle with legs. Then one end of an enormous muffler was unwound, and a broad, pale face glared out ferociously. "'What are you gawking at, you? Not my fault I wasn't born with ice in my blood like all you ruddy northerners, except Ernan, and he's caught it with age. Three cloaks I'm wearing, and I still crunch when I sit down, if ever I get to go on this little jaunt.' "'Listen,' interrupted Ingar. "'Sitting down will not be your main concern for a while if you delay the master. Now come on. And you too, Alv. The ponies must be loaded at once. At least we'll have the sun soon. When it rose, it was bright, and Alv and Ingar grew quickly warm as they lugged the boxes up onto the patient beasts, who stolidly stood and cropped the few patches of dune grass within reach. But hot as it was, Rock was slow even to throw back his hood. When he did, Alv jumped and exclaimed out loud, in the sun the boy's hair seemed to be a tousled mass of flame, a spectacular impossible color. Red. 
Beneath it his square, snub-nosed face was almost pure white, but spattered all over with flecks the same uncanny shade of red. Rock stared right back at him. "'And just what are you yelping at now? May I be so bold? Never seen a body so handsome as me before?' He'll never have seen red hair, I'll be bound, chuckled Ingar. Never been to the Southlands, then? They all look like that down there, you know. It's the sun makes their brains boil over. There's rubbish for you, said Rock. He's a Southron himself, isn't he? Brown hair and green eyes, at least I thought they were green. No, said the Master Smith, who had come up behind them so quietly everybody jumped. Alv is not a Southerner such as yourself though of the same kin. He has the look of one of the old people of the North, before they joined with the brown-skinned folk who came westward across the ice. And that is a very interesting thing to be. So now, if you please, back to your work. The young men scurried to obey. Old people of the North, eh? puffed Rock as they struggled to fix the carrying straps around an especially wide chest. Well, kinsmen, you should be right at home where we're bound. Further north than that, men don't willingly go, except one or two, maybe. That's enough, snapped Ingar. Rock pursed his lips and was silent. By the time the ponies were loaded, it was full day, and the master smith stood up from the sand and swept a foot carefully across all his drawings. Then he gestured casually to Ingar, now on foot, and the little party set off up the rocky floor of the defile. It had many windings and long steep slopes, and Rock and Alv, following behind, often had to help and steady the beasts, and even haul them on by their stiff scrubby manes over patches of scree that slithered away beneath their hooves. At last they emerged, some hundreds of paces from the cliff edge, and found themselves in wide rolling country of the kind Alv had always known. But as they crossed the top of the first low hill, heading inland, it seemed to him that there was a line of blue at the horizon too solid to be cloud, and that in places it was crested like a wave, white caps glinting against the sky and never folding, never breaking. He did not understand what he was seeing, and he was too afraid of looking foolish to ask rock, but the sight stirred feelings in him, of the immensity of the world, and what it might contain and of all the things he might find in it. The shadow of the Equesh lifted from him. He felt like singing, but didn't know how the Master Smith might react. He hummed under his breath as he went, and at every rise in what seemed to be a well-trodden path, he watched eagerly for that unchanging line to see if it might look any nearer. By and by the path led them to a road, and along this they turned, with the Master Smith strolling at their head. He wore now the black robes of his guild and rank, and at his side a short heavy sword. Ingar, too, was armed, and casting watchful eyes around at every bank and copse they passed. When the road cut through a wide area of woodland, he dropped back to walk beside the younger boys. "'Got to be wide awake here, the pair of you. The Master Smith chose this road carefully to judge by all the maps he was drawing, but no path is safe hereabouts.' Robbers and outlaws gather near a big town, for they know what road the merchants'll take. Are we near a town here? asked Alv. That we are, and a big one, the last in these parts. Harthaby, they call it. We'll be there by early afternoon at this rate. But we won't be staying long. We've a long way ahead. And since we won't need all the ponies for carrying, at least we won't have to walk. Ever ridden a horse? No, admitted Alv. A bull, though, once or twice. The others looked at him again. "'A bull,' muttered Ingar, when he saw the boy was serious. "'Well, a horse shouldn't give you too much more trouble, then.' Harthaby Town was large indeed, some three or four times the size of Assenby. Alv had never seen anywhere so large, too wide for a single hill, its walls meandered out around two or three and each was crowned with a building larger than the headman's house, larger even than Assenby's greenery. When they reached the main gate, though, it was no wider than the land gate, and well guarded. There was a press of people waiting to pass. But the master smith simply spoke a few words to the guards, and they passed his party through ahead of everyone, much to Alv's embarrassment. Nobody dared hiss or glare at so great a smith, so they reserved it for the most ragged member of his party. 
But he forgot that at once, the moment he was in the town, for so many streets and such a throng of people were new to him, though the others said there were many greater towns to the south. The huge buildings, said Rock, were the halls of guild, where members met and markets were held. It was to one they'd be going now, though only for as long as unloading the boxes and loading up some traveling gear would take. And getting a bite to eat, if our noble master's not in one of his fasting moods. The Equesh gave me some food, Alv commented ruefully, but I never dared touch their meat. Rock shuddered. I, the dirty brutes. Never know whom you'd be eating, eh? Fortunately, there was food enough at the merchant's guild hall, though others at the servants' tables complained bitterly about corn porridge and smoked fish, saying that they could get no decent delicacies any more, with the corsairs terrorizing sea traffic from the south, and now also the Equesh. To Alv it seemed like heaven to eat his fill, and he even out ate rock. The mastersmith and Ingar dined with the master merchants, concluding their business over the chests brought from the ship. Watching them go, Alv wondered how much of the recovered booty came from his own town, and why Hartheby, so much richer, had not yet been attacked. But he kept that thought to himself. He was no less pleased when Ingar took him off to find a bath and some new clothes. To his surprise, they were like Ingar's own, though less decorated. Good woolen shirts, jerkin and hose of black leather, and the black boots and hooded cloak he already had. The livery of an apprentice in our guild, said Ingar. Our color is black. Probably, he added disdainfully, because it hides the dirt. Alv looked down at himself doubtfully. The clothes felt almost indecently soft and clean against his damp skin. Ernan and Rock don't wear it. Ingar raised an eyebrow. Of course not, and count yourself lucky that you do, so young and untried. The Master Smith has great confidence in you, that's obvious. Just how much, Alv only realized when they rejoined the others, and he saw the look of shock on their faces. Ernan sniffed disapprovingly. Rock whistled softly and nodded, but said nothing. Indeed, from that moment a gulf opened between him and Alv, and in many ways, though they were to become fast friends, it never again closed. However, when they loaded the ponies with new supplies, apprentice and servant shared the work as before. When they mounted up, Rock did not spare himself a laugh at Alv's battle with the stirrups and frantic attempts to keep his balance, even by grabbing at his pony's stiff bristled mane. Nor did the girls and idlers in the streets, and more than once Alv burned with the same black anger of humiliation he had thought he left behind. He kept his eyes down or straight ahead and did not look around him. He did not know how long it would be before he saw this or any other town again. By copying Ingar, however, he managed to learn the rudiments of keeping his seat and managing the reins, and by the time they had reached the northern gate he already felt quite comfortable on horseback. And that was as well, for a long ride lay ahead. For the first day they rode fast along well-made roads, and from time to time they would pass others, single travelers on wagon, horse, or foot, or small trading parties serving outlying villages. That night they camped in a stone enclosure with a hearth and roofed sleeping area, obviously built as a way station for travelers. But it was very old and crumbling. When they woke in the morning it was Alv's turn to laugh at his fellows, because all but he and the master smith were stiff and sore with the ride and sleeping on the ground. On the second and third nights they found other stations like it, though even more decrepit. All this time the road wound on between the low hills, unchanging, but it became more cracked and overgrown. Other travelers were few, rarely on foot, and always armed and distrustful. The station they came to late on the third night was a ruin, little better than a low wall with a fire pit. On the fourth night, after a day of driving rain, they could not find the station, so overgrown was it. At last they settled in the shelter of a great cedar, wrapping themselves in all their blankets, skins, and oiled cloth. In the morning they were all shivering and miserable again except Alv and the master smith. And this is the best of our journey so far, 
the smith remarked, listening to coughs and curses as he led the party away on a narrow trail through the brush. From here on the high road has not been maintained this last hundred years, and the land reclaims it. So instead we are setting off across the Starkenfells. A good week's ride over Moorland. Is this where your house is, Master Smith? asked Alv, looking around dubiously as they neared the top of a slope. The trees were thinning out around them, and the underbrush also. Ahead were wide patches of long grass, waving in the cool, humid wind. No, indeed. The climate is anything but healthy. It lies beyond the fells. A day or two's travel through the forests, and then another two into the mountains. High above the cares of this world. But I imagine you have never seen a mountain? I've heard of them, said Alv, a little casually. The master smith smiled faintly, and stretched out a long hand northward. Alv followed his gaze as they crested the slope and gasped aloud. The wave he had seen from afar seemed to tower over him now, a vast wall of gray-green glass sparkling in the clear air, flinging its jagged white crests up into the blue infinity like spray from the rocks. For a moment, such was the power and terror of the spectacle, he almost thought to see it come sweeping down across the land. And then it seemed a greater miracle that so immense and graceful a shape could remain frozen in that instant of motion. Master Smith. Yes. How did mountains come to be? They have not always been there, surely. They look as if they had been thrust up from somewhere. The Master Smith turned in his saddle to stare at Alv. I was not mistaken, I see. There is perception in you, boy, true perception. Yes, they were thrust up like a wave, and I believe not so long ago in the life of the land, for the edges of the rock are sharp and little touched by the weather, and the fires under the earth burn strong there, as you will see. But all the mountains are not the same age, I think, for some are more weathered than others, and of different rock. That you will learn about in due time, boy, for a good smith must be able to find and mine his own new ore at times, to make it truly pure and truly his. You will enjoy that, I think. Indeed, Alv could hardly wait. In this alone he would surpass that old idiot Hervar, for the greybeard had not strayed beyond the village in all the years Alv could remember, let alone gone searching for ore. Small wonder he had got himself killed, if he was so little concerned with his art. It was not a mistake Alv intended to make. Over the next few days it was increasingly he and not Ingar who rode and talked with the master smith, plying him with questions and never failing to find an answer that fed the fires in his mind. He was wary of offending the senior apprentice at first, but for his part Ingar seemed glad of the rest. Hard as it was to believe, he seemed to find his master's company a strain, and was happier joking with rock. Ernan rode in pinch-mouthed silence, which suited the others as much as it seemed to suit him. So they journeyed across the moorland, a lonely, eerie place in which they saw no other traveller, and the only sounds of life were thin, cool bird calls echoing through the damp air. At times the master smith would point out the wheeling flight of a condor, high against the clouds, and once, as they drew nearer, a cloud of huge vultures rose from something. They could not see what, but it was large, trapped and decaying in a wide, boggy patch. The taint of it seemed to cling to the wind long after they passed. It might have been that which drew the pack down upon them soon after. They were hunting beasts large but lean after the hard winter, and they crested the hill at speed, long tails stiffened and jaws set in wide fang-edged grins, breaking into harsh yipping cries as they saw the travellers. Cat-like they were, carrion-eaters, but just as ready to run down live prey. They were built for that, their limbs long, their brindled bodies light, flexing and stretching as they ran but their shoulders were massive to carry the heavy heads whose thick jaws could sever a pony's leg at a single bite. Alv, with his herdsman's eye, counted twelve of the brutes, and no chance of running to cover in this bare land. 
The master smith whirled in his saddle. Alf expected him to draw a sword, but instead he sprang down and Ingar with him. They waved the others back. It seemed like madness, but Alf, acutely conscious of his new livery, seized a metal bar from the baggage and sprang down beside them. Ingar was calmly flicking an odd device, a flint and steel wheel, with a thick loop of cord attached, till the brutes were almost on them. The cord sizzled suddenly and flamed. The master smith snatched it and drew back his arm as if to throw. Ingar swung away, covering his eyes, and Alv copied him, but an instant too late. A cloud of dazzling, searing light blossomed over the pack, as if the sun itself had come licking through the mists. Flaming gobbets rained hissing down to lodge in their fur. Blinded, stung, or afire, their onrush became a whirling confusion of yelps and snarls, burnt hair mingling with the carnivore stench. Only one huge beast with gray streaks in its greenish fur rose up on its hind legs and snapped viciously at the master smith's face. Alv, still dazzled, heard a horrible bone-and-meat thud and saw the beast roll kicking at his feet. Another snarling shape loomed up before him. He struck at it and heard bones break, and as his sight cleared he saw Ingar stoop with a tinder-box in his hand. This time he closed his eyes, but the tongue of light raced scarlet across closed eyelids, and the pack turned and fled yelping, tails firmly between their legs. Good, said the master smith calmly, wiping his sword on still quivering fur. Since nobody is hurt, let us be moving on at once, for if they regain their nerve and decide to stalk us, we shall have no peace by night. You have seen, he added, turning to Alv as they mounted up, a useful alliance of subtlety with force. Never forget it. They were more afraid of the fire than our swords, though it could do them less harm. So are the weak in mind, led or driven, be they beast or man. The art of the true smith can be turned to great ends in this world, and often by applying its simplest skills. That flame seemed uncannily bright, did it not? Yet no magecraft at all was needed for it, simply two items of knowledge. First, that a certain rare metal burns thus when very pure. Second, how to find and purify it. Simple enough. But do not scorn such trifles, for all that, when you come to master the greater craft. As you will, soon enough. Master Smith, Alv, felt a cold tingle of excitement stir behind his belt, and an icier one of apprehension. He had to ask, and yet he was afraid, afraid he would offend the master, show himself up as stupid or unsuitable. But the Master Smith looked at him with keen eyes, and raised an eyebrow. Alv had to risk it. Master Smith, why? Why me? What made you choose me? Well, why are you so confident I'll be able to do all these things? The smith considered. You feel it is a burden, that confidence? Set your mind at rest. I have reasons for it, and some I had from the moment I saw you. You mean, because I look like one of the old northerners? Indeed, that in itself was enough to interest me. All the greatest mage-smiths have come from that stock, last survivors of the lost lands eastward, for it was among them that smithcraft was most cultivated, and so grew strongest. True smithcraft, the art that goes beyond the mere shaping of the metal, that is a rare and strange thing indeed, and not all possess it to the same degree, or at all. If a people lose sight of it, cease to cultivate it, it will fade from them. So it has for rocks people, who became so great and so wise in things material they felt they no longer needed it, and in time ceased to believe in it. It was some barbarian superstition they left to their less advanced cousins. In the Northlands, by contrast, it was nurtured and studied as the Southrons studied war and trade and building in stone. Yet even in the North, it has dwindled now, as the old peoples have become assimilated among the greater numbers of copper-skinned folk who fled east over the ice from the rising power of the Equesh realm. For though they, too, knew the art, they were a plain folk more concerned with the soil, the catch, and the seasons than any deeper knowledge. 
so in most of them the art has declined to that level. Wise smiths, therefore, seek their apprentices among those in whom the old stock runs strongest. Ingar, for example, with his eyes and face. Very rarely they find one of almost pure northern stock, and in them the art often runs strong. Such, I would guess, are you. But I do not need to guess about what is in you. When I look closely, with the eyes of my art, I can see it, though you know nothing of it yourself as yet. And what I have seen, I trust. You will make a good smith. But how good, only the future will show. Alv shook his head, bewildered. Thank you, Master Smith. I... I still don't quite... It's just that it's what I've always wanted. Naturally. That, too, is a sign. But you will see when we reach my new home. It will not be too long from the lie of the land. The beasts also, for they hunt near the forest margins at this season. And, indeed, he stood in his stirrups and pointed out toward the looming bulk of the mountains, presently no more than shadows swathed in clinging mist. Alf, copying him shakily, saw a long streak of greenish-brown only a league or so distant, filling the next low hollow and spreading back over the hills to rise up among the very roots of the mountain range. The contrast of the lush carpet of treetops and the cold sterility of those slopes was amazing. It looked as if all the life had come slipping and spilling off them into the valley, leaving only their bare bones to endure the icy weather. A narrow, muddy track led the travelers in among thick underbrush surrounding cedars, ash, maples, and spruce, pines far taller than the ones Alv had known on the coast. And here and there, towering above the rest, stands of red-barked metasequoias reaching for the clouds. And this is only a sparse little outgrowth of the woods to the east, remarked the master smith. Tapiao Laan Athen, the great forest that casts its shadow over the heart of all this land. Think of that. Alv shook his head. I can't, Master Smith, but I'd love to see it one day. Have you? The Master Smith's mouth twisted wryly. I have, as I hope you will, though you will need to be well proven and prepared before you venture into the realm of Tapiao. I barely escaped myself, but here that power is weak. You will learn more about it one day. Alv took the hint and stifled all his eager questions. Ingar and the servants were looking around nervously as they rode in under the shadow of the trees, but nothing more than small green birds moved, bouncing around from bough to bough and cocking heads to eye these intruders with immense skepticism. Alv and Rock tossed crumbs to them. There were sounds deep in the forest, though. Often they heard the groaning bellows of deer, large and small, the snorting of vicents, and, always in the far distance, the deep coughing growls of meat-eaters on the hunt. Once, looking back, Alv saw a single doe slip silently across a clearing they had just passed through. When they came to a wide river, there was a swift crashing in the undergrowth as some large creature dashed away. Bright blue birds flicked up, shrieking out of its path. A moment later the travelers came across its slaughtered prey on the bank, a huge beaver, also as big as a man. A dagger tooth, muttered Ingar, twisting the tinder box nervously. Dagger tooths preyed on even the largest forest beasts. The master smith shook his head. Look at the windpipe, pinched shut, not punctured. Therefore it was one of the biting, not stabbing cats, smaller and less dangerous. In any case, not even a dagger tooth would attack a party this size. But the others kept casting anxious glances behind them as they went splashing through the ford, and that night they camped in a ring of thorn bushes with two fires lit and set a watch. From there on, however, the forest began to grow thinner as the land rose sharply. The heavy undergrowth became sparse, and many kinds of tree were no longer seen. What grew around the path now were chiefly pines, firs, and other hardier evergreens. Toward the end of the second day the path itself grew wider and firmer, no longer a muddy track, but a well-surfaced road with shaped stones set along its edges. 
Here and there the resiny scent of the forest became newly sharp and strong, and looking around Alv saw the stumps of pine trees freshly hewn with the chips still lying around them, the light flooding into new clearings through the ravaged canopy. As the hours passed, he could see that a great quantity of wood had been taken from this forest, some very recently, and wondered who was cutting it. The master smith, perhaps, to build his house or fire his forge, but there seemed to be almost too many stumps even for that. He could ask, but that might look stupid. Better mention it casually to Rock, later. They camped that night where the trees stood tall and untouched. All throughout the next day the trees grew thinner, the land steeper, until the forest died away to mere clumps and coverts huddled against the hillside, in one of which they camped. When they rose the next morning, the travelers found they had a clear view back over the forest and out over the lands they had crossed. Alv was startled to see how high up they were. The forest lay stretched out below him, right to the moorlands beyond, silhouetted against the dim dawn sky. He turned and blinked with surprise. He was in the mountains now, truly. They were all around him, as thickly, it seemed, as the forest had been, and the sun spilled blood down their flanks. As the travelers rode on, the last clumps of trees dwindled and finally seemed to fail altogether. The slopes on either side were covered in coarse grass or bushes and scrub that clung to shelter as if in fear of being blown away. The only sounds of life were the drone of biting insects and the harsh screams of unseen birds of prey echoing down the wind. By evening, even the smaller plants had all but vanished, and the road was leading them across a broad slope, stony and bare, between two lowering dark peaks that looked like roots put down by the sky. The wind whistled bleakly between them, and somewhere in the distance there was the sound of falling water. It reminded him of the little falls on the hill streams, but much louder and deeper. As he watched, night fell, and the weary ponies plodded on through the pale afterglow. But the master smith gave no word to halt, and with a sudden thrill Alv realized they must be near enough to reach the house tonight. Hours went by. Stars came out, and the moon rose, and heads sagged with weariness. Ernan seemed almost asleep in his saddle, and Rock was swaying where he sat. But the master smith was wide awake, and so, to his own surprise, was Alv, drinking in the mountain air. Darkness seemed to flavor it like cool, bitter wine. The moon was sinking by the time they neared the top of the pass, and just as they crested the slope it slid down behind the peaks. But instead of the sudden darkness Alv expected, a new radiance seemed to hang in the sky paler and clearer even than the light of moon or star. The crest and the peaks stood out sharp against it, and their snow caps caught it and sparkled like frozen jewels. Abruptly the master smith reined in his pony and swung down. Frost crunched beneath his feet. He beckoned to Alf, who followed suit, and came trudging up to join him. Look, boy! hissed the master smith softly, with something as near passion as Alv had ever heard in his voice. Do you see it? Do you see it there? Look at it, the glory of it, blazing back from the earth into the heavens. I see it, master smith, breathed Alv, full of wonder. Behind the mountains. It stretches as far as I can see, shining on the clouds like a reflection from a great still lake. But what is it, master smith? No lake, boy. You see in reflected glory the power that has come down to cover the Northlands, the power that ruled this world of old, that was many times dispossessed and thought defeated, and that yet holds it in its grip, and that grip is tightening. You see the great ice. The words were flung out across the mountains, their hollow echoes riding the wind like spirit voices. The glare seemed to grow more intense, and even Alv shivered in his boots. The wind sucked the warmth out of his very blood. No, said the master smith after a moment, and his voice had dropped to a deep whisper. You do not see it yet, not truly, but you will one day, as I did. You, when you have served as apprentice and journeyman, and become in your turn a master, you will set out alone— and unattended over the ice, walking and walking on into the emptiness, 
enduring its hardships and braving its terrors, and the ordeal will purify you. And if you do not fail at the test, you will come at last to the heart of it, and there commune with the powers behind it. In their hands you, the master, will again become an apprentice. You will learn new knowledge, new skills, new purposes, new thoughts. Thus you yourself will be made anew, hammered, tempered, forged on the anvil of the ice. The master smith swung round and gripped him violently by the shoulders. His eyes stared deep down into Alves. The fierce white light blazed and rippled in their depths, and in Alves' brain a piercing point of pain awakened as if in answer. In a state halfway between terror and ecstasy, Alves felt his feet leave the ground. The master smith held him out at arm's length, as if he weighed nothing at all, as if released he would flutter away on the wind. Yes, boy, whispered the smith at long last. There is power in you, true enough, great power. But that is not something you can take for granted. More than any other attribute, it must be developed and disciplined. It must be carefully nurtured, boy, in a climate of thought, pure thought. If petty humanity, the passions of the ape, are not to creep in and weaken it. Pure thought, without taint or contamination, that is what lies out there. That is the secret behind the ice. He released Alp so suddenly the boy almost fell on the stony slope. And that is why I came here, the smith went on in his normal dry voice, to be away from the stifling presence of massed humanity. The meaningless demands of the herd. Up here, where few things are living save ourselves, we may aspire to a communion with the Absolute. For the moment it is checked by the mountain barrier, but not forever. No, indeed. It can afford to wait. Before ever man was, those powers set their hands upon this world, and they have never lifted it. In their service we can learn much, and achieve great art and power. Here alone is true life, and here I have made my new home. He gestured down into the valley below. There is my house. And from now on, yours also. Alv looked down into the shadows. A little way along the valley, its wall became a sheer cliff face, down which a mountain stream fell in great cascades from the snow line high above. Just beyond it, founded on an outthrust arm of the cliff wall, rose a squat square tower of stone from within an encircling wall. Its summit was open and flat behind high crenellations, but to one side rose a wide round turret, roofed in metal, cold sheened in the clear pale light. Here and there on the flanks of the tower shone squares of warm yellow and red light, and plumes of smoke or steam drifted up like banners into the icy air. Alv could only gape. He had never seen anything so large except the halls of Guild, and they had been low and flat, not many storied like this. And it was all of stone. He had never even dreamed it was possible to build entirely of stone, and shuddered at the difficulty and danger of it. He found his voice at last, as they remounted and went riding down the steep road into the valley. Master Smith, it's amazing! But how was it all built up here? It was built for me, said the smith dryly, with rather unusual help. I had to pay for that, and I am still paying when I must. But it is strong, and houses all we need, including great stores of supplies. I think you will find it comfortable. After the smith's words about the ice and the meaningless demands of humanity, Alv was inclined to doubt that, but when the high gate of polished granite swung silently shut behind him and the door of the tower creaked open, a welcome tide of light and warmth flowed out, and the aroma of baking bread. That almost reduced him to tears, for all his new-found dignity, because he remembered it from years of passing by homes that were not his, doors at which he might only beg and never enter as his own. But here, as the master smith and Ingar went in, Ernan, Rock, and the wrinkled old woman who had opened the door all stood aside, and they ushered Alv in before them. The central hall around him was simple enough, stone-walled and flagged, strewn with rough matting. 
The great table and benches were of plain solid wood, as were the seats around the fireplace that filled the far wall. But it seemed like a palace to him, and almost unbelievable, that he was able to stand and warm himself by the fire undisturbed, then join others at the table to eat bread and meat and drink mulled ale. All this was new to him, and he thought then that for all his life long he could want nothing better. And indeed, though others might have found it a lonely or uncanny place, he was happy enough to spend all the years of his growing in that house. In fashion it was like no other house of men in Nordney at that time, being built of stone blocks after the manner of the great towns of the south, but far larger in size, and so dressed that not even the keenest edge of the winter wind could force a particle of snow or ice between them. They were bedded deep in foundations of living rock, not only for strength but for heat. The fires under the earth burned strong and high in that place, and often the hillsides around would vent great gouts of smoke and steam, and a fearful throbbing like the breath of some great beast. At times the ground itself would tremble and heave, as if that beast stirred under the intolerable weight of the ice. But no tremor disturbed or weakened the master smith's great house, though at its very roots there opened a deep cleft in the rock, through which its hot lifeblood yet ran. The stone drew up so much heat from below that often the spray of the falls splashed into steam against the wall. But the house was placed and built with a hand and a cunning past that of men, and so remained warm at all seasons in that bitter land, where living men could never otherwise have dwelt. On the stillest of summer nights the grind and crack of stone would resound from the far side of the mountains under the quarterless siege of the ice. All through the half-year's winter the frost would grip like a steel vice, and the snow-laden winds would come shrieking down off the ice, seeking the least crack or crevice to begin their ancient game of splitting the stone. But crevices there were none. Such was the work. Frost and snow alike steamed away to nothing. At the base of the tower the heat was fiercest, for there was the master smith's great forge, a wider chamber like a cave in the living rock, but with high vaultings curiously carved. When the master smith first led Alv down into it, the day after their arrival, the boy fought not to flinch at the thought of the great weight of stone overhead. But as his eyes grew used to the reddened, flickering light, he forgot his fear in wonder at the look of the place. He had grown up wondering and marveling at the village smithy. This place so far surpassed it that he was moved with a feeling almost of worship. It had something in common with Hervar's lair, the fire pit at one end and the scatter of anvils around it. But here, instead of two or three, were a hundred or more of all shapes and sizes, ranging from small shaping blocks on workbenches to an immense slab, as high as his shoulders, that seemed too huge for any merely human hand to work at. Some hero of old, such as Glaiskav, might have forged arrows here, or Veda, his sword. As he peered more closely, he saw poised over it in the gloom what almost confirmed his feelings— two immense metal hammers with wooden hafts thicker than his thigh. "'Do you wonder at them, then?' said the master smith. "'Yet once again they are simple things, true smithcraft's servants, rather than its creation.' He strode to the wall and turned a wide wheel set there a little way, and the cavern filled with the thunder of falling water. Below the wheel were rows of levers in the floor— and he pulled first one, then another. There was a long, loud creak, a slow ticking sound, and in the shadows behind the great anvil something stirred, the fire pit casting a moving, plunging shadow on the wall. Alv had barely time to see it was a bladed wheel before the master smith slipped yet another lever by the high anvil. The suspended hammers jerked, rose, and came crashing down in turn on the great block of metal with a mighty clanging that shook the sandy paving of the floor, echoed in the vaults of the ceiling, and went reverberating through the boy, so that his body felt insubstantial and frail. The master smith shut the levers off one by one. Thus are the sternest oars crushed and the hardest metals tempered. But before you use it, 
Guard your ears. He stood a moment with the faint half-smile on his face. You see there, a vent channels in a part of the waterfall to turn the wheel. That works the hammers and other such devices. Bellows, grindstones, heavy hammers, lifting tackle, metal benders, and wire drawers, all with greater power than ever came from a man's arms. And that is not all. Ingar! The older apprentice, over by the fire pit, took hold of another wheel, set this time on a thick shaft in the floor, and with immense care moved it a little way. There was a sudden deep coughing rumble. The flames of the pit leaped and blazed to twice their height and spat a column of dark smoke toward the ceiling, where a wide gap swallowed it. You see, the rock itself bleeds to aid our forging. The master smith nodded, and Ingar hastily spun the wheel back, grinning at Alv. A forge fit for the gods, he called. All four elements, ours to command, the stone around us. The wind in our air shafts, the water in the wheels, and this— He locked the shaft with a bolt. Better than having a dragon on a leash. Here we can work wonders. Rock, pouring fine sand around some impossibly delicate wax thing in a mold, laughed scornfully. We? A single glance from the master smith silenced him, and Ingar's angry retort died in his throat. The man smiled. Ingar is a competent craftsman, but more interested in the theory of our art. He prefers, he gestured at a low arched doorway to the right, to bury himself in here. The door was of bronze and heavy, and when it opened there was a sucking of air. Alv stepped through and stood blinking in the change of light, clear, cool, and coming from nowhere he could see. And when the shapes and flecks of color around the walls resolved into solidity, he was still blinded. You know what these are, then? Yes, Master Smith, of course. The town had some, three or four, very old. They were proud. But am I stupid? I never knew there could be so many. From floor to ceiling and across the center, the room was filled with books. Books of every kind, from the usual scrolls and fan-folded links, to leaves of paper, parchment, or even bark tied up in clumsy sheaves, or, oddly, fastened together along one edge. No, said the dry voice. You are not stupid. It is an immense expanse of knowledge, more than you will find in any other library save that of Kerbrahane, which is now little regarded, or those of Lost Morvan itself. And yet no more than a fraction, a grain, of what there is to know. Ingar prefers to be a scholar and makes himself useful at such. But a true master of the art, as I am, as I judge you might one day be, must balance both, the learning and the craft. I assume you cannot read? A few signs I picked up. My name, a word or two. Well enough for you, then. Because you are late to start book-learning, and this is one door you must enter soon. But be warned now, learning is not to be gulped down as you do your food. It must come in courses, by degrees, as you are ready to receive and understand it. Otherwise it may choke you, or worse. The high mysteries of our craft are not to be taken lightly, and need to be guarded. So, you may take and read any book from this south wall or the center cases, as you will. But on the others a guard is set, surer than any lock or key, and I advise you not to cross it. For the east and west walls you must first ask leave of me, and it will seldom be refused. But leave the north wall alone. The soft voice glittered like the ice glow. Alv shivered and nodded. Then go now to Ingar. He will begin teaching you your letters. He has some romances and epics which should be easy enough to begin on. Find me by my anvil in three hours if you weary. But you must be reading, and well, by next spring. No longer. He was reading, avidly, before winter. The spring season was in himself, all his pent-up energy and intelligence breaking the crust of his beginnings with the ruthless impatience of a seedling eager for light and air. And over the years that followed, it seemed to him that no winter ever came, 
for he felt himself grow and blossom into new strength and confidence, both of body and of mind. Little can be said of his eight apprentice years, for little is recorded till the events which led to their uncanny ending. In manhood he was never proud of them. Only the lesser part of his early schooling, his learning of simple smithcraft, is mentioned, and that for the changes it wrought in him. Long hours of toil at anvil, vice, and mandrel, wielding heavy hammers, swages, tongs, and hardies, hardened his body. It was labor that might have killed a thrall, but with good food in plenty and all the force of his will, his driving need behind it, the work redoubled the strength he was born with. He grew only to middle height, but solid and well made, especially of face. It was the fine work that bowed his shoulders and narrowed his eyes, long hours of carving out inlays in steel and tapping soft gold or silver wire into the channels, endless vigils over tiny molds in which a minute bead of electrum shivered and slid down little by little at the vibration of a stroking finger. One minute he would be hauling bar iron, heated to the point of burning, out of the fire pit and under the mighty hammers. The next he would be anxiously coaxing a finely enameled sword pummel out of a miniature kiln. Then, as the snows of the outside winter melted unregarded, he would be off across the mountain land with the master smith and rock, searching for new seams and sources of metal. In all ways they went, save only to the north flanks of the mountains, against which ground the first outthrust glaciers of the ice. Rock seemed deeply glad not to venture that way, but Alv was only the more intrigued. Sometimes, many miles to the south, the master would lead them deep into workings and mine shafts, evidently made by others, and equally evidently still in use. But who the makers and users were, the master smith did not say, and his manner discouraged questions. There they would find many rich and precious ores for the taking, at the faces, or from heaps left lying around uncollected. But though Rock was always looking nervously about, they never so much as saw the mine workers, and only once, as from an infinite distance, did Alv hear the rattle and ring of work in the stone. Often when they returned from these expeditions, there would be horses at the gate, even a line of wagons, for the master smith was no hermit. Many visitors seemed to think it worth the long trek out to the house, and they were of many kinds. There were messengers, whom the master smith greeted with cool courtesy, but dismissed to the kitchen to await reply. There were men who came by night, hooded or masked, and stayed for no more than a word at the gate. There were pale travelers from strange lands in the south, their errands as enigmatic as their speech. Many visitors were simply merchants, come to sell supplies and perhaps treat with the master smith for special work, though this he seemed to endure patiently rather than do gladly. He had no great need of more wealth. Occasionally men in splendid clothes with haughty airs and well-armed followers would ride up to commission weapons and armor or fine jewelry. But often a chieftain or merchant who took away such work would return, wealthy and beholden to the master smith Milio, and then Alf saw their relations with him change. They would become confidants, partners, consulting a trusted adviser. When they next returned, it would be as clients to a patron or vassals to a lord. The master smith would receive them with his usual mien, suave, reasonable, generous. But nonetheless, many left him pale and shaking, or bowed as under a heavy burden. Alf studied his master as assiduously as his craft or his books, and through such dealings came to see the iron in him beneath the gilt. Then, for the first time, the memory and the puzzlement of the Thunderbird awoke, of the close ties with the Equesh and the bargaining and bartering over the ashes of Assenby. But the years of training were also working changes in Alf's mind. His thoughts were no longer so simple, or his hatred so direct. How this was is not known. Whether it was a deliberate act of his master, or whether it was a thing brought about by the boy himself. There may have been many subtle enchantments interwoven among the long chants he was set to learn, and that later he was taught to amend, add to, and eventually compose for himself. In these, sung into and onto their forging, lay the true magic of the smiths of old, 
to set a virtue in the things of their creation, to work into them powers that at their height were able to reshape the very forces of nature, or, hardest of all, to sway the minds of men. So it is possible that the will and the blame were not his own. So strong an enthrallment, though, would tend to break the spirit it was turned on, and hamper the growth of its powers. But as the years of his learning passed, Alv's skill and craft waxed ever greater, and with it his arrogant, untamed, questing spirit. Need drove him, a desperate need to learn, to know all that there was to be known. Whenever he had a spare moment, he would be delving through some volume or other, storing up masses of questions for Ingar or the Master. To break the boundaries of his reading, he mastered not only his native Northland speech, but also the tongue of Suderney, and many no longer spoken in South or North. Even some words of Ekwesh he acquired. But much as he learned, it never satisfied him. In his dreams he searched out all the secrets of the world, from its heart to its heights, and shouted out his questions to the silent stars. Awake, he longed to end his apprenticeship, to become his own man, free if he chose to go out and explore the world. Much as he admired the master smith, Alv had had his fill of these barren mountains, the house from which he could not stir for six months of every year, the few faces he was forced to see every day. Most of all he yearned to see women again, for none had ever come there save Ernan's old wife, and she died during his third winter in the house. Knowledge was his road to escape, his path to his own fortune, and he longed for it with the fervor of love. That forbidden north wall of the library drew him like a magnet, and he deeply resented the prohibition. He would run his hands lovingly over the scrolls there, fingering the smooth dark fabric of the cylinders and their cold carved finials, as if he could somehow divine their cloth-shrouded secrets through his fingertips. It seemed to him almost that he could, that half of the hidden knowledge came through to him, and that he lacked only a single clear glimpse to set it free in his mind, and that that glimpse, that essential key, should be his by right. Always he was tempted but he never dared risk it. Even more clearly he felt the force of the master smith's word, and perhaps it was this hunger and the only source of feeding it he knew that drew his mind toward what, in his innermost heart, he knew to be evil. He felt himself apart even from the others of the household and quietly looked down on them all. Ingar he despised even after the older apprentice had completed his prentice pieces and been made journeyman. His amiable lack of ambition and his decision to stay with the master smith and study rather than make a life of his own struck Alv as cowardly and contemptible. But outwardly he showed little of this, following the master smith's example as in all else. Sure it is that he needed no urging to despise his origins and admire the man who had raised him out of them and might raise him higher yet. So, perhaps, it is not strange that he came to feel it right and admirable to be as hard, as detached as his master, to feel joy in the domination of others, and cloak it under studied civility and friendship. Would that not seem the very stamp of a great man, a master? But he was to learn that not all of the Master Smith's visitors were his servants. It fell in the last winter of Alv's apprenticeship, when he might have been some twenty or twenty-one years of age, that the master smith sent for him. Alv found him by the fire-pit, gazing at its low flames as if reading something from them. When Alv stood respectfully by him, he did not raise his head, but spoke briskly. Well, boy, the world moves apace, and you with it. You are molding yourself well. I will need other helpers besides Ingar in the days soon to come. Therefore, though you are young for it as yet, I judge you right now to try your prentice pieces. Alf lost all his studied calm. Ma You're making me a journeyman? If I accept your work. If. Strictly by rule of guild, for it would be very useful to me one day if you were to hold a mastership in it. Very useful. So, you must prove to me that you have some command of the higher arts of the smith, scholarship, jewelry, armory, weaponry, such like. 
You will begin three test pieces, two under my direction, but the first you must manage for yourself. We will make that jewelry, I think. A simple gold arm ring, the kind wealthy young pups covet, to give their girls, when they can be sure there's a good virtue of binding and fidelity laid on it. They'll sell their souls for a really fine one, or better, their influence. Can you manage that on your own? Alv swallowed. Y yes, Master Smith. With Machain's treatise on the patterning of gold. From the east wall. Very well, you may safely take it. Mind that the ring looks good now. Graceful, nothing clumsy, but the pattern clear upon it. Now off about your work. Alv fled willingly, half afraid he would blurt out the thoughts whirling around in his head. So he would become a journeyman. That he had never doubted for a moment. But the master smith was assuming he'd be willing to stay on here, free or not. Well, safer not even to think otherwise. For now. Why set you to make a daft thing like that? Asked Rock, when he found Alv shaping the fine beeswax for a casting. He's got no use for it, that's for sure. And no more have we. Worse luck. Alv sighed. He found Rock easier to tolerate than the others, but at times he could be tiresome. Still, it was true enough what he said. The master smith had no use for women or any other desire of the body. He was cold, ascetic, saving his passions only for his work and his intrigues. His household had perforce to live as he did, which suited the younger men not a bit. Even Ingar had been heard to complain, but not when the master was around. How would I know? Maybe he has a customer in mind. Up here? Even the randiest ones won't come galloping over fifty leagues of frozen northlands just for one of those. Alv snorted impatiently. Well, maybe it's to teach me a money-making skill, then. Get me a stand to mount this on, will you? And a set of carving tools, fine ones, and sharp. He hummed to himself as he scraped at the wax, a smooth, sweeping tune that seemed to fit the gentle curves. It had no words as yet. He would find those in the symbols he would engrave around the serpentine shape, symbols taken from that ancient book and elsewhere in his ardent studies. It was up to him to weld those words together in song, as it was to blend the symbols into a harmonious pattern. The right song, the right pattern, the right fine alloy of metals sunk cleanly into the mold, without crack or bubble. They would take the impress of their creator's power and enhance it in the form he chose. When the blank wax model was complete, he laid it down gently and turned to his books, selecting and composing, scribbling on his slates, always with that smooth shape before him. A full week that labor alone took him, in which he slept little, and only remembered to eat when Rock thrust food under his nose. Here, stick your snout in a stewpot for a change. Alv threw down the heavy scroll with a growl of disgust and grabbed the bowl and the slice of black bread. Rock watched him with amusement. Don't bother to thank me, will you? The stew's not that bad. The beast's only been dead a week. Alv remembered to stay polite and mumbled an apology. Thinking too hard. Not such a dawdle as you expected, eh? Alv gave him a withering stare. You wouldn't understand. It'll do as it is. But I've got to be sure it's perfect, you hear? Perfect. I hear. I won't wait up, then. Don't fall asleep in your stew. Alv hardly heard him. That was the real problem, that half-felt memory that seemed so vital, that nagged him every time he stared down at the symbols scored on the slates before him. He had a pattern, a good pattern, and parts of it had cost him much labor. But some small characters had seemed to fall into place almost naturally, as if by instinct. The result looked good, but he couldn't work out why or find any other remotely satisfying version. He distrusted that. He had followed a shadow, something cast in his mind, a shadow of the days when he was a child, before he'd come to this place. And that was ridiculous, because then he'd known no smithcraft. He swore, and sent the bowl spinning across the room to crack against the high anvil. Whatever the reason, this way it would have to be. At dawn, Rock found him asleep over his slates. On them, the symbols were merged into a single fluid tangle of lines, and his song had found words. 
He sat by himself all that day, singing softly and carving the stylized pattern deep into the wax, burnishing away trimmings and rough edges, highlighting the design here and there with stippling. Late that evening he grafted on two short wax rods to act as sprue, and rousted out a yawning rock to fetch a bronze molding flask and a pail of fine white clay. Sand would be too coarse for this. By dawn the clay was dry and the flask set to heat at the fire pit. Rock handed him tongs wrapped in wet rags. Carefully he lifted the heavy flask, tilted it gently over an empty bowl, and spilled out the steaming wax that had once shaped those delicate curves. Only their ghosts were left now, invisible in the shell of clay. He set the flask back to heat for a moment, reached deeper into the fire, and seized a black crucible. The air shimmered violently about it as it rose, and he held it unmoving at arm's length above the flask, which Rock was steadying with tongs. Slowly, carefully, Alv tilted the crucible, and liquid spilled over and out, glowing like the sun. Alv had drawn the gold from the master smith's deep vaults, along with tiny portions of rare metals and other substances, to make it subtly stronger and easier to cast. Little by little, humming his tune, he poured the fine stream into one of the sprue holes, while Rock gently rasped a fine file over the lip of the flask, to vibrate the molten metal into all the fine detail and free any air bubbles. Steam whistled out of the other sprue hole, and every second Alv's throat tightened as he feared the mold would crack. Then a little dome of gold stood out above both sprue holes and would sink no further, and they could breathe freely once more. Now there was only the gradual cooling, moving the flask closer and closer to the lip of the fire till it rested on the rim, and at last he could seize it and plunge it into the quenching bath. The icy water boiled up and splashed his hands, but after the stinging and scarring of forge work he hardly noticed. A tap on the loose bottom of the flask freed the mold, another cracked it. As he pulled it out it fell apart in two halves like an eggshell, and the pattern gleamed warmly up at him from the clay. He reached out to it, but another hand forestalled him. The master smith swept up the mold, and the clay crumbled to dust under his long hard fingers as he looked it over. Alv watched him breathlessly, wondering how he had known to appear just at the right moment. The dark eyes gleamed as they read the pattern, reflecting the gleams of gold and firelight with a strange added luster. He gazed at it long and silently, as if seeking to unravel some puzzle. At last, he nodded and handed the arm ring to Alv, still dull and encrusted with powdery clay. I was not mistaken in you, boy. The piece is fine. It has a true power in it. More than a virtue, a power. Do you clean and burnish it now? Bring it to me tonight, and we shall consider what may be your next piece. But it was that night, as dusk was falling, that the riders arrived. It was Alv who saw them first, cantering down the steep valley floor from the north. He was sitting on the high outer window sill of his small bedroom, as he often did, gazing on the last of the sunset and seeing it strike fire from the new polished ring. At first he was mildly intrigued. No more. Such cloaked and hooded visitors were not uncommon, seldom, though, on such a beautiful white mare as the first one rode. The other was a nondescript black, but both picked their way among the uneven stones with amazing sureness and grace. Then the leader reined in sharply at sight of the tower, and Alf sat up so suddenly he almost tumbled off the ledge. The dark hood was swept back, and a swath of long hair spilled out, tinged white gold by the failing sun. The voice that hailed the tower rang between the cold cliffs high and clear as a hammer stroke. Then the woman spurred her horse down the last of the slope toward the gate, and Alf hurled himself back inside and onto the spiral stair, shouting for Ingar and Rock. He went leaping down the steps, two at a time, and out into the great bare hall. Ingar came running up the steps from the library, and Rock out of the kitchen, struggling to ask excited questions with his mouth stuffed full. Gate! panted Alf. Rider's coming! She! She? said Ingar, and whistled. He turned to the kitchen and yelled, Ernan, the gate, and be polite about it. 
Rock, stop your stuffing and go tell himself. He's deep in some book down there. And then go fetch my best robe. No, wait. He looked narrowly at Alv. This woman. Tall and blonde-haired, very blonde, almost white. Alv nodded breathlessly, but Ingar's face fell. Luhi. He shook his head. Forget the robe, Rock. Now just what on earth could be bringing her here now? Old friend of yours, this Luhi? inquired Alv archly, doing his best to look dignified again. Ingar's mouth twisted, but before he could answer, there was a clatter of feet on the library steps. They both stared in astonishment as the master smith came running out, but as Alv had never seen him, with robes and hair awry and a wild look in his dark eyes. He came striding over and grabbed Alv by the shoulders. You're sure? You saw her? Yeah, yes, Master Smith. Clearly. And she called out, riding from the north. As if to confirm his words came a single stroke on the great bronze bell at the gate, and the Master Smith's fingers bit deep into Alv's arms. Then he let go, with a murmur of apology, and turned away to adjust his tunic and robe and smooth down his hair. From outside came the soft rumble of the stone gate opening and the clatter of hooves on the polished granite. The master smith waved the others back against the wall, squared his shoulders, strode to the hall doors, and flung them wide. The great horse halted just beyond them, gleaming in the dusk. In a flurry and rustle of fabric its rider swung herself easily down and tossed the reins to an apprehensive-looking Ernan. "'Look to him well!' she called, and stepped forward into the warm light of the hall, extending a gloved hand to the mastersmith. He bowed, took it, and touched it lightly to his forehead and lips. Alv had never seen his master so deferential, but he felt no wonder in him at that. She was the loveliest woman he had ever seen. Tall and slender she stood, as tall as the mastersmith or taller, and held her head high and proud. Her pale, fine hair was gathered tight back on her head, but fell in smooth, straight cascades around her shoulders. Her high forehead and fine, chiseled features were so nearly the same shade as her hair, like milky ice, that she might have seemed a beautiful statue, but for the full lips and the flash of blue eyes under heavy lids as she glanced around the room. "'Well, my Leo,' she murmured, and her voice had the tone of the bronze bell. You seem to have made yourself comfortable here, and added to your household, too. Good day, Ingar. So you are almost a man now. At his side, Alf saw Ingar bow, with the practiced grace of a good upbringing. Then the blue eyes lit on him, and he wanted to imitate the bow, but dared not trust his shaky legs. And to you also, fair young apprentice, I do not know your name? She smiled, and Alv's throat went dry. There was something in the parting of the lips. Alv, if it please you, lady, he managed, remembering the polite formulas out of some of Ingar's romances, and made a stiff but creditable bow. To his surprise, she returned it with a grave inclination of the head, before turning to the mastersmith. It seems to me you have made a promising choice, my Leo, she said and you shall tell me what you think of mine. For Luhi also has taken an apprentice. Kara. Another rustle, a white shape moving in the dark, halting on the threshold as uncertain as Luhi was assured. The hood was not drawn back, the thin white cloak held protectively close. But Alv could see its wearer was also a woman, thinner and shorter than Luhi. The hood turned toward him for an instant, and he caught a glimpse of wide eyes and dark hair in its shadow. The master smith's dark gaze seemed to penetrate it even more keenly, for he scanned her up and down and darted a glance at Luhi, running the tip of his tongue nervously over his lips. Your judgment places mine in shadow, Luhi, as ever. May your servant ask what it is that you require of him? Luhi laughed lightly, rippling like the waterfall. Nothing more costly than an hour of your time, Milio, and to your own great profit. Things are moving that you should know of. Then we must ride. Come, show me the prospect from your tower, and we shall talk by ourselves, 
The master smith bowed silently and waved her toward the stairs. She swept toward them with a confident stride that flared out her cloak like a train. And Alv gaped. Had he really glimpsed the hilt of a broadsword against the white skirts of her riding habit? Kara trailed after her, but the master smith suddenly rounded on her. By ourselves, you said, Luhi. Well, then, she stays down here. Luhi's laugh rippled delicately. Why, Milio, how ungallant of you! Anyone would think you were afraid of the child. Well, girl, you may stay here and warm yourself by the fire as you will. But remember that we leave in an hour. The girl turned away hurriedly toward the fireplace, and the smith followed Luhi up the stairs. Ingar let out his breath with a great gusty sigh and sagged against the wall. What's got into you? demanded Alv in an undertone. Thank the powers, she's gone. Why? What's wrong with her? Ingar shuddered. Just her presence, and those eyes of hers. I can't stand them. They give me the creeps. Couldn't you feel it? No? Well, there you are, I suppose. You notice Ernan and Rock have made themselves scarce, he chuckled. Maybe she took a shine to you. If so, you may have her for me. Listen, who is this Luhi woman anyhow? Another smith? Keep your voice down, snapped Ingar, with a quick toss of the head toward the white-cloaked figure, now bending toward the great fire. I don't know. I've only seen her once before, the day she came to our old smithy at Isarka, far to the south. And that was when the master smith began making plans to move out here for good. I've heard things, though, rumors, whisperings. She's no smith, that's for sure. She had the master smith make her a sword, a fine one, a schemer, a troublemaker. A great lady, out of the Southlands, probably. I've heard they let their women get out of hand down there. Alv's gaze lingered on the girl. As if in answer, she raised a slender hand and very tentatively pushed back her hood to reveal a head of short, dark hair. She turned her head slowly, as if to steal a glance back at them, but caught Alv's glance and looked away hurriedly. "'And the girl?' he asked nonchalantly. Ingar shrugged. "'New to me, and little enough I care. If she's Luhi's, she'll be nothing for you or I. And you can take that how you like.' Alv pursed his mouth. "'There's no harm in just talking to her.' "'On your fool's head be it,' muttered Ingar, and stalked off swiftly toward the library stairs. The door banged behind him, and Alv saw the girl jump, and again when he spoke. "'Don't be frightened, lady. Make yourself at home here. May I find you a chair?' Now she did look at him, and Alv fought to stop himself goggling. She was the opposite of Luhi, and yet in her own way she too was lovely. It was her eyes he saw first, wide and strangely slanting, and as green as sea-surf. High cheekbones and a firm nose made her face seem almost triangular, narrowing down to full lips and a strong chin. Her hair was roughly cropped, just short enough to show her ears, neat and narrow. Her skin was creamy, browner than Louise, rich cream against ice. With that and those eyes, it seemed to him a face he might have glimpsed for an instant in the forest undergrowth below. She had almost an animal aspect, a hunted animal, perhaps already ensnared. For though her face was very young, suffering had graven it deep, and an unseen yoke seemed to weigh down her shoulders. The wildness in those eyes was desperation. Alf could not speak at first, for something welled up in him, a deep wash of feelings too fiercely foreign to the image of himself he had tried to forge. He grabbed one of the rough settles against the wall and thrust it toward her almost angrily, feeling utterly ludicrous but she slid down onto it wearily, and a smile glimmered on her lips. Overwhelmed, he slumped down beside her. "'I thank you, sir. It seems so long since I sat in peace by such a fire.' Her voice was startling, deeper and softer than Luhi's. She looked at him almost amusedly. "'To whom do I owe my thanks?' "'I... I... I'm an apprentice here. Candidate for journeyman, though.' They call me Alv, he shrugged. But you don't like that name much? Her clear sight stunned him. I hate it. 
but I haven't found a better one yet, not one I could bear without, well, feeling foolish. Like flopping around in someone else's clothes. Reach me down rags. She nodded. Her smile was grave still, but more definitely there. You could have no pride in that, but be patient. You'll find your name, I know you will, and earn it. There's something about you. I sense it. And so did Louhi. I heard her. You're somebody special, one alone, out of the ordinary. So are you. So are you. She closed her eyes a moment, and her smile tautened. Yes, to my grief. Her head bowed, and the firelight trembled on her cheek. The white cloak fell apart. Beneath it she wore a plain smock like any village girl's, but in dark, soft material. Her long, fine hands looked very white against it as they twisted in her lap. The water roared, the wheel turned, the great hammers pounded, the fire came rushing through him. He seized her hands and held them tight against him. Lady, I'll help you. Just tell me how, and I'll help you. She stared at him, wildly again, but did not shrink away. Her grip tightened within his own, and with strength that startled him she caught his hands to her breast. You can't. No smith welded my chains, and even if you were the greatest among men you could not unmake them. Never. Then she subsided and laughed a little, but there was no mockery in it. But one day, perhaps I can. I had ceased to believe that, or to see any gain in doing so. But knowing somebody wants to try, that itself heartens me so much, so very much. Anything, I'd risk anything. Her face set, and light awoke in her eyes, light glimmering on a pool in some immense forest, far greater than any he knew. No, I forbid you, for not only you would suffer, and you may have some great destiny ahead of you. I would not deny that to the world. In less than an hour, Louhi takes me from here. Let her. And never see you again? Never know what... what? Tears, at least, he could still damn. That much control he kept. But he knew his lip quivered like a child's. Twenty years old! Candidate journeyman. He had briefly felt himself grown to a man. Now he felt empty, helpless. I promise you this, she said slowly, intensely, that from now on I'll never despair. I'll watch and wait for any sane chance I have to free myself. And then I'll seek you out, wherever you are, and you'll know. Believe me, and be content. Flames flickered up in the hearth, a coal cracked and settled. The idea came to him in a rush. He could still face himself in his glass on the morrow. He could still risk something on a venture. He felt the fire's warmth in his smile. I'll believe you, Kara, if you'll be held to your promise, if you'll accept a token. And he held out the arm ring. She hesitated a moment, then took it, wondering, and turned it this way and that. The gold reddened in the light, and the flames danced along its pattern. There is a virtue in this, she said, and her voice trembled. I, of all folk, should take care, should take long counsel, before allying myself to such a thing. I should be slow to take it upon me. Then, violently, she thrust her hand out and threw it, and it rode high on her bare arm, past the elbow, and clung there. Be you as slow to keep your promise, then, said Alv dryly, and they both doubled up with laughter, the foolish mirth that breaks the cords of fear. They swayed together, and for an instant her breath mingled with his, their lips brushed, and then they sprang apart, for they heard light footfalls on the stair and the rustle of Louhi's robe. Her hands gripped his an instant, and they were parted. When Louhi and the master smith stepped into the hall, Kara sat by the fire alone, head bowed as before. The tall woman looked around and gave a delicate, disdainful sniff. It stinks of animal in here now, after the clean air, and soot and food and hot metal. I long for the open road again. Come, Kara. Alv, at the open kitchen door, watched her rise and follow, saw the door thrust wide, and heard the clatter of hooves on the flagstones as if they were stamping on his heart. 
but he stood respectfully, and as the master smith ushered out Lu He and followed, Kara's arm darted out, gold bedecked, from beneath her cloak, to touch his. It will aid me, she whispered fiercely. The cloak fell back, and he saw for the first time, as if in a dream, that it was lined with innumerable minute black feathers. The hooves departed, the outer gate creaked softly too, and the master smith returned, rubbing his hands. He looked pale and harassed, but relieved, as if some immediate burden had been lifted. He sat by the fire in silence for an hour or so, and then called Alv to him. Well, boy, let's be having a look at your arm ring. My arm ring, Master Smith? Are you giving it to me? The Master Smith looked slightly askance at him. Yes, if you wish it, since it is your own work, though the gold is mine. But not your other pieces, mind. Well for you if you do not grow to love your own work too greatly, to dispose of it to advantage. Indeed, Master Smith, said Alv, and bowed. I have already given it away. What? To whom? Alv drew a breath, and told him. For one instant a blacker fury than he had ever seen crossed his master's brow, and then, surprisingly, the smith began to laugh softly. So we have given a gift to Luhi. For what that girl has, Luhi has. Be sure of that. And what precious thing did you get in return? No, save me the mawkish details, I can guess. He laughed again, a chilly little laugh, and Alv ground his teeth at what that laugh made of his hour. The smith pursed his lips. Well... The price was high indeed for any such matter, but at least there was a price. If you must trifle with women, better you learn to keep it a matter of trade than let them assume undue importance and distract you from serious matters. He grew thoughtful. Luhi herself would know the bauble for what it was and not wear it, but who knows if the girl happened to keep the arm ring? It might yet benefit us greatly to have a hold over one so close to Luhi's secrets. Who knows? He clapped his hands briskly. So, to bed now, for tomorrow you begin work on your second piece, and that is armory. You will make me a helm of fine mail, and in it a virtue of concealment, of change, of moving subtly and unseen. Dream of that. But Alf dreamed of nothing. He could not sleep. His head burned on his hard pillow, strange twisted images of the day unreeling in his mind. One minute he would seethe with anger at the master smith for casually assuming he had been pawing at Kara, the way the old headman used to treat his maidservants, and then even more at himself for not having done so. It was what he wanted, wasn't it? What caused the dull, swelling ache in him now? She'd probably have enjoyed it well enough, giggled and given in the way the maidservants did. With what he'd given her, for what, for the shadow of a kiss? He might have commanded the body of a great lady like Luhi, or for its worth in gold, a hundred street girls. He might at least have got better value for it. And then he turned over and groaned. If he could think like that, the master smith had made an understandable mistake, had read his character only too well. That was just what he'd thought of trying, might have tried, if it had been any other girl than Kara. But then why did the image of her still torment his body and banish his sleep? At last he swung himself out of his bed, tottered to the window, and flung the casement wide. The night air poured in, crisp and cold enough even at the end of winter, to make his lungs blaze. He hung there, drinking in great gulps, looking at the ice glow, and thinking how peaceful to be out there, cool and sterile, free from the tortures of the body. And yet, somehow, he would yearn for them still. Then below him he heard the soft boom of the hall door shutting, and the crunch of boots on flagstones. Startled, he looked down and saw the master smith walk out across the yard toward the main gate. It was late at night, everybody must be asleep, except, of course, him. Alv bit his lip. Could the smith have had second thoughts, and be going after Lou, he, and Kara to get back the arm ring? Surely not. But— a spirit of deviltry seized Alv. He had already taken one risk and got away with it. 
He flung on his clothes, grabbed cloak and boots, and went padding barefoot down the worn stone stairs, paused an instant to don his boots on the warm hearthstone in the hall, and cautiously unlatched the front door. The clatter and creak of latch and hinges sounded deafening against the silence of the night, but nobody stirred in response. The front gate was securely fastened, but he had learned the lore of locks from this one's maker, and it was fastened from the outside only. He moved through it like a ghost, the gate stirred, and then he was looking down at a trail of footprints in the deep snow. He hesitated a moment, then ran softly and lightly along their track, carefully placing his feet in the actual prints so no second track would show. At every rise or hummock he would hunch down against cover to spy out his way ahead. And that was as well, else he would not have heard the voices in the gully beyond. He crept to the edge, peered over, and froze. The master smith was there, but not alone. Gathered around him on the snow was a semicircle of shadows, shapeless things, but with voices, low, dark, and guttural. The tallest of them was a head or so shorter than the smith, and he stood stiff and dignified above the jabbering group. Their voices rose suddenly as if in fury, but when the master smith snapped out one or two words, no more, in a clear, commanding tone they fell silent at once. Then the master smith turned as if to walk away, and Alv pulled his head back sharply. If the master smith was going back to the house, he would have to be there first. He turned and went sprinting back to the gate, and breathed easily only when it was locked behind him. Now his mind had something else to whirl over as he padded carefully across the courtyard. What were those shadow creatures? Were they real, alive, or some kind of sinister snow spirit? They looked like no people he had ever heard of, and he thrilled at the master smith's courage in dealing with them so. He crept into the hall and risked a moment at the low fire imagining himself become a master mage, whose works could call dark spirits in the night to fulfill his slightest wish, to compel any girl he desired. And was it such a wild hope? Soon he would be a journeyman, maybe a master, while yet young. Then he wouldn't need to lie awake at night, not alone, anyhow. Any girl he desired. But then there would be Kara for surely he would find her before anything, and her he would not compel. He sighed, turned away, and knocked over the settle with a resounding, echoing crash. Guiltily he scooped it up, waiting for doors to be flung open and angry shouts. Should he bolt for the stairs or try to brazen it out? Either way would look suspicious, would very soon reach the master smith's ears. And what then? He would at least suspect. But there were no doors opening, no shouts, and he was almost aggrieved at the silence. Had everyone else vanished, too? He peered into the kitchen. Ernan's thin snore came undisturbed from his little room beyond. Alv glided across to the storeroom and heard Rock's loud snorts. He even seemed to grumble in his sleep. Alv touched his shoulder, found no response, shook and finally pinched him. Rock snorted more loudly, but did not awaken. Greatly daring, Alv applied the same tests to Ernan, who also did not stir. Then, afraid of the master smith's returning, he tiptoed back upstairs, and then passed his room up to Ingar's. A light burned there, but there was no answer when he knocked. He found the journeyman flat out in his bed, with a book over his face and a lamp stinking and guttering beside him. Sleep had evidently struck him while he read, and could not be shaken off him. Alv blew out the lamp and stole away, shaken, to his own bed. The whole household lay under some spell of sleep, and he could guess why, to cloak its master's night goings. Perhaps he did it often, and Alv had either succumbed to it or slept naturally as he normally did. But tonight, tonight the turmoil in his mind had kept him awake. Or had it unleashed something, some force in him, that could resist the master smith's enchantment? Then surely he was a mage born. In the promise of that, in images of sensual delight, he found release and finally sleep. But the last vision in his mind was his first sight of Kara's face. Chapter 3 The Sword 
Alv awoke next morning with the first gray glimmer of dawn in his eyes and a driving urgency in his mind. For a moment, bewildered, he could hardly remember what it was. The events of the night had turned his old world wholly upside down. Then he remembered. His second trial piece. The master smith had said it. Today the work would begin. He suddenly felt very empty and helpless, the puzzles of the night retreating before a new and immediate problem. A helm of fine mail, and in it a virtue of concealment, of change, of moving subtly and unseen. Virtues, indeed! He knew something of them, how to charm a jewel setting so it tended to turn away thievish eyes, to work a sword hilt so in action its blade would blur before the eyes of an unwary opponent. But these were light powers, minor charms added to some greater work, little use if their existence was suspected. Making them strong, making them work together as the living heart of a piece, the difficulty of it loomed over him like a wall. He panicked. He didn't have the faintest idea where to begin. And yet, if he was to have any chance of ever finding Kara again, he'd have to. He slumped down despondently. It seemed monstrously unfair, a task like that. Surely the master smith hadn't said anything so hard to Ingar, the booklouse, Ingar of the parchment anvil. Then the weight lifted so suddenly he laughed aloud. Of course, the second and third pieces weren't supposed to be things an apprentice could manage on his own. They were meant to stretch him as well as test him. Well, it would, this one. And now that he was able to think more clearly, he thought he could see a clue in the very form of the thing. Chain mail. A hole made up of thousands of tiny separate pieces. Like the elements of a living body, said the master smith, and nodded. You see clearly, as I have always said, each link a distinct work in itself, with its own particular virtue, some of one kind, some another, weak in themselves, for it is hard to make such negative virtues strong. But joined together into a single thing with an identity of its own, then they become strong. Alf nodded, tracing the archaic words on the great scroll spread out before them. Ein Herr Elof Halns Stürmer, Stalan Zimars Olnere Elof. There is made, he translated slowly, running his finger from word to word, one alone, a hole, into a hole, I mean, a power surpassing by many, being linked. Why does it repeat one alone? A copyist's mistake? Hardly, said the master smith sardonically, since the copyist was I. It is a poetic form of Oliver, an even more archaic term for smith, literally shaper, used here in the dative as a scholar's pun and to heighten the assonance of the lines. I incline to think that is important in your chant. Use these lines and keep as much assonance as you can in the lines around them. You see their meaning now? The smith makes single things strong by combining them into a greater identity. Remember, identity is important, the more so the greater the virtue in an object. If a portion of the helm is ill-made, the whole thing fails, and you must needs begin again. And if it was damaged, Master Smith? That would depend on the extent and type of the damage. A few broken rings would not ruin it altogether, though they would weaken it. Replace them exactly, if you can, and it will revive. But anything that destroyed its identity as a helm would surely destroy its virtue altogether. So though you would not wear it as armor to ward off blows, it must be made strong in metal and frame, as the pattern shows. Go as far as you can with it, ask my help at need, and when I judge you have done enough, I shall complete it. But you will need to study first. There is a text on ring mail in the Southron tongue which you may find useful somewhere on the east wall, and various odd passages in other books. And you must read some works on the powers of concealment and the guise of forms. You will find some references on the slate below the pattern. You may study to your heart's content the first scroll of the Alvarthen. 
and my notes on the Fjoth characters added to the third chapter of the Book of Tarn. I may find you others as you plan your work. Begin now. The first thing Alv did was seize the large slate with its precious pattern and scan eagerly through the references. There were many texts from east and west walls he had not so far been allowed to read, but still none from the north. He sternly repressed the cloud of disappointment that settled about him. Why should he expect his master to scatter his hard-earned lore before mere apprentices? Surely the quickest way to it was to get on with the task in hand, to the utter limit of his abilities. And this he did. This time his preparation took not one week but four. He soaked himself in every authority he could find, till at times he had to force himself away from the books, head buzzing, and find relief in simpler tasks. Rock watched all this with cynical amusement, brought Alv the occasional meal, and loudly blessed the powers that had never made him a magesmith. But for all his concentration there were other thoughts nagging away at Alv. Some were of Kara, though those he could escape by reminding himself that this work was also his quickest way to her. But there were some, however trifling, that he could not escape, for he was reminded of them on almost every page or column of scroll he came to. Somewhere on them, often across the bottom left, he would almost always find slight chalky smudges. He wiped them off carefully in case he was blamed for them, the Master Smith cared for his library, and remained mildly puzzled as to their cause. He had not yet found it, however, by the time he felt ready to begin. With the Master Smith's wire drawing devices, he had made great coils of heavy wire in many metals, copper and gold and delicately alloyed steel. He had patterns ready to be minutely engraved round the edge of every single ring. He had characters into which the rings would be woven, in carefully balanced combinations, and patterns to be inlaid, embossed or enameled around the main frame of the helm. And for each of these he had its own chant, distinct but linked as closely as the finished rings. First, though, he made the frame, and that was a simple enough business. It resembled the ordinary light helm worn by warriors for skirmishing or scouting, where swiftness was their best protection. One band of fine bronze circled the brow, two hoops crossed the head from front to back and sideways, between them went a stiff leather lining, and over that a layer of male rings. The rings hung down in a curtain to shield the back of the neck, and could be fastened across the throat or the lower part of the face. Then he began on the long labor of crafting the rings, engraving the lengths of steel wire and shaping them, not into plain circles but into peculiar distortions which would let them mesh easier and lie closer, to the good of both armor and virtue. These he would blend piece by minute piece into the pattern, sometimes overlaying them with smaller rings of gold and copper to highlight its lines. It was a long labor almost another month, and when the mail was complete he held it up in the light of the forge. It was as if the waterfall had overwhelmed the chamber, for the mail reflected a great shimmering wave of light across the dark walls, and the rings rang and chuckled like water among stones. For a moment Alv thought of the hillside streams of his childhood, and felt suffocated in this shadowy, seasonless place. Then, shrugging, he turned to the frame, secured the mail to the leather interior, fitted these together to the frame, and hammered the last bronze rivet flat with a die that stamped a binding symbol. Well, demanded Rock, who had been holding the die for him, that's as much as was on the master's pattern. What are you waiting for? Alv stared a doubtful moment at his creation. There seemed to be nothing inconspicuous about that glistening thing. Still, he raised it as if to put it on his head. And the master smith reached out and received it graciously. He, too, looked at it a moment, as if puzzled, and then quickly placed it on his head, smoothing the mail out around his neck. The rings rang more quietly. Nothing else seemed to change. But then the master smith reached up and fastened the mail across his face. The rings shone as brightly in the forelight, but somehow the tiny gaps between them grew harder, deeper, more black, until night seemed to seep out of the helm like thick lamp-black ink. The highlights still shone, but behind them it was as if the mask itself and its wearer drew further and further back into the shadow, blurring, quietening, 
becoming indistinct. It was like a pond draining and drying in the darkness, leaving nothing but a few gleaming puddles. Knowing someone stood there, Alv and Rock strained their eyes and could just make him out. Otherwise, he would have seemed nothing but one of the insubstantial shadows that darkness creates. In a forest, anywhere with cover, he could have walked unheard, unnoticed, as good as invisible. Behind the young men, the library door swung open. Ingar walked in and stopped short at the sight of Alv and Rock. Seen the master anywhere? What are you two gaping at? There was a sudden trill of metal, and the master smith stood bareheaded before them, with the helm swinging from one hand. It was Ingar's turn to stare. The younger men whooped with laughter, but Alves faded in him as he caught a flicker of some deeper disquiet on the journeyman's heavy face. "'A pretty enough prentice piece, Ingar. Do you not think so?' inquired the master smith with quiet satisfaction. "'A fine work,' said Ingar, equally quietly. "'May I see it?' The master smith looked at him a moment before handing it over. He rolled it around in his thick fingers, held the mail work up to the light, and let out a long, slow whistle. There are more powers than one in this, if they can be tapped. Complete it, and— That is what I intend to do, said the Master Smith calmly, taking it from him. A look passed between them, one Alv caught, but could not understand. But that is beyond Alv's concerns for the moment. Your second piece is accepted, boy, with honor. But now, to your third. Rest now, and what it is you shall learn. In the morning. You also, Ingar and Rock, it is late enough. Sleep you well. But again Alf found himself unable to sleep. His mind had grown used to racing, and without the effort of the work in hand to distract and exhaust him, it kept him awake long hours into the night, worrying over everything, great or small. What would he be given to create next? Why had Ingar reacted so strangely today? Could it be jealousy, perhaps? What more could the helm do? And, as every night, he thought of Kara. Where was she now? He laughed to himself bitterly. How wide was the world? He had lost her, failed her. A sound of thunder shook him, and he sat bolt upright in bed. A storm? But there had been no flash at the window. It came again, and this time he knew beyond all doubt. It was coming from below. The great hammers were at work. He sat and listened for a moment. He slipped into his tunic and went to the door. Why wasn't the house in an uproar? with that din. And yet in the intervals he could hear Ingar's snores drifting down the stairwell. So it had to be the master smith again, about some secret work. He closed his door and stood there indecisive, torn between his desire to slip down and see what was happening and his fear of having his immunity found out. There was no telling what the master smith might do then. Why risk anything now, when he was so near his goal? But the need awoke again in him that was to rule his whole life, the need to know. And step by hesitant step it forced him down the cold stairs, through the hall, and down to the echoing forge below. The door was shut, and he did not dare lift the latch. Sound and movement might be noticed. He stooped to the keyhole. It was wide, and he could see right across the forge. There were the plunging shadows of the hammers, but even as he watched, they fell silent, and he shrank back, afraid the master smith was somehow aware of him. But then he heard the explosive hiss of something being plunged into the quenching trough, and a moment later the rasp of a heavy file. He dared to look again and saw the master smith clearly, at his bench now, working away at something clamped into a large vice. After a few moments he freed it, picked up something else, tried the two together, and nodded calmly to himself. Then he took a hammer and what looked like a die and began to tap in rivets. Something rang and rippled as he worked, and Alv felt a sliver of the ice against his spine. It was the helm. The master smith was completing it. And sure enough, when he had finished, he held it up, just as Alv had, turning it round and round to look for any slight damage. Alv gaped. The helm 
now had a front to it, an eye mask that looked to be of silver steel, cast in the form of hawk like glaring eyes. These were outlined by a thick rope of twisted wires flattened onto the metal. The hammers must have been for making that and welding it onto the mask. The master smith stared at this for a moment, then lifted the helm and placed it on his head with careful ceremony, like a crown. He made no move to fasten the concealing mail. For a minute he strode back and forth, crossing and recrossing the narrow viewpoint of the keyhole. Alv could see his lips moving, but heard no sound. Then a hand swept up the mail to hide his face, the shadows seemed to deepen, and he strode out of view. Alv waited for him to reappear, but he did not. The moment grew longer and longer, and Alv felt less and less safe where he was. The master smith, visible or invisible, might come out of that door at any moment. At last he straightened cramped legs and tiptoed slowly and carefully back up the stairs. But when he reached the hall he froze in horror. There were footsteps on the stairs. He scuttled back into the shadows by the front door and crouched there, quivering with fright, as he saw the master smith himself, still wearing the helm, but with its mask now open, come down the last few steps, walk casually across the flagstones, and down the stairs Alv had just come up. The stairs, which were the only way down to the forge. Back in his bed, Alv lay awake and brooded. The smith might easily have gone through into the library and up those stairs to the far end of the hall, but then Alv would have heard him, his footsteps, or the creak of the library's heavy outer door. Could the completed helm now mask all these sounds as well? What other stranger powers did it now confer? Of moving subtly. He drifted off to sleep, trying to draw comfort from a vision of Kara. But why were her eyes so cruel, predatory, hawk-like? This technique is called pattern welding, said the master smith. Do you remember reading about it? Alv screwed up his eyes. Yes, master smith, I do. An ancient method of forging a strong blade when they had little good steel and no easy way of making it. Indeed, said the master smith, running his fingers over the short rope of twisted wires. So far there had been no mention of what the rest had been used for, and Alv was not going to admit he knew. But its very antiquity makes it more than that, for in the course of time it has gathered about it much, much lore. The first great smiths of our kind were taught it by those of the elder kind, and they in turn by the powers they had revered and abandoned. Like the craft of mail, it takes complexity and makes unity of it, but greater complexity and a more solid unity. Great virtue can be bound up in it by those who have the skill. So, for your trial piece of weaponry, you will make me a sword, but a sword such as you might one day craft for kings, a sword with a virtue of command and obedience, of order and submission. You will prepare everything and shape the blade, but the completion is delicate work, and that may be left to me. It will be long in the forging, many months, I am sure. But when they are over, so will end your apprenticeship. And great things will await us all then, for the world is moving. Moving. He paused and sat back, staring into an infinite distance. At length he reached out and tapped the roll of parchment on the table. Some references to start your studies, boy. More than one or two slates will hold, as you see. Open it and read. Fascinated, forgetting the mysteries that gathered around him, Alv unrolled the stiff crackling stuff and read the crabbed script. A page here, a page there, notes, a chapter. The reading alone would take weeks. And that is not all, said the master smith somberly. You will require the ancient text Istihain, its first section on the symbols associated with command and dominion. I have made some notes in it of forms I found used by the Akwesh shamans, which appear to resemble many of ours, but in more archaic, purer forms. Also, the Skolnheri book, left by a great smith from the East many centuries ago. It has pages on pattern welding, and others on the powers of command. Alv looked at him. I do not remember even seeing those on the shelves, Master Smith, let alone reading them. No, indeed, said the Master Smith dryly. And little it would have profited you if you had read them. 
They are on the north wall. Alv's eyes widened, and he started to say something, but the smith held up a hand. Wait, I am not making you free of it. Not yet. Come with me now. They threaded their way between anvils and machines toward the library, where Ingar, scribbling furiously on a slate, paid no attention as they went past. The master smith stopped before the racks of scrolls on the north wall, drew out one, and lifted a heavy fan-fold book from a high shelf. Alf could see long tongues of parchment protruding from them both. The smith carried them to a table and opened them carefully. He touched the parchment strips. I marked these for you last night. See, from here to here in the Istihane scroll, and in the Skolnheri book, between this marker and this, to the end of this page. He pointed to the end of the leaf, crammed with crabbed black lettering in an archaic cursive script, interspersed with tight little drawings of symbols or elaborately ornamented characters in red and black. One, the distorted face of some crouching beast, grimaced out from beside the master smith's finger. The wide margins were filled with his flowing script. Thus far and no further, do not let your eyes stray to an earlier or a later page, to another book, not even by chance. You would find little profit in anything you chanced to learn. Alf nodded, a little rebelliously. Very well. And do not take them into the forge. They are too valuable. That was reasonable enough, but Alv, watching the master's retreating back, felt like disobeying it, simply out of spite. It was like having a drink snatched away from your lips after the first sip. What he had done so far might please his master, but not him. He felt he had learned almost nothing from any of it, not enough to let him strike out confidently on his own as he planned to do. He might with luck be able to reproduce such a bracelet if he could get the gold. But the helm was another matter. Information had been carefully measured out for him so that he knew well enough what he was doing, but had only the barest grasp of why. There was nothing he could apply to any other work, and he had not even been allowed to bring it to its full strength to appreciate all those powers his own skill had invested in it. And now it was happening again. Why? To make sure he'd stay? To tether him firmly to his master's apron strings? He didn't want to believe that. He reigned in his temper, remembering the gratitude and admiration he still felt, afraid of hasty judgments. But the doubt still hovered blackly around him. He looked across at Ingar, blissfully engrossed in transferring his notes onto parchment. Does he ever feel like this, fenced in, cousined with false hopes, cheated? Probably not. He had no driving ambition, no great reason for it. Apron strings suited him very well. Ingar tossed down his pen on the slab, scattered fine powder onto the wet page, and threw it aside with a satisfied grunt. Then he snatched up his slates and scrubbed them clean with a fold of his left shirt sleeve. He tossed them down and caught Alv's eye. Filthy habit, he said unapologetically. I can never be bothered hunting for the cloth when I'm busy. It's sticking out of your pocket, said Alv, striving to keep his voice level. Ingar, I never did ask you just what your prentice pieces were. Can't tell you. Not till you're a journeyman yourself. Guild rules, remember, and the master's a stickler for them. He shall nor seek nor have help or advice save from his own master. Not like that, ass. All I meant was I don't remember seeing you bent over an anvil for as long as I look to be. Should hope not grunted Ingar. Guild rules don't undervalue scholarship the way tykes like you do. You can substitute dissertations for the two higher pieces if your master thinks fit. So I did. He pointedly unrolled the next page of the work he was studying and leaned forward over it in his customary reading position. Alv nodded slowly and looked down at the page below him. There was the slight chalk smudge, much the same as the others, including, no doubt, one on the column Ingar now read. The fastidious master smith would never treat clothes or books thus. So, Ingar had trodden this ground before him, and read almost every other page Alv had had doled out to him. Alv drew a deep breath. He could guess just what those dissertations had been about. Deep in his mind, almost sooner than he could admit it to himself, his doubt was becoming a certainty. 
The master smith was seeking to tether them both not only rationing the knowledge he was giving them, but carefully separating it, encouraging them to stay within their specialties. Ingar the scholar, seeking knowledge without the craft to put it into effect. Alv, the man of skills, denied the learning to use them. Both of them less than a whole craftsman, both of them dependent on their master, doomed to use their gifts for him, as he chose to direct. Black anger rose in Alv's throat, the worse for being wholly helpless. What could he do? There was nobody he could even talk to about it. Ingar had seen it already, last night if not sooner. Alv remembered his strange look when he was confronted with the powerful reality of the helm his studies had given shape. He had seen it and accepted it, perhaps even liked the idea, because it gave him an easy, congenial living without sweating over an anvil which is all very fine for him, but me? Where does it leave me? Right up your own chimney, said Rock, and laughed raucously. Alv glared at him. He had had to talk to someone, and while he had tried to avoid becoming close or familiar with the forge boy, Rock had somehow remained the nearest thing to a friend he had. So in the end he had swallowed his pride and told him something of what he feared, putting the best possible complexion on it and with no question of seeking advice. But, of course, the first thing Rock said was, If you want my advice, he seemed to be waiting for Alv to deny it. If you want my advice, he repeated inexorably, stick it out, then get out. Getting to be a journeyman, that's the thing, getting the badge and script, then push off and find some other bolt hole. Maybe I don't know enough yet, Rock shrugged. Pick it up as you go along, the rank's what folk will pay heed to. Take what you're given and use it, that's what I say. Maybe you're right, Alv admitted. After all, it was no more than he'd planned, wasn't it? But he hated the idea of leaving without at least some of the unique learning that was here, and was denied him. His anger turned round then and became a cooler, more calculating thing. Maybe you're right, he repeated, and Rock looked at him shrewdly. But Alv kept his own counsel then, though he did not cease to think. Go he would but not without at least some of that special knowledge, knowledge he could rely on to make his living and let him search for Kara. And he would gain it by turning the master smith's own methods against him. Since Ingar was so content to be used by his master, why should Alv not make equal use of him? And so he threw himself into what was to be the hardest labor of his life till then. Throughout the long weeks of study, he kept returning again and again to those texts from the north wall. In them he had at last found a foretaste of the knowledge that he wanted so much, that in truth was as necessary to him as meat to the starving, so strongly did the craft within him burn to find its fullest expression. But what little he learned served only to awaken further that appetite, never satisfying it. Often he felt tempted, driven, to disobey the master smith's injunctions, but though he was no longer sure he believed the books were guarded, still he never once dared to let even a page too many fall open. What he was allowed, however, he read and re-read, draining the last fine drops of learning from it, and most of all the master smith's own notes in the margins. These came from many sources, but the ones he found most illuminating seemed to stem from comparisons with the lore of the Equesh. Indeed, said the master smith gravely, when Alv sought counsel from him one day. Their smithcraft is often rough and savage, for it is the preserve of their tribal shamans, who must also be priests, chroniclers, bards, healers, and counselors to the chieftains in peace and war. Their metalworking is elementary and knows little of fine alloys and precious metals. But they have some special skills, little practiced in more civilized lands. One of these is the use of masks, in which the wearer, as it were, becomes his own living symbol. But these they make chiefly from wood, as yet. I have experimented at combining their skills with ours, and have often found the results very potent. Alv thought of the Thunderbird, the beautifully crafted metal death's head within, and the keen, cold mask that now fronted that strange helm. He nodded with polite interest, but said nothing. They are also concerned, continued the Master Smith, with the swaying of wills, and that is what makes their work relevant here. 
In their tribes, where the chieftains enjoy all power of life and death over their people, such things are more easily and openly studied than among our own, and more greatly valued. So I feel that by considering their equivalents, these characters of ours, here and here, could well be modified thus. It was not the first or the last advice he gave. He never hovered over Alv, but he seemed to be constantly on hand when he was needed. His counsel was always good, always helpful when Alv had a choice to make. But about the reasons for that choice he was given only the most general ideas, little or nothing he could apply to other works. Alv was careful never to appear less than satisfied and delighted with what he was given, choking down the frustration he felt. And in truth he often forgot it, as the sword seemed to take shape among the piles of slate and parchment before him. More than once he dreamed of this, of sliding his fingers down among the litter of papers and touching cold metal there, but metal that quivered at his touch and went slithering away through the rustling layers like a snake among fallen leaves. But day by day the image of the sword grew less elusive, more real, till it came to occupy his mind almost to the exclusion of all else. He had not forgotten his other concerns, his fears and hopes and desperate love, but it was as if he poured them into a single mold and sought to hammer them all out at the same anvil where he would forge the sword. It seemed so clear before him now that his arms grew taut and tense as he sat, impatient to be striking the first hard blows. But he knew where impatience led, and what flamed in his mind he quenched with the cool precision that he would first of all need. For no work he had yet attempted, not even the helm, had been so minute and so complex. And, as at last he drew all his patterns together, and scribed the final design onto stiff yellow parchment with a fine silver-tipped quill, he almost quailed at the weight of the work that lay upon him. Five rods of metal would make up the sword, one for a spine, two for the body of the blade, and two, longer and thinner and of harder stuff, set round the outside to take the fine edge essential to a good weapon. Each of these rods he would make from many strands of metal twisted together like ropes, and these strands themselves he would in turn twine out of many finer ones, cords and bowstrings and threads of many metals and alloys, starting with strands thinner than his own fine hair. And each of these would have its own symbols, its own virtues, to be sung into it with its own proper song. He stopped suddenly, pen hovering over the paper like the great condor that had borne it. He had planned them all. He had command of the songs, the symbols, the metals, and surely, above all, he had the skills. Then what could he not do? What was lacking in him now for the master smith to fulfill? The five rods you will make as you have planned, said the master smith approvingly. His dark eyes flashed as he scanned the crammed parchment. And though I would not entrust it to every apprentice, I see no reason why you should not also make up the spine and body of the blade. And the edge, master smith? Alf strained to sound no more than normally eager. The master smith smiled faintly. In the edge of a sword is power. In the edge of a sword is what gives meaning to its presence, force fined down to a cutting thinness to strike where it will profit most, the final sanction that enforces the command given. The body is the command, the threat. The edge is the enforcement, the execution. Without its edge, the sword would be only a dull threat, a club at best, its violence dissipated, ineffective. So, this edge is crucial and must be invested with extra strength. It needs not only the symbols sung into it, it must bear others. He shook his head sadly, and his long dark hair rustled against the rich collar of his robe. These I cannot trust you with, not yet. They are of my own devising and difficult to use, perhaps even dangerous. So I will take that work upon myself. He smiled more widely. But I am sure that you would find the stamp of a journeyman some balm for your pride, at least. We will see. But for now, to your forging. The first days of it were long and wearisome, and they grew to weeks as Alv struggled with the metal that seemed to grow willful under his hands. For him the passing of time became measured by the chime of hammer on anvil, 
the slow, deep gasping of the bellows, the verses of the chants that hung leaden on his dry tongue. The master smith had predicted he would often fail, and often he did, most often of all within reach of success. It was then that an overstrained filament would weaken and snap, or welded cords would part at a blow. Alv would simply stare at the remains and hurl them aside. If it was time then to eat or sleep, he would, otherwise, with unfailing patience, he would simply start again. He lived to a strict order, never working long hours or missing meals, because he could see that haste would not help him here. Later it would be forced on him, and he must save his endurance for then. So it was long months before he had even completed enough of the long cords of iron and steel, as thick around as his thumb, that would become the five rods. Some were entwined with threads of bronze and gold, others with thinnest webs of rarer metals and fine alloys. But those for the edges were made all of steel, hardened with traces of strange metals and other substances. So far you have done well, said the master smith, and quicker than I feared. Alv looked up sharply and caught Rock's eye. The forge boy shrugged eloquently. Feared? Did it matter how long he took? The master smith had never even suggested that, but he did not press the question. The smith was looking odd now, troubled, almost afraid, if you could imagine that in such a man. It seemed to have been growing on him for some time, since that night in the snow, perhaps. He spoke often of the Southlands, though he seemed never to go away now. Alv remembered what Ingar had said, that Luhi's last visit had begun the master smith's plans to move here. What had she set in motion now? The master smith laid down the length of metal he had been examining. You cannot linger over the rods. Now comes the race. Then the bellows must needs blow faster, and rock was kept busy topping up the fire pit with coal and charcoal and silver sand to keep it and the metal clean, till the air shafts could barely cope and the stink of soot and sulphur hung in the air. Alf bound together seven of the stiff cords, carefully chosen and matched, with thin wire, and thrust their tips into the glowing part of the pit, plucked them out an instant later, and beat them together on the anvil. Then they went back to the fire till they glowed red-white, had a cloth wrapped round them, and were jammed into a ring swage set in the anvil's side. Alv set a lever under them, tensed his foot on it, and by the sheer force of his arms and shoulders, twisted the thick metal strands about each other a hand-span or so, with the words of his song hissing through his teeth. Then the glow died, and the cords went back to the fire, the bellows wheezed, and again Alv strained till the sweat rolled in rivulets down his forehead. For another hand-span or so the separate strands became a thick coiled rod, threaded like a screw, coated with grey dust from the fire. But as Alv's fire in strength and song bore down on it, the coating cracked and fell away to uncover the clean glowing metal, the threads twisted closer and closer until they met and became a single surface with only a faint coiled tracery to show where they had been. And so— in twenty hours of unstinting, unceasing work, the first rod was made. Each of the others took as long, but on the tenth day after that they were complete. That night he slept the long sleep of exhaustion. The next day, at first light, Alv went upstairs instead of down, up past Ingar's room and the master smith's many chambers, right to the tower top. Now was the time that the sword must be made whole, and he wished to clear his mind before beginning anew. And when the great slab had slid back at the stairhead, and he mounted out on the high pavement, he was startled to see only a light frost on the tessellated stone, and mere remnants of snow on the master smith's turret, and the rocks around. He flexed his muscles, and felt new strength arise in his arms. The wind blew from the south and the smell of woodland and plain and shore hung on it, all fresh, all new. He breathed deeply, blinking in the daylight, for since he last saw it he had worked away the winter, and spring would be coming soon. He jumped at the hollow creek from behind him. The turret door was swinging open, and the master smith stepped out. He, too, blinked at the light, and his face was drawn and anxious. His rich blue robe was creased, and he looked as if he had not slept. 
but when he saw Alf, the weariness fell away before his usual suave goodwill. So you also seek wisdom on the heights, boy? No doubt about what you undertake today? No need of my counsel? Good. I am glad, for I fear I must leave you for a day or so. I hate to do so at such a time, but it must be. The world presses on me, as I had hoped it would cease to in this place. Alf smiled ruefully. I am sorry, Master Smith. It will be difficult, but I am rested and ready. Good. Then try to have your work completed by tomorrow when I return. Alf bowed his head to hide the grin he couldn't suppress. He could have asked for nothing better. Indeed, Master Smith, I will. The gloom of the forge seemed to hang more heavily around him after that, and with it the note of tension in the air. For a while he prowled around the anvil, nervously selecting hammers and shaping tools, and laying them out within easy reach, pinning endless sheets of notes to every surface he could easily see. But at last he took up the rod that was the sword's spine, and the others that were its body, and sang long, slow words over them as he bound them tight in metal bands and thrust them into the fire. Now the note of the bellows changed, for moments of great heat were needed. Alb set rock to work the piston of the hand bellows, and its quick panting breath echoed his own as he grasped the rods with pincers and maneuvered them in the small circle of blue-white flame. Then he pulled them out in a flurry of cinders, struck three quick blows with the heavy hammer, and thrust them back into the fire. After a minute or two more, he repeated this, and motioned Rock to stop, letting the wheel-driven bellows take over. He sang when he could, in eerie harmony with the soft song of the charcoal, squinting at his notes and listening for the moment when the sword itself would begin to sing and spit out a few light sparks, the first sign that the steel itself was beginning to burn, which it must not do. He sang of the tree that had once grown, drinking in the wind and the light of the sun, and of how he had mastered it, cut it down, and burnt it to charcoal, because the time had come for it to give back the air and the fire. He sang of the metal that had lain deep in the veins of the earth, unshaped, unseen, till he had mastered it, dug it out and purified it, commanded it to take other shapes and forms. As they had been mastered, let wood and metal combine to teach mastery. As they had obeyed a mightier command, let them in turn enforce obedience. His words fell into time with the vast, strong breath of the bellows. That mighty ash tree, how boldly it burns, how noble the blaze it's made. To leaping sparks of light it returns, but its strength it leaves to my blade. Bellows blow, brighten its glow. And when the thin voice came from the steel, the note harmonized with the tones of his chant. That was it. He hauled the body of the sword out, the top of it an erupting fountain of yellow sparks, and struck, and struck, and struck, and struck, till the mighty anvil rang and rocked on its huge hardwood base, twisting the spitting steel this way and that across the anvil, narrowing his eyes against the exploding halos of sunbright metal. As it darkened, he brandished it at Rock, who sprang to the bellows, and he thrust it deep into the charcoal, twisting it about to clean it. Then, verse after gasped verse, he was wrenching it out again and striking it with all shapes and sizes of hammer. From time to time he would seize a page of his notes and rush into the library, wiping his hands on any rag he could find. Once or twice, unable to leave what he was doing, he would yell through the open door to Ingar, who fussed and grumbled somewhat, but was willing enough to read out or copy a particular passage or symbol for him. Most often it was to the north wall he was dispatched, to those pages of the Skolnhere book the master smith had annotated. Alv's labor was backbreaking, but as he worked through long hours of the day, his intense frown began to lighten. For all his weariness he was grinning with delight as at last he plucked the steel from the fire, braced it against the anvil, seized one of his chosen fullering tools, and with minute precision tapped it home to narrow and shape the tip. Rock expected a war-whoop of delight as Alv finally plunged the steel into the quenching trough, but when the steam cleared he was gazing at the narrow dark blade he held with only the faintest and tightest of smiles. He stroked a finger along the raised spine, feeling how smoothly it merged into the sloping surface of the blade. Is it all right? 
demanded Rock. He exchanged anxious glances with Ingar, who had heard the hiss and was peering round the library door. You haven't gone and— Oh, no, said Alv quietly. It's fine. It's perfect, in fact. All it needs is— He picked up the two remaining rods and clanked them against the thick, dull edges. These. Do you feel up to another few hours of this? Rock stared. If you do, yes. Once I've had a drink and a bite, that is. But— You mean you're going to finish? Yes, of course. But off with you quickly, if you want some food. And bring me something I can eat here. Rock scuttled off, but Ingar stayed, frowning. Wasn't the master smith going to— He's in a hurry for it, it seems, said Alv. Remember I met him on the tower this morning before he left? He told me he wanted it finished when he gets back tomorrow. So finished it will be. He held the cooling blade out at arm's length, squinting down it for tiny irregularities, and his bright eyes met Ingar's. After a moment the journeyman turned away, shaking his head in confusion. Whatever you say yourself. Well, I'm going back to my work. Oh, before you do, called Al, could you just check these characters for me? My hands are covered in soot. He reached out and plucked off two leaves of thin parchment he had tacked to a shelf. But hampered by the blade, he missed his grip. They went fluttering into the draft of the fire pit, twisted upward, and were consumed in an instant. Alv, goggle-eyed, burst out in a stream of curses that raised Ingar's dark eyebrows. My, he said mildly, in his best-bred voice, really, you must have quite shocked those cattle of yours. Well, don't take on so. If you remember the reference, you can copy them again. Before this cools, I've got to match the edges. Ingar sighed deeply. Oh, very well, if that's important. I suppose I can copy them for you. That's not really helping you. The North Wall again? The Skolnherry book? What page? Alv remembered the page that set the limits of his knowledge, saw in his mind the ugly, mocking little countenance, and beside it the Master Smith's forbidding finger resting on the long parchment marker. The marker he had that morning detached and, without opening the book enough to read, slipped in several pages further ahead. Everything beyond the Nakina character, he called, and held his breath. From the library, silence drifted like a freezing cloud. Then there was a sudden rustle of paper, exactly as in Alv's dream. He jumped violently, but then Ingar's voice called out cheerfully. Well, that's only four or five figures, before the chapter ends. And they're simple enough. Do you want the notes as well? If you would, Alv called back, trying to keep the unsteadiness out of his voice. Four or five only? Surely, then, his suspicions had borne rich fruit. All the other symbols from that chapter had ended up in the sword in one form or other, buried deep now in its twisted heart. So there was a good chance it was the remaining ones the Master Smith planned to incorporate in the edges. How logical, and how typical of him, that there should only be four or five. And on that chance Alv had taken a greater gamble, either that there was really no mysterious power shielding the books, or that Ingar would be immune because he'd been through them before in his researches, as the chalk marks proved. The Master Smith wouldn't have bothered stopping him before the crucial page, because he hadn't a quarter the skill to make use of his knowledge. A logical gamble, but a good one. If he'd won. Alv seized an oily rag and wiped down the sooty blade, staring along the thick edges for irregularities that might hamper the welding. Anything to keep busy, to think about something else. He set the thin edge rods to heat near the rim of the fire pit, fixed the blade in the leg vise on the far side of the anvil, and set to work tapping the edges into a gentle curve to match the blade. The purer steel was much harder to work, and he had only just finished the first one when Ingar tapped him on the shoulder. He laughed at Alv's convulsive start. Don't get so wrapped up in your work. You might wreck everything jumping like that. This is what you needed, isn't it? Alv swallowed and forced himself to look down at the slates clutched in Ingar's plump hand. Y yes it's everything I need. I'll have to work out a couple of my verses again, though. Well, that you can do for yourself. I'm only a channel, remember? A conduit. I contribute nothing. And may that save your soft hide for you, thought Alv. 
when the master smith finds his bluff's been called. But aloud he said, I thank you, Sir Journeyman. If I get through this— Oh, you will, you will, said Ingar patronizingly. Well, you may labor all the watches of the night, but I don't have to. I'm a tired conduit, and dry, too, with all this smoke in here. Me for a stoop of Southron wine, and then bed. Sleep well, said Alv, and was surprised to find the gratitude in his voice genuine enough. Ingar might infuriate him in any number of ways, but he was not a bad man at heart. Not his fault, perhaps, if he preferred the security of serving the master smith to striking out on his own. He'd just never had to struggle for anything. And because he'd never disobey the master smith, it hadn't occurred to him that Alv would. Well, let one person use you, and others may also. So turns the world. He perched the slates on his workbench and read through them carefully, struggling to make out Ingar's script, which disintegrated when he was hurried. And, as Alf did so, the cold certainty grew in him that these strange bastard things were the final symbols, the only ones that would have to show on the surface of the sword, inscribed around the edges, perhaps even inlaid for clearer effect, but that could wait. As long as they were there. But why was he so sure? And what on earth was the right way to arrange them? Difficult, perhaps even dangerous. Rock brought him a bowl of something hot and meaty, and he supped away at it absently while he read. The notes were tantalizing, all about the shape of the characters, hardly anything about their symbolic associations or effects. And yet as he gazed at the forbidden characters, he seemed to see them in an order, a definite grouping. He clawed at his hair. There was something he recognized, a memory he couldn't quite grasp, but felt was terribly important. A pattern, a web of symbols set in metal. In his mind he traced and retraced all the studies he could remember and found nothing like it. Such a faint memory. It seemed to date from a time before... before he'd come here? His childhood? Impossible. Where would he have seen Smithcraft then? And then memory washed over him with the clear cold thrill of the waves he'd once played in. That ancient thing. That cattle goad. The markings on it. He could see them clearly, glinting in the sunlight. Small wonder, when he'd studied them so long. Symbols of the kind he was using now. One or two among the commoner ones he had already chosen. They were, now he saw them, very like the ones he had set upon the arm ring. A memory of them, perhaps, had inspired his design. But there, above them, enclosed in a cartouche of tracery, were counterparts of the characters he was looking at now, simpler, but unmistakable. A simpler power, possibly, but the way they were arranged, the pattern. His mind seemed literally to spin. The symbols scrawled across the slates, tumbling together in a whirlpool, slotting almost of themselves into an arrangement that was intricate but logical, fluent, perfect. For half an hour or so he scrawled feverishly on his own slates, terrified that in writing down one thing he might forget another. But the pattern held with its own inner strength, and he had it all, and the song to go with it. Then he was up and running for his anvil. The bowl went clattering unnoticed across the floor. In minutes he had the second edge worked fine and tight, and he bound both to the body of the blade with wire and metal bands. Ignoring the scorching heat, he leaned out over the fire pit to choose a clear spot, and slowly and gently slid the bound pieces into it. This was the most difficult part. Ordinary pattern-welded swords were made with the edges welded to the body pieces before they were attached to the spine, but the unity that gave this sword its power had to grow from the center outward, like a leaf. And if, once welded, it broke, then like a leaf it would wither and die and all his effort go to waste. With long pincers he lifted the pieces, but swore and pushed them back down. It's got to be hotter, far hotter. Push him further in, then, gasped Rock, panting like the hand bellows he worked. Can't risk that. Too hard to control. Alf bit his lip a moment, then ran to the wheel set in the floor and forced it open a full half-turn. 
Great gusts of heat came roaring up from below, through the layers of coal and charcoal, sending a high flame up from the heart of the pit to lick at the vaulting. Alf turned to the wheel that controlled the water flow, but it would open no wider. In a burst of sheer fury, he canted the great bellows lever loose and worked it himself. Sweat poured off him. He could hear his shoulders cracking with the effort. But the air blast roared through the pit faster even than the wheel could drive it. A white glow crept outward toward the rim, sizzling and crackling, spreading around the half-buried blade. It's going, Rock! It's going! Just once more! Pump, man, pump, and sweat some of that lard off yourself. Here am I, breaking my back, and you just sit around twiddling your fingers. Rock, purple-faced and gasping, threw all his bulk onto the piston of the hand bellows. The fire blew white at its heart, and the steel sang again. Alv caught it out, swung round to the anvil, and caught up his great hammer. To Rock's dazzled eyes, he seemed to vanish in an aura of sparks each time he struck, and every blow rang as hard as the machine hammers. But louder and clearer rang his voice, though few of his words could be heard. As sundered I found you, in flickering flame, as once then I bound you, I bind you again, shape-sword in the firelight, encircle your blade with sharp steel. Almost before Rock could see again, the blade was back in the heat, and he was thrusting and heaving at the bellows once more till his mind grew cloudy. Then again a hammer rang, and the voice echoed it, but more lightly now. And from time to time there came the clang of a tool discarded. Another seized. The blade lay wedged on the anvil, its heat turning the smoky air to a rippling velvet curtain. Alv, bending over it, tapping around its rim, became a strange, hunched shadow, his voice no more than a whisper as he worked the chain of characters round the blade. Master, my hammer, this stubborn steel, teach it to know my skill's command, that in its turn shall hammer home the will behind its wielder's hand. Then it was back to the fire pit for a moment, a few strokes to flatten the tang and punch it for rivets, the glowing shape poised over the quenching trough. And then there was a loud searing hiss, like a voice that screamed. A blast of steam leaped upward and burst across the roof. Boiling droplets rained down over anvil and fire pit with a sizzle and a roar, spattering agony across sweat-ridden skin. Great gusts of steam washed through the reeking air and, murk-heavy, condensed like black rain on every metal surface. As the steam blew aside, Alv stood there with the blade in his hand, and he slapped it down on the flat of the great anvil, which tolled like an awesome bell. It is done. But it was not long before dawn, when the weary young men at last climbed up the stairs from the forge. The blade had had to be trimmed down with light hammer and file, and soaked for some hours in a bath of weak corrosive to remove surface impurities. Meanwhile, Rock and Alv labored to clean up the forge, which the master smith always insisted upon, and make it ready for his return. Alv was acutely aware of his bold disobedience, and in chilly dawn afterthought it no longer seemed such a marvelous idea. But he had done it. And there it was, and nobody the worse for it. Not even him, for the master smith might rage, but he could not deny the power of the work. When Alv took the blade out and washed it, he seemed to see a peculiar sheen, in rather than on the metal, and wondered if he saw with the eyes of a true smith. Rock could see nothing. Alv gave the blade its first edge with the grindstone and finer whetstones, then very carefully wiped the blade with a stronger corrosive and polished it away at once. The rippling weld patterns, relic of the many strands that made it, ran in strange twists and coils across the blade. He turned it one way in the lamplight, and they seemed to hold depth and perspective, like one of the strange drawings in the master smith's Southron books, but a very peculiar perspective that suggested immense distance to the eye, and sought to draw it down. It was almost like looking over a cliff. Another way, the light rippled across the patterns, and they suddenly reminded him of the folds and convolutions he had seen on a drawing of the human brain in the master smith's great anatomy text. Another way, and they were like some ancient esoteric writing, very like writing, 
He could almost read it now. Surely he could catch a word or two. Then he tilted it slightly, and the patterns became that weird suggestion of the abyss once more. At last, he wrapped it in soft leather and tucked it under his arm and beckoned Rock to follow. Breakfast? inquired the forge boy hopefully as they came out into the hall. Yes, I'm ravenous. But let's go roust Ingar out of his nice soft bed first. I want to see what he makes of this. He'll probably thump us with it. Oh, well, I'll hang on. Alf drummed merrily on the door of Ingar's room. They were not very surprised to get no answer and kicked the door wide. On your feet, journeyman, and meet your new master. But then they stopped, slightly surprised. Ingar lay peacefully in his bed, sleeping on his side much as usual. But though he was facing the door, he had not stirred at all. Alf stepped forward, grabbed him by one heavy shoulder and shook him, and then fell backward with a yell of sheer horror. With a crisp, dry rustle, exactly like the sound in Alf's dream, like the sound in the library, Ingar's body had caved inward where he lay collapsed and crumbled to a heap of dark fragments like a pile of dry leaves before an autumn wind. Rock, eyes wide, backed slowly out of the room and onto the landing till he could back no further. Alv scrambled up, half fell against the door frame and out, and stood there staring back into the room, staring, he knew now, at what he himself had done. The back of his hand was against his mouth, and he bit into it to stifle a scream. The blade dropped, dully ringing, to the floor. And the master smith stooped to pick it up. Whether he had come up or down the stairs, they could not say. He was there now, unwrapping the folds of leather, and his dark eyes flared wide in his haggard face as he saw the completed blade inside. Then he looked up at them, and quickly passed them, to what they had seen. For a minute he stood there expressionless. Then he looked down at the blade in his hand, and complete understanding dawned in his face. He threw back his head and laughed, a rich, carefree laugh, the laughter of sudden release. Then, abruptly, he rounded on them. Well, he smiled, eyes still ice-bright with mirth, so you were that determined to prove yourself and you have cost me a fine journeyman in the process, though perhaps you didn't quite believe in my sentinel. Now you do. Still, it would seem that I have another journeyman to replace him. The master smith's voice had gone vague, almost dreamy, as if he was voicing his thoughts. He raised the hiltless blade high, and Alf could not but flinch, though in truth he would have welcomed being struck down in that hour but the master smith was only examining it. Yes. Yes. And there, yes, perfect. Another journeyman, yes, and one who might well be capable enough to fill Ingar's shoes as well as his own. For boy, boy, this is craft of great power. Master's work. And then suddenly... He was himself again, and gazing at Alf with the same intent look as he had had when first they met. "'Who are you, boy?' he whispered, and his hand fell heavy on Alf's shoulder. "'Where have you sprung from? Who was your father, your mother? What strange hour, what remote place gave you birth?' The hand sprang to Alf's chin, tilted it back fiercely, so he staggered on weak legs. In that instant came a sound Alv had never heard before, echoing through the high windows of the tower, distant but deep and clear, like the ghost of a great bell tolling. The master smith's hand fell away. Alv staggered and almost toppled down the stairs, but the smith hardly noticed. Boy, this comes timely, he said softly. You have pleased me well. Forget the fool. He pays the price of his own stupidity. Later today I shall set the stamp of journeyman upon you. But for now, get you to bed and rest. And you too, Rock. Until later. He gestured with the blade, and Alf stumbled away down the stairs, hardly knowing what he was doing, but wanting to be away, to escape, to run till he could run no further. 
but as they came to his room, Rock thrust him firmly inside and thumped the door shut behind him. You! Words failed the forge boy, and he almost threw Alv flat on the bed. Alv thrust his head in his hands, unable to think, unable even to weep. The forge boy slumped into the single chair. What did he ever do to you that was worth that? I suppose if he hadn't fallen for it, you'd have tried to cousin me into it. And then Rock's voice suddenly ran down like a spinning wheel, slowing, slurring, weakening. Alv looked up, startled, and saw the forge boy swaying where he sat, eyes glazed, about to topple onto the floor. The surprise triggered something in him. He sprang forward and hissed in Rock's ear. It's a spell, an enchantment, something of his. Fight it. Rock stared up at him and mumbled something. Alv shook him, slapping him, and abruptly the forge boy was awake, eyes wide with horror. I was just falling asleep. I couldn't help myself. I was just... like something dragging me down. A spell, growled Alv. He's going out. Ah, breathed Rock, to answer whatever that bell thing was. He shook his head. He was going to kill you then, you know that? For finishing that sword, not— Alv shuddered. Yes, I wish he had. Could be you'll get your wish soon enough. Meanwhile, we'd better be hopping. We? Yes, come on. He'll stick us both, sure as sunrise, me just in case. And if he doesn't, I reckon something else might if we stay here. You saw how worried he's been these last weeks. What might that bell be about, then? So I'm off, and I don't give much for my chances alone in these mountains, so you'd better come along, you hear? I hear, mumbled Alv. If you think I'd be of any help, I'll come. In truth, as he realized afterward, Alv was no help at all, for it was Rock who had to take the lead in everything. It was Rock who listened till he heard the great door thud, softly closed. Rock who led their hesitant way downstairs, with Alv trailing behind, in every sense a shadow. Rock who collected clothes and cloaks and boots and swords, and filled wallets with food from the kitchen, with Ernan snoring peacefully in the next room. Alv went and did as he was told, without apparent sense or feeling, save once only. That was when Rock vanished down into the forge and reappeared with a bundle that rang of metal, which he thrust at Alv. Alv fell back as if it contained a poisonous serpent. It was Alv's own set of tools, which all smiths crafted for themselves early in their apprenticeship, and which held an affinity for their hands. "'Grown too dainty to carry our own, are we?' sneered Rock as he gathered up the spilled tools. "'I'll touch them no more,' Alv spat out. "'They're tainted.' Ay, well they may be, but tainted or no, they've got to earn us a living once we're out of here. We can't afford to be particular. Speaking of which, he added hopefully, you couldn't manage to open his strong room, could you? All that gold? You saw how he guards his knowledge, Alv grated. Do you imagine he would set any lesser guardian over his wealth? Pity, grunted Rock. He shouldered the tools himself, but tossed both food wallets at Alv. Ah, oh, well, he'd surely hunt us down then. You can manage the gate? So be it. Off we go. He swung the door wide, but paused and looked around. Not a bad berth if you didn't mind the swink. And Ernan. Let's hope you can earn us a better. Alv drifted out after him, unheeding. At the gate, they delayed long while Alv fumbled with the lock. His fingers seemed as numb as his heart, and grown clumsy, as if unwilling to leave the place. And in that they reflected some part of him, for here he had found his first true home, and had first been treated with any humanity, any dignity. But at the last it slipped open, and the bare valley lay ahead of them in the last light of the vanishing room. Uphill, said Rock decisively. He'll think we've taken the forest road if he cares to go after us. He looked up at the cascades of the waterfall and the stair of rocks alongside, no longer icy in the growing thaw. From the summit of the first fall a long ledge led back to the crest of the pass. Might save ourselves a step that way, allowing we don't miss a longer one, if you take my meaning. Well, are you game? It made little enough difference to Alv, and he clambered up obediently after rock. They were both climbers of experience from their excursions with the master smith, and much stronger than the run of young men their age. 
Rock's weight told against him, and he was puffing and blowing before they reached the top, but Alv hardly seemed to notice the effort. He sat patiently and waited while Rock bathed his scarlet face in the fall, yelping with the chill, and when they set off again, trailed after him as before, saying no word. They came upon thick snow as they neared the summit of the pass, for it was above the margin of the mountain snow crest at that season. Alv trudged through it unnoticing. But as they breasted the summit, he seemed suddenly stricken. He leaped at Rock, seized his arm, and threw him violently down in the snow. Gray-faced and panting, he pointed down into the pass beneath. Rock's angry outburst died on his lips. A hundred feet or so below him stood a tall boulder, just where the road, across the pass, flanked a steep drop. The moon had fallen below the mountains now, but snow glimmer and the lightning sky were enough to show him the shape that lurked in its shadow. A human shape, its face hidden from him, but not its dark robes, and he knew them at once. "'Our late beloved master,' he whispered. "'May he wait there for us till he freezes.' He made to get up, but Alf pulled him down. Not for us, or he would be waiting on the other side of the boulder. Hist! Rock's eyes widened, and he flattened himself down in the snow. Further along the slope, just below the level of the ledge, a shadowy group of figures had appeared round the side of the mountain, marching sure-footedly down the steep snowbank toward the road. Alf caught his breath. They were unmistakably the same strange shapes the master smith had dealt with before, whom he had taken for mountain spirits or something of the kind. But as they passed below him, they sounded all too solid, with a crisp crunch of boots in the snow. He heard their voices, too, speaking a tongue he did not recognize, gruff and peculiar, but not in any way sinister. There was even a brief burst of laughter, silenced by a sharp word from the head of the column. There might have been thirty or forty of them, and from the tall shafts, many of them shouldered, and the subdued metal jangle of their gear, Alv judged them to be a party of warriors. They came to the road, and their boots rattled and clattered on the ancient stones as they headed up the pass, and the first dawn glimmer filled the sky. Then Alv and Rock realized who it must be that the master smith awaited. A kind of sick apprehension grew on Alv as he saw the master smith step out from behind the rock into their path, though they were still some hundred paces away. He spoke, and then the leader of the column. Quiet voices, but angry words. That was clear. Then Alv saw the master smith snatch something from his shoulder and cast aside its wrapping, and the ice glow gleamed on the strange blade he himself had completed only five or six hours since. For an instant, Alv's mind writhed in torments as twisted as the substance of the sword. His skills, his learning, his very life he owed to the man who waited below, though he had long since lost any illusions about why they were given. He had seemed useful, that was all. But whatever his motives, it was the master smith who had first treated him with any human decency. A metal once alloyed is not so easily made pure. A great debt there remained. And these night shapes, what did he owe them? They were many against one, and well armed, against an untried weapon of a different kind. But something deeper in him, some clearer sight, saw differently. Everything about this smith seemed colored with a treachery blacker than the shadow he lurked in, a menace darker by far than the bluff and open manner of the warriors. Rightly or wrongly, Alv could bear it no longer. Before Rock could catch him, he sprang up, cupped his hands, and yelled. His voice rang between the mountainsides. No! Get you back! Get away! The blade has a power! The little knot of figures scattered in the instant the blade was leveled at them, bounding up the mountainside with the speed of squirrels. Only the leader and three or four others failed to run in time, or perhaps stood their ground regardless. Nothing visible happened, but something seemed to pass across them with the force of a blow. They crumpled before it, staggered, and howled as if in agony or madness. The leader tottered to one side, clutching at his head, and stepped straight out over the side of the road. Another ran wildly in a circle, slipped and went skidding out after him. The others tumbled, threshing into the snow, heaved, and lay still, 
and in the next second the blade swung up toward Alv and Rock. Panic descended on them both like a cloud, and they turned and fled wildly up the mountainside. They ran and ran, slithering and tumbling in the snow, barging blindly into rocks and into each other, hardly seeing. It was accident only, perhaps, that they ran in the same direction and passed behind a tall outcrop of the cliff into deep shadow. Without warning, hard hands grabbed them and forced them struggling to the ground. With all their strength they could not break free, nor could they reach their swords. A lantern flickered, and a burst of yellow light shone in their eyes. Alv stared at the ring of faces that bent over his. Strange faces, all with the same cast, broad and coarse-featured with heavy brows. Some were grim and gnarly, some round and wrinkled like a winter apple. And one alone was smooth-skinned, snub-nosed, a girl's face, grinning. Then the light vanished, and the strong hands scooped them up in the air, bouncing them along to the crash and crunch of boots in snow. Alv, too confused to struggle, felt the icy air flow past him at an incredible rate, and realized he was being carried up the slope toward the mountain crest. But all of a sudden the air became warmer, and the echo louder, and the shadow around him as deep as midnight. For what seemed like hours he was bumped and bounced along, and the only recognizable thing he heard over the grind of boots was an occasional strangled protest from rock. Then, equally abruptly, he was pitched forward on his face. Something hard struck him in the small of his back as he tried to get up, and then the mountain seemed to collapse onto his legs. But as it struggled away, he realized it was rock. He sat up, and the light flicked on again in front of him. There was the girl's face, grinning impishly, and a hand waving. With a final roguish waggle of her eyebrows, she receded into shadow, and the light went out. From some distance away they heard, or more truly felt, a soft, heavy impact, and then nothing. Alv could do nothing but sit there and stare stupidly into the darkness. It had all happened too quickly. After a moment he felt the wind on his face and realized he was out of doors. Still, or again. But it had been on the edge of dawn when they seized him, and here it was dark. He turned and looked around, and saw the peak of a mountain silhouetted against grayish clouds, and others to left and right, but in front of him there were none. We're on the other side of the peaks, he said wonderingly, and further down. The sun's not reached here yet. Don't be daft! gurgled Rock, sitting up next to him. You know that'd be a long day's climb from the house, a week by the forest roads. Be still, then, said Alv softly, and see, for dawn is upon us. And before long, the clouds above were turning to white, the sky to gray, and then blue, bright blue, and in the clear air the land spread out before them. They sat at the high head of a mountain valley, on barren rock among the last thin shreds of snow. But not far below them, green growth circled a little lake, and below it another, and another, all the way down the valley like a giant's stair, until at last all they saw was a glimmer of blue water between the burgeoning trees. We're away, whispered Rock, in utter awe. We're only a morning's march from the lowlands. We've a head start. We're safe. Yes, said Alf. We're safe and he bowed his head upon his knee. Chapter 4 The Smith of the Salt Marshes So began his first great wanderings in a lifetime filled with them. Terrible enough he was to find them, for he had lived all his life enclosed in small spaces, first in Little Assenby, where he found no happiness, and then in the Master Smith's house where he believed that he had. His flight had been all in panic, driven by starkest need, thinking only of what he was escaping, the memory of what he had seen that moment in his master's eyes. He had not stopped to consider all that he was leaving behind. Only later, that night and through the harsh days that followed, did the true sense of what he had lost settle upon him, his past security, his promised future. At the first he was glad enough of his freedom, and went with a light heart for all the grief and guilt that haunted him, and the fear of pursuit. 
To avoid it, that first day, they walked down the valley to the south and out into the woodlands beyond, stopping seldom, eating as they walked, saying little. They halted at last only when darkness forced it. The moon had long since risen, but shed little light through the trees. They made camp among thorny bushes under a high cedar tree. Rock thought to build a fire, but Alv would not let him. Have it your own way, grunted Rock, cramming his mouth with dried meat. Our cloaks'll keep us warm enough, but there'd better be no hungry beasts about. Bear dogs, bears, the odd dagger tooth. Better a beast than a searching eye. And we have our swords, and the bushes are some shield. Anyway, I will sit watch for what remains of the dark. I have no taste for sleep. Better find one, then. We've a long way to go before we come among men again. Rock laughed. Makes you a real journeyman now and all. Don't mock me. Ach, I only meant you'd let yourself in for a bitch of a journey. I know what you meant. It was still a mockery. I wanted it so much, but I had to have the journeyman's stamp, and now I have not, and that, that loses me more than you know. Can't you just fake the stamp? Damn, I wish I'd thought. I'd have taken Ingar's. He won't be needing it now. Do you imagine I could ever have worn that? And no, I could not counterfeit a convincing stamp, for I do not know the mysteries that go with it. Any real journeyman could unmask me. Aye, I see. And the penalty for impersonating a guildsman. It varies, I hear. They don't always chop your hands off. No, it makes you worthless as a thrall. Well, well, we'll try something else. I'll settle for some sleep for now. Do you the same? I'll try in a while. And rock. Hmm? Thank you. Hmm? You'll have plenty of chances. Won't let it slip your mind. Good night. Alf sat awake, listening to the night sounds of the wood, the scuttle and slither of small creatures among the damp leaves, the thump and rustle of larger bodies, the eerie cries of the hunters on the ground and in the air that silenced all else and made his own breath sound deafening. In truth, sleep weighed down on him, but he was afraid of surrendering to it, of releasing the tight rein on his thoughts. Always a vengeful shadow hovered beside them, awaiting its chance, and he shrank away from confronting it. But very soon weariness overtook him, his head dropped on his chest, and he was sinking down, down into dark dreams of noise and fire and squalor, hatching a snake that turned to strike at his heart. Then he was digging frantically into a vast mound of papers, trying to find someone lost beneath, coming upon a slender arm, ringed with gold, but when he clutched at the shoulder it sank inward under his fingers like rotten wood, with a soft popping rustle. He sat up, hearing his own whimper, and found himself staring at a wide shadow with glimmering eyes and pointed, quivering ears. It tensed rigid as he snatched up his sword, whirled, and bounded away back through the bushes with the selfsame rustle. He stared around, shaken and shivering, some beast more curious than hungry. He had slept most of the dark away, and dawn was graying the sky. What would the new light bring him? Release? Hope? He grimaced. Could he face her now, even if he found her? He turned stiffly onto his side, pillowed his head on his arm, and slept on uneasily. For most of a week they walked through the woodlands, down trails made by animals, not men. Early one cold morning they came upon the makers, a great herd of vicents, feeding among the trees. Their breath steamed around their shaggy heads as they chewed cud and belched thunderously, and their deep rumbling lows echoed as they tossed their horns at the newcomers. Alv, used to the even larger white cattle, simply skirted the herd, avoiding bulls and young calves. Rock sidled nervously from tree to tree. They're not so dangerous, Alf told him. They say there are far bigger beasts than those in the great forest across the mountains. Then spare me the trip, Rock hissed, looking nervously back up the trail. You never know, Alf said dryly. If we don't find ourselves somewhere to work soon— There'll be plenty of towns needing a good smithying team like us. Stands to reason. Does it? said Alv, and strode on without waiting for an answer. 
his misgivings were to prove true. The trees grew thin and sparse, and they left the woodlands at long last, coming to many places of men under the roots of the mountains. They had little real idea of where they were, or where they were going, for the master smith had taught Alv much about what lay under the land, but little of what lay above it, and there were few maps in his library. From the sun and the look of the land, Rock reckoned that they were now almost level with Hartheby, but they avoided it for fear of the master smith's connections, and stayed among the inland villages. The first of these lay among open, wind-scoured moorland, one step from the tundra that lay ahead of the ice in the heart of the land, where there was no mountain barrier. Sheep grazed among the flinty rocks with shepherds to watch them. They were polite to the well-dressed travellers, but quick to point out that their own villages had each its proper smith, seldom a full guildsman, but adept enough for them. They could often find a bed for the night at such a smithy, but no proper berth and they had to suffer many embarrassing questions about where they came from and what they were doing. Rock represented them as followers of a master who had died suddenly before he could set Alv his prentice pieces. That won them much sympathy, but no more help, and they were obliged to move on. Journeying ever southward along the smaller roads, often no better than hill tracks, they came to towns, farming centers of a size with the one Alv had grown up in and found all of them, too, had smiths enough. These were usually older journeymen with no chance or ambition to become masters, content to work out their days with thrall assistants or locally born apprentices whom they would send to masters elsewhere to finish their training. They sought no stranger apprentices, however skilled. Masters there were in some of the towns nearest to the high roads, but chiefly less able ones such as Hervar had been. Almost every man, though, looked askance at Alv the moment he entered their door, and when in the town of Raspi one at last consented to give him a trial, a terrible thing was revealed. The master's name was Huron, a huge, jolly fellow, grown almost too fat to reach his anvil. He had a name for tolerance in the town, to the point that he had once taken a girl as apprentice, which was reckoned strange enough, though not unheard of. She had become a jeweler in a nearby market town. But he seemed wary of Alv, watched him closely throughout the work, and squinted dubiously at the knife and axe-head he had commanded. "'Fine craft enough, laddie, fine enough,' he wheezed, turning them over in his fingers. "'A trifle fancy, maybe. Truth be told, best I've seen from a yunker so long's I can recall. But he shook his head. Where's the feeling in them? Where's the virtue? These are just lumps of metal. There's never a bit of life between them. Rock gaped, and Alf sprang up from the hearthstone where he had slumped. But I did everything aright. You saw. You heard. I protested Rock, and he's made many a strong work before now. I don't doubt it, shrugged Huron uncomfortably. There's something about those tools of yours, though it's a strange thing to me. And no master in his right mind would have taught you the things you know, lest you showed more in a trace of craft in you. But look, lad, can't you see for yourself? He wheezed and rumbled over to his shelves, and pulled down a neat but unimpressive axe. Peace Maria made. I save it to show women can do well's most men at this game. Truth is, it's not that good beside yours. You've got an uncommon hand. But there, what's the virtue in that? Alv rubbed his fingers over the fine markings in the steel, traced a flicker of light that seemed to be not all reflection. To go where it's aimed, as mine was. Huron drew a line on his untidy workbench and let the axe fall lightly. It struck a hair's breadth from the line. He thrust a handle into Alv's piece and repeated the test. It fell three fingers' breadth away and skidded sideways. There you are, laddie, he muttered. And don't think I'm not sorry. Listen here, Master Huron, Rock spluttered indignantly. Almost the last thing our master said to him was that he'd made master's work. 
Huron weighed the axe head sadly. Don't doubt that either, boy. And I don't understand it any more than you. Smith don't lose the power he's born with. Can use it badly, maybe not at all, especially as he gets older. But lose it? Like a fire going out? No, never. But it makes no difference. Not a rich man, me. Not like your big town smiths. Can't afford an apprentice who's only half a smith. Can't even set you your apprentice pieces. Alf had sunk back onto the hearthstone, his face the color of the ashes that coated the earth floor. So what then must we do? Approach one of the wealthier smiths? Aye, and get a boot up the arse for your pains. They get paid to take apprentices, boy. Big sums, too, and run them like a manufactory. They'll take a talentless nothing if his folks pay well enough. There's always odd jobs for them, but not a couple of wandering tinkersmiths. Sorry, but that's how they'll see it. Huron looked at the young men, Alv with shoulders bowed by shock and despair, Rock huffing and fidgeting. If you want my advice, though, he began after a moment. Yes, Master Smith, they chorused. Well? You lads with your fair skins, you've got a southern look to you. You could do worse than head for the Southlands, not just south of here. The real rich Southlands, Great Sudany across the marshlands, Kibrahane, as they name it themselves. Not that I've ever been there, but I have met a few traders who have, and they do say that they don't believe in true smithcraft there. Mostly never heard of it, and those who have pay it no heed. Think we're a load of savages to go singing to our work. Well, I've never seen any Southern Smithcraft, to my ken, but I'd be damned surprised if you, with your touch, couldn't do a damn sight better. Teach him a thing or two. Maybe make your fortune. That's it, whooped Rock, springing into the air. That's it. Thanks, good master. Thanks a thousand times. Alv, Alv, what say you? Shall we go south and see my people's land? You know I've always wanted to. Alv looked up. He was pale of face, and there was a distant, remote look in his eyes, but he nodded willingly enough. If that's what you wish, Rock, I'll go southward with you. Good, good, wheezed Huron, obviously glad to be quit of an embarrassing situation. That's the spirit, eh? Break new ground. Yes, yes. Well, getting late in the day, eh? You can give me a hand here in the forge today, sleep in my loft tonight. Now my is not there, ha <laughs> ha, and be on your way the morrow. Give you some grub to tide you over, ha? Huh? And don't hang your head so, laddie. Sure, you'll get it all back one day. And when you do, you just come back post-haste and see old Huron, eh? And he'll have you a master yourself before you can say solder. You'll see. Now, to work. Let's get this place cleaned up a bit. They took leave of Huron the next morning. He set them on the track south with directions to where it joined the high roads, and their wallets well stuffed with provisions for a week or more. Not slow to take advantage of his opportunities, he had worked them almost until they dropped, but the food was fair pay for it, when he had owed them nothing. Alv had been glad of the distraction, for the pains of hard labor had helped numb him to the blunter agony of emptiness, of loss. One after another, all the things he had gained or hoped to gain had slipped from his grasp, and latest of all, it seemed, that single thing on which all his arrogance had been based, pedestal of the pillar that raised him above other men. And yet now, past the first sharp pain of discovery, free at last to brood, he found he could in some wise accept what had happened. He had misused his gift. He could use it no longer. That seemed like a natural consequence. In betraying, in wounding, was it not also his own flesh he had wasted? Rock, munching on a sausage, was full of ideas and speculations about the South, which he hardly remembered. His parents had been small traders to the Northlands. He had been orphaned when plague swept the caravan they were traveling with, and sold off as a servant by the caravan's survivors. But half of what he said seemed to pass Alv by, and finally Rock burst out, "'Aren't you excited, damn you? It was you who wanted to see the world. 
It was you who wanted a chance to make your fortune. Alf kicked at the weeds covering the gravelly face of the road. Once, yes, but that's not what I need now. What then? The moon? If I could find there what I need, maybe. What's that then? And where will you find it? Alv shrugged, and Rock raised his eyes to the sky. On the second day, they came to the high roads, and Alf, coming out of his daze, marveled at the wide expanse of metal trackway that lay across the hills like some pale gray ribbon, until it seemed to lead right up into the clouds on the horizon. But as they clambered up the bank, he saw that the road was sadly ragged and cracked, and the wheel ruts had long ago grown deep enough to churn up the bed, with no attempt made to fill them in. Here and there were potholes where the ground under the bed had subsided. Some were full of earth and grass. Fireweed and pale lilies grew in them undisturbed. Still, it was a good track for travelers on foot, and from thence their way south was swifter. But it was no easier, for though many great towns such as Saldenborg, Arleby, and Thuneborg lay alongside the roads, and there was much demand for good smithcraft in them, in these towns the guild's hand was heaviest, and Alv and Rock found themselves treated as little better than tinkersmiths. They looked like them, too, for their once respectable garb had grown ragged and rough, and only Alv's fair speech won them some consideration. Once in a while they would find some master or journeyman, less scrupulous or more needy, who would let them do petty work for a night's lodging. But more often they were driven out with a curse, or the dogs set on them. Once when this happened, Rock turned on a mocking apprentice and felled him with a blow of his ham fist, and they were hard put to escape the town watch. That night, as many others, they spent like outlaws, sleeping rough among the scrub, and stealing a fox's kill for their meal and on the next day, as ever, they turned their steps onward to the south. In truth, they had no clearer idea than that where they were going, for if they knew little of the Northlands, they knew nothing at all of the south, and there were few who could tell them what lay ahead. Not many northerners now bothered to go south, and it was still too early in the year for traders coming up from there. But they saw one thing, that the people themselves were changing, their skins were lighter, their faces longer and here and there were eyes of blue or green, all reminding them both uncomfortably of Ingar. Alf spoke less and less, and there were nights when Rock suspected he had not slept at all. The towns were growing smaller and sparser again, and the land wilder. At last, after some days walking through wholly empty country, they came to a small, poor town with a strange name, Dunmaris in which many seemed to have pale skins like theirs. Not that it made their welcome any warmer, for folk seemed deadly afraid of what came from beyond their walls, fair spoken or no. But here at last simple smithcraft was valued, for the town smiths were poor craftsmen indeed and kept no rules of guild. In return for teaching them some simple skills, the travelers could at least get food and a pallet by the hearth, and by then that seemed much to them. When they left Dunmaris, they found that they were leaving the mountains behind, the range curving away inland. As the land fell and flattened out before them, the weather grew wetter, and the woodlands lower and very thick, with a few tall firs standing out proudly over a mass of aspens, junipers, and other lesser trees. Dogwood, ferns, and sedge bloomed by the road, daisies, lilies, and columbines in its wide crevices and willows hung over the many little brooks and rivers it crossed. Mists rose swiftly and hung dank about them, and clouds of insects made the noon hours a torment. The road ahead became a long, dead, straight ribbon leading toward a horizon on which there was nothing, no rise, no fall, no wall or building, no feature taller than clumps of misshapen trees. The land became covered with tall grasses that hissed in the clammy breeze, and every so often gave way to expanses of soft green rushes. Mists and haze became more frequent, and the wind often brought them a tang of the sea Alv knew so well from his childhood. The rivers were fresh, though stained brown and sharp-tasting, but many of the stagnant pools were brackish, and the water that oozed into every footprint beyond the raised roadbed grew saltier day by day. 
They took to sleeping on the hard road by night, for nowhere else was dry enough, and there was seldom clear moonlight to walk by. They had walked through this fenland for days, and their last food was all but gone. When, as dusk was falling and the mists were rolling across the roadbed, they saw the flicker of fires ahead. Alv seemed reluctant for company, but did not refuse Rock, who went stumping ahead at a great pace. As they came nearer, they saw that the fires were dotted around a long train of wagons, forty or fifty at least, which had stopped beside an old ruined shell of a building, the first they had seen for some time. Some of the wagons were small, two-wheeled tilt-carts drawn by a single horse, others heavy four-wheelers drawn by teams of horses or oxen. A few even had trailers. Many men moved around the fires, a strong party indeed, and yet as the two travelers appeared out of the mist, shouts of alarm spread across the whole encampment, and men came charging up with swords and bows. Nor did they lower their weapons when they saw they faced but two men, young and ragged at that, and as pale-skinned as themselves. Tense questions rained at them from all sides in a tongue that they recognized but could not summon up in the stress of the moment. It seemed that any minute one of those taut bowstrings would loose. Then a tall bearded man in a fur-trimmed robe and hat shouldered his way through the crowd, waving the people aside, shouting something. Four bowmen remained with him, and one or two other men in robes with drawn swords, but the rest dispersed warily. He himself drew no weapon but stared doubtfully at these two strangers for many slow breaths before he spoke, in the northern tongue. You wear our skins, but you don't seem to know our speech. Would this, then, be yours? It is that I grew up with, Alv replied, and my companion here from his youth, though he is one of your folk, by name Rock. And you are not? Alv shrugged. I have not that honor that I know of. A foundling I raised a northerner and named Alv. That is all. Rock has forgotten most of your noble tongue in his long exile, and I know it only from books. The bearded man smiled a smile as impenetrable as a stone battlement. Well, then, my fair-tongued foundling, my name is Cathal Catean, called the Honest, a dealer in things of small account and the elected leader of this paltry troop of peddlers you see before you. Are you come to sell or buy, or how else may we oblige you? A seat by your fire on this dank night, honest sir, chimed in Rock. And perhaps a trifle of supper, as it's some hours since we dined. Nothing elaborate, you understand, for it would not agree with the digestion this late of an evening. Oh, alas, intoned Cathal, we are only poor traders with the least of victuals, sufficient only to get us across this godforsaken land without actually starving. If you were calling on us at our simple homes, why then we'd share our last crusts with you gladly. But as it is, we dare spare no morsel or crumb for the sake of the loved ones we have with us. Ah, but how remiss of us not to explain, said Rock smoothly. We are not the common beggars or riffraff as you would find in such places, but honest men of craft and lore, traveling to the Southlands in search of other honest men who will appreciate our hard-earned skills, namely, the working of metals. Cathal's eyes widened, and one of the other men, short and bald-headed, lowered his sword. Your smiths? Northern smiths? Out of the far north? Rock repeated his tale about the unfortunate death of their master, and the short man rounded on Cathal and spoke a few crisp words. Yes, I have the skill of repairing wheel and axle, said Alv, in halting Southern phrases. And of understanding our tongue, indeed, said Cathal. Can you make our carts whole? I will not say till I see them, said Alf dryly. I have my tools, but not the whole equipment of a forge. With no smithy to hand, Cathal inclined his head at the ruin beyond. This is a smithy, he said, with an air of having arranged it on the spot. Or it was. That's why we stopped here. We've been trying to get it back into order, but we know no more of the craft than any traveller picks up over the years. We have four carts crippled by this worthless road, barely dragged here in one piece, and another ten that might fail us before we even reach Dunmaris. Not that the best of their blasted smiths will avail us much. Alv smiled. 
You may find them a touch more adept since we passed. Let us see the damage, then, and the forge, and I will do what I can. Wait a minute, protested Cathal. We've not fixed a price yet. Fire, food, bed, said Alv. The rest will settle later, depending on how much is to be done. We won't haggle. You trust us? cried Cathal, as if the idea offended him. Of course, chuckled Rock. Since you're called the Honest. Oh, dear, oh, dear, breathed the traitor. What is the world coming to, to be sure? Well, come and have a squint at what's to do, and then you may share what poor scraps we have. The poor scraps turned out to be as sumptuous as anything they had tasted, and in quantities enough even for rock. Alv ate little, but the prospect of work seemed to hearten him. So, said Cathal, when they had finished, you reckon you can do it then? The most of it, said Alv. If your men can get the smithy clear and working, those ten damaged wheels only need a fastening and a new iron tire. Rock can do them for you on his own. He's a fine craftsman. Rock sat up and stared at him, startled. And those with the bent axles and spokes I can straighten and weld so they'll bear you all the leagues you'll travel this season, if you keep to the roads. But the two with broken hubs, well, I can patch them up to last thirty leagues, maybe, but no more. The trader sighed gustily. Two? Ah, oh, well, that's nothing, nothing at all. We always start with a few extra wagons for just this kind of chance. They carry the victuals we eat on the way, see? So we can just shift the loads and send the patched ones home. But we couldn't afford to lose fourteen, no. Take the cream of the profit off the trip. So it seems to me you lads are a godsend, that's it, a godsend. Finding you just where one always needs a smith, after the worst of the road. But devil a man can you bring with you these days. He swigged at his ale and gazed up at the shell of the building above. Used to be a smith there always a century or two back. A good place, you see, for all it was a bit lonely, because there was so much traffic up and down the roads at all seasons, and things always coming adrift in the wilds as is their cursed way. So there was a whole huge hostelry here on the edge of the great causeway, with a forge to serve it. Times changed, fewer came. The hostelry fell out of use but the smithy remained. It lay unused from time to time, but smiths come and keep it up for a few years. The last one, he was still alive when my father passed this way on his first trip, so he told me. Would have been, let me see, fifty, sixty years back. But he died, and nobody came to take his place. He looked keenly at his guests. Now there might be an opening for two young lads not afraid of a bit of hard work. Very glad to have a smith here again, all us honest trading men it be. Plenty of work for you there, caravans, passing back and forth all the summer. And the rest of the year nothing and nobody but the marsh spooks, grunted Rock. No thanks, worthy sir. Too empty and too lonely for us, eh, Alv? But Alv was looking up at the bare old walls and roof trees, still thick, still strong. A flicker of flame kindled within, where the old hearth must be, and one of the workers began to sing. Others took it up, a soft melancholy air, and even Cathal hummed along. They're worn, my sturdy feet, from the wandering day, from the wandering day. They're sore, my willing hands, from the hours of toil, from the hours of toil. Yet I cannot rest, now the day is done. I don't know, Alf said quietly. I don't know. It aches, does my ardent heart, till I know no more, till I know no more. What I must do, how far to go, to forget my love, to forget my love. But he said no more about it. Cathal grew sentimental with the song, snuffled into his ale, and then abruptly turned businesslike, and led them all off to supervise the fitting up of the forge. Rock bustled about, showing the workers how to fit a new leather to the corroded old bellows, but Cathal and Alv stood and looked around the ancient building. "'Good strong walls,' said the trader, slapping the stonework. "'Could make this a place to live in in a day, my boys could. Take some timber off the spare wagons. That and a few good solid strips of turf would make you a grand roof. You want food? You've got rivers full of fish.' 
birds all over the place, and all the dainties you like from your customers. And you needn't stint yourself. With never a rival within thirty leagues, south or north, you could charge what you liked. Cept to your worthy old friend Cathal, to be sure. You could make your fortune. Alv smiled but said nothing, and that night once more he lay awake. But next day he betrayed no fatigue, nor gave away anything of what was in his heart, but labored with a will. From dawn till dusk of a dank, drizzly day, he sweated over the rebuilt forge, straightening wheels and axles, banishing the deadly hair-thin cracks and distortions that could overturn a whole valuable load in the middle of a ford or a steep ascent. It was crude Cartwright's work, but all marveled at his strength and perseverance, Cathal most loudly of all. Only Rock, engaged in welding minutely measured hoops of iron and setting them over the wooden wheels, would occasionally stop and look at him with a blend of anger, confusion, and concern. But it was only late that night, when the labor was done at last, and they all retreated silently to their pallets and rugs, that Alv at last spoke. "'Rock, my friend,' he said, staring into his mug of mulled wine. "'I believe Cathal has the right of it.' Rock spluttered, but Alf held up a commanding hand. There is a place for a smith here, a useful, a, a vital place, and here I mean to remain, for a few years at least. You've not been taken in listening to that silver-tongued bastard, have you? burst out Rock. You're sick in your head, do you know that? In truth, I am sick in my head, agreed Alf bleakly, and in my heart, my hand, and all of me that can feel. I have grown crooked, and I must be set straight. And if I mistake it not, this is the place set aside for my cure, and no other. Ah, Amakak, have your sickly fancies. This place will only feed them, or cure you of them, and all else beside. You should hear some of the tales I've been hearing from the lads about these thrice-damned boglands. A brimful breeding ground for sicknesses, and worse. Every marsh fever and bog ague known to man. Here for the finding, to rot your innards and pain your bones and set your blood to boiling. And if that's not enough, they're awash with spooks and specters and night walkers and fearful things wandered down river off the ice they are. Men have lived here before, none the less, said Alv calmly. It is driest by the road, and we have seen no terrors as yet. Time enough, growled Rock. Ah, see sense, Alv. Or if not, leave the maggots in your mind and try thinking of me for a change. That you said about me last night, me being a fine craftsman, you've never thought to say a single word of that before now, because I never realized it mattered to you. Your feelings are not so easy to read. Don't ever think I don't know how much I owe you, Rock. And I am thinking of you now. If it's true what Huron said, and from these folk it seems to be, that in the South the power of true smithcraft is unknown, then to them you will be as good a smith as I. You know that's not true, Rock growled, lowering his round head. Power or no power, you've ten times my craft. You had to learn it to serve us, though we gave you little chance to use it. But in the South you can, on your own account, and need be forgehand and servant no longer. Ah, the bog's rotting your brain already. If that's so, it's true ten times over for you. Do you come to and be a master, an apprentice no longer? Sink these shadows of yours in the mud like the dung they are. What's done's done. If I blamed you, I'd never have helped you out then. Left you to our dear master's mercy, I would, and cheerfully. He was striving all he could to turn you down his path, because he needed your power. Even I could see that. And who were you to resist, the age you were? It's him I blame. What you did, you did in his shadow, that's all. Alv nodded grimly. Yes, and his shadow is with me yet. Rock, my friend, when Cathal sends his carts back south tomorrow, you should go with them. But I will not be coming with you, not yet. Then to the river with you, spat Rock, and turned his back and spoke no word more that night. He said nothing, too, when the next day dawned, bright and blustery, and made his preparations in silence. Cathal was volubly surprised at the two friends' parting, and all the more that Rock should blame him for it. 
As a kind of expiation, he presented him with a fair sum of money and a wealth of good advice and useful names to get himself started in his trade. Rock, no fool, took both, but reluctantly. At last he swung himself up on one of the carts whose driver he had already made a friend and did not look back as the carts clopped and creaked away. A few hundred paces beyond the ruined smithy, the high road left the dry land and set out across the marsh on the low, wide arches of the great causeway. In this fashion, only occasionally lighting on small islets of solid ground, the road stretched far into the misty distance. Two broad pillars, weathered into shapelessness, marked the place, and beside one of those pillars Alf was waiting. Well, said Rock coldly. No. Alv answered. But fare you well, my friend. I can never repay you for all the trouble I have given you, all the good you've done me. But I hope I may at least try, some day. He held out his hand, and Rock reached down and shook it, once. But all he said was, We won't be traveling fast. If you change your mind today, you'll catch us up easily enough. Run'll do you good. Alv chuckled and raised his hand. He made no move to follow as the cart creaked and ground out onto the road, but he stood and watched until it vanished into the sunlit haze. Behind him came the sound of laboring, as the trader's men toiled to make the shell of the old smithy habitable. The other merchants had joined with Cathal in making him all kinds of extravagant promises, not realizing that it was not profit that tempted him to remain here. Far from it. Before, if ever, his life became his own again, he had a heavy debt to repay. That day he labored on the smithy with Cathal's men, and sat late into the night under its new-made roof, talking with the merchants about the state of the world and drinking their mulled wine. It seemed that the world grew ever darker, roads longer and weather worse, customers stingier and tolls more rapacious. But under the light habitual complaints, Alv found a note of real disquiet. The Northlands were sorely changed from Cathal's youth, and he was only middle-aged now. Then the Ekwesh were only a minor menace, harrying the far north from time to time. Native corsairs and outlaws were far more to be feared, and the independent towns stood in powerful federation to protect their citizens and the trade on which they depended. Now the outer fringes of the Federation were in frightened disarray, the towns retreating behind their own walls and failing to answer the general call, and in this disarray the Ekwesh grew bolder than ever and fared further south. A dark time for honest traders indeed, sighed Cathal. True that we prosper, and yet that is in part because so many rivals have failed or no longer care to risk the long journey north. So though business is much lessened, it does not have to stretch so far, and often buyers must take what we have at our prices or go without. But that is an advantage I would gladly forego, seeing the cause. It will work ill in time. Still, there will be many caravans yet this summer, lad, and work aplenty to feed your forge, even if it must burn peats and not fine coal. You will do well enough here. And now to bed, for we must set off early to catch the best of the light. That dawn, Alv stood at his door, watching the long line of carts and wagons go trundling off up the road, the oxen stolid as ever, but the horses whinnying and frisky, as if glad to be escaping the marsh. It was a long time before they faded into the distance, and longer yet before the noise of wheels and creaking wood and the voices of men and beasts was wholly lost to the ear. But when it was, a great silence seemed to descend, as cool and gray as the sky. Alv closed his eyes and leaned against the huge heap of peat they had cut him, smelling its rich earthy scent. Around him the voices of the fens seemed to grow louder, the chatter of running water, the bubbling and gurgling from the stagnant pools, and the hoarse croaking of the things that lived in them, the thin whine of insects and distant mournful bird cries. There was little of warmth or comfort for human ears in those cold voices, but for the first time since he had fled the master smith, Alv found in them a promise, at least of peace. He felt utterly alone. After a while, 
He turned and went into the house, if house it was, for there was only one room roofed, the forge itself. It was little better than a shack, but the roof was solid and the old front door of iron-bound oak still strong. He would set more iron around its rotten edges and remake the rusted hinges till it could have defended a fort. Walls, roof, door, and a warm bed on the brick ledge by the forge. He needed no better. He busied himself arranging the great heap of provisions they had left him enough by themselves for a month or more. He had hooks and line here, too. Later he would go fishing and find dead wood to dry as kindling for the peat. He need look no further ahead than that. Let the future dispose itself as it would. But even as he thought that, the face of Kara arose before him, and for a time he felt utterly and completely bereft. So began his life in the tumble-down smithy on the salt marshes, and a lonely life it was to be. Over the remaining months of that first summer he lived by tending to the travellers who passed that way, usually in caravans, shoeing their horses, making new knives and weapons to replace those lost or broken, repairing their harness and their trade goods, their wagons and carts, and occasionally the carriage of a more important traveller. He did his work well, for it had no call for any power in it, and he could have been very well paid. But most often he took his fee in metal, the stuff of his trade, or food, of which all who journeyed through the marshlands carried a good surplus against emergencies. He supplemented what he had with catching fish and trapping birds, or shooting them when he found enough sound wood to make himself a bow and arrows. For the most part it was a meagre living, for travellers were rarer even than usual on the road that first year, and he feared the coming of winter, when none at all would pass. He knew he had to hoard his small store against it, and smoked his catches over the forge, or preserve them in salt he made from the pools. He might have fared better by taking advantage of those who needed his help most, as Cathal had suggested, but that went against his nature. So his existence was harsh, harsher even than his childhood, and he had had many years of good living since then. And the marshes themselves made it harsher still, for they were a dank and sinister place indeed. In the heat of high summer they seemed hotter than his forge fire, hazy, fly-ridden, and fetid. Strange fish stirred sluggishly in the lukewarm pools, and foul gases rose from the quaking mud. The tall grasses yellowed and wilted, and dangerous bogs took on a thin deceptive crust to tempt the unwary foot too far. The road shone mirror-like under a rippling curtain of air, and in it travellers approaching or departing seemed to appear and dissolve like visions, from and into nothing. But for all this, as summer drew into autumn and travellers became rarer still, Alf began to range further and further afield among the marshes. He seldom worried about missing a traveller, for in that flat country his sharp sight could make out anyone approaching along the hummocked crest of the road a long way off. At first he went in search of better places to fish and hunt, and these he found. But also he had not forgotten the lore of metals he had learned, and knew that strange stones of good iron could be found in such huge marshes, though none knew why or how they came there. It was in searching for these, with a crude rake he had made, that he found the place he named the Battlelands. It was a wide space of the marshes, which began some two leagues away, near the first island on the causeway. He never found where it ended, for it seemed to span the whole heart of the marsh, and surely the place was as black and hazardous a heart as that fell place would have all overgrown with thick clusters of black rushes, whose stiff spear-tipped leaves could leave deep stab wounds in leg or questing hand. Worse, the whole area was spotted with broad, shallow depressions, up to a hundred paces or so wide. These seemed to mark the path of some watercourse far below ground, for they were brimful of mud that was always liquid and sucked down what fell into it like the maw of a giant and they were not constant, but would change from week to week as if the water were seeking new courses under what had once been solid ground. Alv found them first by falling through a thin skin of rotting vegetation, and only pulled himself free with his rake. 
but when he had rested a little, he thought the pit a likely place for iron, and raked as far as he could reach. He was surprised when at the first pass the tines hooked something that could not possibly be an iron stone. But it felt hard, so he drew it in, expecting some half-decayed root or branch. So he was even more startled to see before him the blackened remains of a breastplate, with corroded rags and tags of chain mail still attached to it, and of no type or style he knew. There was enough metal left to be valuable, so he took it and thought little more of it, until some hundreds of paces further on, in more solid mud, he pulled up a clump of colorful marsh samphire to pickle, and found an arrowhead tangled among its roots, and after that the peak of an iron helmet, again of no kind he knew. He raked another pit and came up with yet more armor. But to his horror there was part of a body yet inside it, a headless trunk, withered but tanned brown and preserved by the marsh. He let it fall then, and left that place, but he soon conquered his loathing of it enough to return, for the whole land was a treasure trove of metal. Some immense battle had taken place there once, or perhaps many, and other tragedies besides, and the ceaseless ferment of the bog brought many sad remnants back to the daylight. Once he came upon a whole wagon standing proud of the mud, with rags of its hide cover clinging to the metal hoops, and tackle dangling stiffly from its front. And when he waded cautiously out to it over the half-hardened ground, he found in the mud inside those it had carried, the bodies, still recognizable, of a man, a woman, two children. Their hair gleamed golden in the slime, though their clothes had rotted to shreds. One of the man's hands yet grasped at a length of hide cord, which had surely been reins, but the other clasped at the fragments of an arrow in his chest. "'You were fleeing.' said Alv aloud to the dark dead faces. Who knows what from or why, but they shot you, man, and your cart ran off into the marsh. And they cut your team free and left your wagon and your folk to sink. He felt his eyes prickle, and with a sudden surge of revulsion he ducked down, put his back to the rotting wood, and with a single fearful heave tipped it out and over into the still liquid heart of the pit. The upturned wagon sank slowly from sight, its burden hidden beneath. "'Sleep again,' he said harshly, as the blood-red grass flowers hissed in the wind. "'Sleep and forget. There is injustice enough walks free and alive in the light of day.' As autumn drew on, and darkness closed around the day, the marsh became yet more terrible for him. Rains pounded the land, washing what had been firm paths into treacherous slideways to the dark pools. The song sparrows and mockingbirds fell silent, and the sad notes of plover and sandpiper, the harsh croaks of rails and faraway screams of seabirds echoed across the flat land. The mists came rolling in off the distant sea, till only the scant treetops could be seen like stark fingers clawing up, and in that mist the shadows grew weird and treacherous. Some seemed to walk by themselves, strange thin forms stalking beside him or behind him, whichever way he turned. At night eerie cries echoed under the black, obscuring clouds, pallid lights danced in the shadows beside the causeway, and sleet and moaning wind battered at his door like great hands knocking. He kept it well barred and seldom stirred outside. When once he did, on a night that was crisp and clear, he saw an immensely tall figure, glimmering gray in the starlight, go gliding across the frosty grasses like smoke in a breeze. He stood rock still till it had passed, then backed slowly inside, softly shut and barred the door, and sank down behind it, shaking. Not long after that, as autumn merged into a black, biting winter, he was just settling down for the night when he heard the unmistakable clop and rumble of a caravan, approaching from the north. Wearily he went to the door and watched its lanterns advancing through the mist. A small party, eight or nine wagons and a carriage. He was glad when its troubles turned out to be even smaller, a single sheared axle-pin on the lead wagon, which he was able to replace from his prepared stock, filing and beating it to a solid fit with a few minutes' labor. 
He turned to store away the fine slab of bacon and pitcher of wine that were his fee, ignoring the caravan as it rumbled off. But he glanced up at the carriage as it came toward him. At the half-open window, a slender arm rested. Its long sleeve fluttered aside, and in its shadow he glimpsed the serpentine shape of his arm ring. What that girl has, Louhi has. He stood in desperate confusion. If that was Kara, but if it was Louhi, and Louhi might well be there also, heading south. Why? He remembered what Ingar had called her. A schemer, a troublemaker, a great lady, out of the Southlands, probably. Was she returning there? As the carriage drew level with him, he craned his neck to see, and made out another indistinct shape inside. He could dimly distinguish the face of the woman at the window, wreathed in something light-hued. But whether that was blonde hair, or a white hood, he could not tell. The woman did not see him. She seemed to be looking straight ahead, toward the causeway. He had only to call out, and risk an encounter with Louhi. That might be almost as perilous as meeting the mastersmith. Doubt held him a crucial moment, and the carriage rumbled by. And as it passed, he saw the dim face turn. Whoever she was, she was glancing down at him, but without any sign of recognition. He stood, frozen realizing only then how great were the changes that wanderings and labor and hardship had wrought in him, and the shame of them rose like bile in his throat. He felt then that even if it was Kara, he dared not move or speak to acknowledge himself in the state he was. He let the carriage pull away, but as it passed her gaze seemed to linger on him, and as the carriage reached the causeway he heard the window slam down, saw the white-wreathed head half lean out, and look back. In a spasm of anguish he turned away as if uninterested, cursing himself for every kind of coward. He did not look again till the grind of the wheels had dwindled into the distance, and the caravan was fading like a dream beneath the livid face of the rising moon. Then he walked, stiff-legged, back into the mean forge, and collapsed onto his bed. That midnight Alva woke bathed in sweat, though the fire was low and racked with sudden shivers. When he tried to stand, it was as if the marsh had run under the floor and quaked. His bones ached, his teeth chattered, and before long his lungs seemed on fire. When he looked down at his hand, the firelight seemed to shine right through it, as if he was fading away. With the last of his strength he fetched in more peat. He laid food to hand, and an infusion he had made from the bark of a certain tree which he had learned was a specific against some fevers. It was this, perhaps, that brought him over the worst of his illness, but it lasted many weeks, and all but killed him. At times he lay raving beside the dying fire, seeing faces arise to haunt him in its lambent flames. The dead of Assenby came shimmering around him, with the headman and Hervar all blackened, leading them, showing off their wounds with malign pride. The family from the wagon gathered around his bed, staring at him with wide shriveled eyes. And Kara moved among them, let fall her cloak to show herself as naked and withered as they. And in the corners of the forge, now here, now there, calmly surveying it all, stood the bulky frame of Ingar. As Kara appeared, he threw back his head in a hearty laugh, and as he laughed, he slowly, very slowly, cracked, and crumbled away. Alv felt streams of white-hot silver run down his cheeks, but they were only tears. Mercifully, he grew lucid long enough to feed the fire before it died, and once to rekindle it when it had, though he was very weak and had to crawl. At times he choked down a draft of the bitter drug, and sometimes even a morsel of food when his stomach did not revolt. So he lived, and one night before the turn of the year the fever broke, though the morning found him almost too weak to move. The worst of winter was not yet upon him, and though it sorely taxed him, and he had barely enough food, by degrees his health returned. Cocooned in his blankets, he huddled in the smoky darkness while the winds howled outside and the silent snow fell and grew used to his misery, and patient under it, and awaited its ending in peace. And one morning, 
though the marshes still gleamed with ice and snow clung to the flanks of the causeway, he was able to come out into the fresh dawn air and find in it a taste and promise of spring. He breathed deeply and spread his arms wide and found room in his mind and heart for nothing but sheer delight at being alive. It was as if in those hours of illness he had at last faced what tormented him and met its agonizing price. The fever flame had burnt it out of him. He could still suffer for what he had done, feel a chill shiver of horror and regret, but it had faded now into a memory. No more. He was cured of more than his sickness. The sun arose in glory, reborn from the old year that was gone. And I also am reborn, he thought, here all alone. Am I still the boy they called Alv? Surely not. That was never his name. Better to be a nameless, lonely smith of the salt marshes, one alone, but one made whole. And then he remembered the lines from the ancient book, the words in the old tongue he had found when he made the helm, and among them the one that had two meanings. Elof, one alone. Elof, the smith. So that is my name, he thought, as if he had known it all along. Elof, who had been Alv, sat there in the sunlight for as long as it lasted, and moved little for he was in truth like a newborn infant. All his great strength had deserted him, and it was slow to return. But he was patient and ate as much as he wished of his provisions, knowing that he would soon be fit to hunt and forage again, and that before long the caravans would be rolling along the roads once more. The first of them came southward only a week or two later, and he greeted it with joy, for it was Cathal's returning having overwintered in the north. The trader was equally pleased to find him. Look at this, thirty wagons dragging out of forty-five, wheels, hubs, axles, sometimes it's only the dirt holding them together. And that's what your misbegotten bitches of northern roads are doing to an honest man's profits. Well, Alv, how fare you? Thinner, but happier, by the face on you. I've been ill, but I'm better. And by the by, my name's Elof. Aha! thundered Cathal exultantly, leering and tapping a finger to the side of his red-veined nose. So you were being close then, and not giving me your right one, and didn't I always say it, Master Urins? He nudged the small bald man violently in the ribs. Didn't I? Alv! No name for a man that, I said. Changeling, indeed. Well, far be it from me to blame a lad for being careful at first, far be it. Let's have a drink on it. Elof let him assume that was how it was, because changing Cathal's mind over anything was hard work, and he had enough of that with his carts. It took nearly four days to work all the repairs, and Cathal, in gratitude, left him so much food it almost filled the little space in the forge. And as his caravan filed away southward, with many shouted promises to return northward next spring, if they could, Elof suddenly felt he would welcome that, even with the prospect of another winter in between. For all their strangeness— for all the frost that still lingered late into the mornings, and the storms of driving sleet and rain that came rolling in from the distant sea, the marshes were becoming a home to him, almost a shelter from the bitter demands of the world. Here he need worry only about himself, and that not so much now. They were a peaceful place as spring drew nearer and even the echoes of ancient strife seemed to ring less loudly among the unheeding chatter of the birds. But later that day they rang out once again, for as he went searching the margins of the battle-lands for more iron to replenish his dwindled stock of hoop-tires and horseshoes, he came upon a whole heap of corpses thrown up by the flooding after the thaw. Most of them were fragmented past recognition, but one huge form lay whole, face down and a little apart from the rest, half out of the mud as if he were even now trying to escape. 
he seemed to be wearing black ring mail, which Elof had always found too corroded to reforge. This looked better than usual, but as Elof waited out unsteadily to examine it, he saw something gleaming in the mailed hand still clutched by the mud. Gently, he reached down and parted the stiff fingers and saw the sword hilt they grasped crumble to fragments in that instant. Below it, something black went slithering back down into the mud. He grabbed it, then yelped with surprise and pain. But he held his grip and with great difficulty managed to pull it free and wiped it clean on the grass. It was the blade the hilt had held, black like the mail, and it had cut deeply into his palms. Forgetting his pain, he whistled with admiration, holding the dark metal up to the sun and seeing drops of his blood run gleaming down the rim. And what smith of old made you, my beauty, that you've still such a cutting temper, eh? I'd have liked to meet him and tell him you're every bit as sound and as sharp as the day he made you. And find out how, he added with a deep sigh of envy. He held it by the tang, weighed it, balanced it, flexed it, and finally swept it up in a great arc, lopping the heads from the nodding grasses. And that put a thought in his mind, and he looked over to the pile of cloven corpses and nodded thoughtfully. It was hard to number them, but there might have been thirty or more. He whistled again, looked down at the dark shape, and made to turn it over and look upon the face of one who had wielded such a weapon and to such effect. But the very movement and the touch of his hand disturbed a delicate balance. With a soft whispering sound, the mail-clad figure slid back down into the mud and was instantly sucked down. Only the mailed hand stood upraised an instant, then it was gone in a swirl of bubbles. For two breaths, Elof stood there, astonished, and then he raised the dark blade to his forehead in silent salute. He took the blade home with him, and he worked long into the stormy night, crafting the best hilt he could for it. He longed to make one worthy of such a weapon, if only to be about something more demanding than cartwright's or farrier's work. But how could he, maimed in spirit as he was? He sighed, like the wind in the old stone chimney. It was not only fine materials he lacked, but the power to make anything worth while of them. So he toiled at reducing and reforging scraps of the finest steel he could scrape together, and sighed often, and not only with the weariness of the labor. But as he worked, watching the flames dance to the singing wind, he found a rhythm and a harmony that gradually became a tune he could hum, a theme as sweeping and spacious as the fens that gave it birth, noble in tone, but with a darker, sadder undertone. It seemed to reflect the origins of the sword only too well, and in the end the hilt he made pleased him. Its bold shape suited the straight sweep of the blade to perfection, and for the grip he had found a coil of silvered wire he could weave into a fine pattern. Most important of all, though, he had calculated the weight exactly against the blades. The new-made sword balanced beautifully in the hand. It was the first fair thing his hands had shaped for many a day. When he had flattened and fined the last rivets holding it to the tang, he set it on the anvil and sat for a long time gazing at it, watching the strange cloud-like patterns the firelight sent chasing across the tight coils of the grip, as if he had somehow put the wide Fenland skies into his work. Or was it only the firelight? He turned it this way and that, hunting the faintest glimmers like minnows in the pools, refusing to admit even the faintest cool chill of hope. He paid little heed to the new song of the wind, rising in a gusty urgent howl across the marsh, pressing the fire down like an unseen hand and setting the door rattling. At last, when the best of the night was past, he thought reluctantly of his bed. But even as he rose and left his anvil, the door shook violently with a sound that was not the wind, a thunderous knocking and a gruff voice shouting, Come out, come out, you smith of the salt marsh, and shoe me my horse. Day is near, and I must be on my way. For an instant, Elof stood shocked and indecisive, and all the eeriness he had seen and sensed in that place seemed to gather around him. 
But then he took hold of his courage. He had no choice. Why was he here at all, after all, if not to help somebody in trouble on such a night? But he snatched the sword up from the anvil before he strode to the door. He slid back the bar, opened it a little, and an instant later, in a sudden gust of terror, he all but slammed it shut. On the road outside, its breath steaming in the wind, stood a horse of immense size, a very war-horse, and the stately rider in its saddle matched it well, for he seemed taller than mortal men could be. He was muffled up in a dark cloak, but at his back he bore a long pointed black shield, and he was sliding a long spear back into its saddle-rest. Its butt had left its mark on the door. Then he swung himself down, and as he did so, the cloak parted. Metal rang softly, and the firelight glimmered on the black armor beneath. But even as Elof's hand tensed on the door, a hot onrush of contemptuous anger drowned his fright. What good would skulking behind a door do? Let this be the warrior from the pit himself arisen. He wasn't going to show he was even remotely afraid. He hefted his new sword and swung the door wide. And as the newcomer stepped forward, Elof saw that he wore a breastplate as brightly black as a moonlight lake, wholly unlike that strange dark ring mail. At his side swung a great broad sword in a scabbard of the same hue, and he threw back his hood to reveal a high black helm. The visor made shadowy pits of the eyes, but beneath it the pale-skinned face was imperious— a great eagle nose and a bushy gray-black beard, revealing thin, hard lips set in a strange, ironic smile. Behind him the great horse whinnied impatiently and pounded the road, and slowly Elof lowered his sword. Where to, at such an hour, and in such haste? Without lifting his visor, the tall man looked Elof up and down before he spoke, and his voice was deep and stern. This last night I was in Nordney, and before the day breaks I must be in the Southlands. A distance, all in all, of some thirty or forty leagues, at the very least. Elof stared, and barely repressed a chuckle. Well, I'd gladly believe that, if you had wings. The tall man's gaze did not falter, nor the twist of his lips, but it looked less like a smile. If the wind may, so also this horse of mine. He lifted his head and gazed around the sky. But even now the stars grow paler. So out with your shoe, Smith, and be quick about it. Elof stiffened in anger, but the madman was right. He was wasting time. The sooner he was shot of him, the better. He shrugged contemptuously, hooked the sword into his belt, and turned to the rack of horseshoes he had made, looked dubiously at the great brute outside, and set the largest to heat, working the bellows till it glowed. The tall man turned without another word and backed the horse up before the smithy door. Putting his shoulder to the great beast's rump, Elof seized its leg and bent it up against his knee. Its weight seemed immense, the play of the muscles hard and taut. A real war-horse, worthy to bear this armored giant of a man. But it submitted calmly as he checked that the old shoe had been cast cleanly, leaving no nails behind in the massive hoof and that no dirt had fouled the sight. Then he reached out for the pincers and seized the shoe out of the fire with the air rippling about it. But as he brought it to the hoof to try it, he saw with dismay that it was narrower by a third at least than the huge hoof must have. And he had no suitable metal to make more, short of melting down smaller ones. Sullenly he held it up to show the rider, who gazed down at it impassively. "'It's too small,' began Elof, but he stopped, choking with disbelief. The heated air rippling about the red-hot shoe distorted it like a deforming mirror, thicker and thinner by turns, until it almost seemed to be flexing, swelling, stretching itself out. Unable to credit what he saw, Elof brought the shoe down against the hoof. A cloud of smoke hissed upward, though the huge horse did not stir, and when the smoke cleared, Elof found himself looking at a perfectly fitted shoe. The wind howled through the open door, the forge fire juddered and shrank away, and Elof felt the hairs on his neck bristle. Without looking up, he snatched up the hammer and nails laid ready, and, doing his best to ignore the icy shivers in his back and his guts, he quickly and expertly nailed the shoe firm. 
Letting the leg fall, avoiding the stranger's eyes, he reached around for the rasp to make any trim needed, but a plate and mail gauntlet closed ice cold upon his bared arm. He had to look up and saw the stranger shake his head. The warhorse neighed and stamped like thunder, and the huge man sprang to the saddle, his sword ringing at his side. Fit for the steed of a god, and now good night to you, Master Elof. I'm no master, said Elof between his teeth, and then, because the smile grew positively malicious, and he felt he was being toyed with, he shouted above the rising wind, What did you do, damn you? The tall man laughed, like high surf breaking on gravel stone. I? Nothing. All that was done you did. But there's light in the east, and battle bids me haste. Here's your fee, Master Smith. The gauntleted hand swept out from behind the cloak, and a thick disk of silver was tossed to him. It rose and fell slowly, as if through water or oil, very slowly, but with a dizzying spin that held his gaze fixed. He reached out for it, leaped up, his fingers closed around it, and something black rushed between and snatched it. He tumbled in the mud with a jarring, derisive croak ringing in his ear. Two huge ravens stooped over him, squabbling over the coin one held in its beak. Then they wheeled up and after the horse as it sprang away and went thundering down the road toward the causeway. Elof, dizzy and lightheaded, sprang up and stormed after it, shouting he knew not what crazy insults into the teeth of the wind. But the great charger did not gallop out onto the causeway, but sprang lightly down the slope beside it and out into the marsh and Elof, mad as he was with the ravens mocking overhead, leaped after it. The strange steed sprang away, over land, over marsh, over sheets of open water, seeming to gallop effortlessly on, and Elof ran behind it. The great wind arose again behind him and seemed to bear him along in great bounds, till he hardly knew whether his feet touched ground or ran in the empty air. Ahead of him now the ravens rode it and flew faster still, but they could not catch up with the rider. A great light shone around the black helm, and the dark gray cloak streamed out behind him, flapping and spreading in the wind of his passage, until it seemed to fill the whole sky around him, and blot out all the light, until suddenly he was running in blackness, and came to a hesitant halt, swaying and panting. How long he had been running, or where to, he had no idea, though he felt only a little out of breath. Surely dawn couldn't be far off. He took a hesitant step forward, heard a slight splash, and swore as he felt chilling water running around his ankles. Then he looked up, and the blackness had turned to gray, but it was the gray of evening, not dawn. He stared wildly around him. It was the familiar fenland he saw, with wisps of mist drifting over the grasses and small birds swooping low across them, calling the rain. But it was no part of it he had ever seen before. He was alone in the midst of the marsh and the mist, with the night falling, and no idea where in all the wide leagues this smithy or the causeway might be, and no way to get back. Chapter 5 The Corsairs For a moment he believed he was back in the throes of his fever, and that this was just another trick it played on his senses. Then his numbed feet protested. It was no dream, though he might as well have wakened out of one. He stepped gratefully out of the icy rivulet he had landed in, and sat down on the bank to wring out his boots and stuff them with what dry grass he could find. They were stout ones a trader had given him, and he was glad he had been wearing them, and his cloak, when he went to the door. He was tired and cold, and hunger grew on him as he sat, a ravening hunger. He had hardly anything with him, less even than he had had when he came to the salt marshes. He was without even his valued bird bow and fishing lines. A thought struck him, and he fumbled at his belt. The sword was not there, and he panicked for a moment before he noticed it lying on the bank a little further upstream, presumably where he had first halted. That was something, anyway, the minimum to keep him warm and protect him. As he stooped to pick it up, he saw beside it a single wide hoof-print in the mud, with water still oozing into it. He sprang up and stared around, but nowhere on earth or sky was there a rider to be seen. The blood roared and rumbled in his ears. "'You bastard bitch's son,' he muttered, gripping the hilt tightly. "'What have you done to me? Where have you taken me? How?' But he left it at that. 
He did not dare voice the question of how he was going to get back. It might have no answer. First things first. He had to look around, find at least some indication of where he was. By the stars, but there would be none visible tonight, nor moon either. Somewhere behind those clouds the sun was setting. He could make a rough guess where, and mark the direction as he tramped back to his boots. They were nothing like dry, but he could not afford to be fussy. He hauled the grass out and cursed when it came out covered in fine sand. Sand? He peered at the rivulet, dug his fingers into the bed. The soft, heavy stuff poured through his fingers, and a salty, seaweedy smell rose to his nostrils. He looked up and down the winding bank. The grass here was much taller, head high in many places, and with broader leaves. In between the tall stems grew spear scales, saltworts, beech burr, bright sand verbena, all plants he remembered from his childhood but had never seen by the causeway. He swallowed, stood up, sniffed the air again, and listened. The smell was strong in the air, far stronger than the slight tang he was used to. That rumbling sound, it had not been his blood, not entirely. Somewhere, not far from here, more or less in the direction the sun had gone, surf was beating upon a beach. He swallowed again, with difficulty, for his throat was very dry. Once, when they had been talking about the Ekwesh beginning to raid inland, he had asked Cathal and his partners if the causeway was safe at such a lonely point, and Cathal had replied with a laugh, "'Surely enough, the marshes are really a river delta. They spread wider as they near the sea.' So naturally, they built the causeway high up the delta, inland, to keep it short. So you know how far your smithy is from the sea? Nigh on seventy leagues. That make you feel fine and safe? Once it had. Once. Now it crushed him. He knew now where the smithy was. He could walk there simply by keeping the sunrise ahead of him, sunset behind. But seventy leagues? When two or three was a good day's walking over marshy ground? He sat in silence and listened to the surf, and despaired. But as his hearing became more used to the rumbling sound, he began to hear other noises through it, some high-pitched sounds that might be the voices of birds, or seals, or men. He delayed only a moment before getting up and cautiously wading out through the mist that was rising and flowing like the ghost of a flood. Men meant fire, and food, and company, a chance to survive in this dreadful place. They might be hostile, of course, but he had his sword. It was a shorter walk than he expected before he found the flatness of the ground changing to grassy dunes through which the rivulets cut as their greater selves cut mountains. Through one of these deep clefts he heard the voices more clearly. The mist hung thickly now, but as he peered cautiously round the end of the dune onto the open beach, the red glow of a fire shone out through the mist like a welcoming beacon. A looming silhouette hid the actual flames, a slender neck curling upward from a dark bulk on the sand. By the look of it, the high prow of a ship. It did not seem to be of Ekwesh kind. That did not necessarily mean it was safe to approach, and he hefted the sword thoughtfully. The master smith had taught him enough sword play and other warrior arts to judge what made a good or bad weapon, but he had never used them in anger, and was not eager to. There was no cover at all here. The sand was so flat he would gain nothing even by crawling up on his belly. He would just have to walk in openly and trust to his luck. He hooked his sword onto his belt again, but as he strode briskly across the crisp, damp sand his hand hovered near the hilt. From time to time great beams of light and shadow played up across the mist curtain as unseen figures crossed and recrossed in front of the flame. But he reached the dark side of the hull without challenge and stood there a moment, resting a hand on the barnacled timbers. It came away slimy, flecked with weed fragments. As he slipped along the length of the vessel, he saw tangles of half-dry weed hung from a mass of twisted metal at the outthrust curve of the bows. Evidently, it was not long beached. He could hear voices on the far side, but no clear words. He must needs take his chance. Cautiously, he stepped round the bows, and found himself suddenly in a circle of firelight, with a host of astonished faces staring up at him. They were pale faces, mostly, but as wild and wolfish as any Ekwesh. Their eyes widened, 
and in an instant the whole crowd of them, twenty or more, were on their feet, with a hiss of weapons drawn. Elof held up his hands, then ducked violently as an axe flew past his head and boomed against the hall. Quickly he put his back to the wood and swept out his own sword as the menacing semicircle of men closed in. Stand back, he shouted. I don't mean you any— A heavy blade cut out at his head, and he met it with a two-handed parry, which tore it from its wielder's hand. His attackers fell back a pace, but a fat, fair-haired man in the middle bellowed and sprang forward, lunging at him with a halberd. As Elof jumped aside, the lunge became a sideways cut, and he had to swing round to fend it off. The halberd, dug into the hull, was hauled out and jabbed at him again. Elof flailed his sword out against it and sent the fat man stumbling back. Furious at being harried, Elof shouted and leaped forward, whipping the black blade whistling around him, and his adversaries stumbled over each other in their haste to give ground. He heard somebody shouting in the Southron tongue for spears and bows, but the fat man stood his ground. Elof had to meet him and aimed a chopping downward cut that should have made him jump. Instead, he brought up the butt of the halberd, and Elof's blade skidded, ringing down the iron rods that bound it. Immediately, the halberd seemed to spin round, and the blade scythed at his throat. Elof cut at it with desperate strength. This time the sword struck the haft squarely and sheared right through it, iron, wood, and all, leaving the fat man staring stupidly at a useless truncheon. Elof kicked the fallen blade behind him and stepped back. Maybe now they'd listen. He heard the pad of feet, an instant too late, saw his other attackers jump back, and whirled to meet the man who came running round the prow. He saw only a blurred, crouching outline, taut and compact, and a flash of red hair. Then a long sword licked out to meet his. Elof hewed at it as he would a tree, and with all his strength, and the sheer force behind the ringing collision sent the newcomer staggering back but he recovered at once by spinning on his heel, and his sword leaped at Elof from an unexpected side. Elof just managed to parry, but the other's blade seemed to turn supple as a serpent and flow around his till, with a sudden violent twist, it wrenched it right out of his grasp. Every muscle and joint in Elof's hand shrieked with the pain of near dislocation, and he stumbled back, clasping it under his other arm. His sword thudded into the sand. A heavy boot rested on it. The other men raised their weapons and rushed forward with a yell, then stopped abruptly as they came up against the flat of a blade. The newcomer was holding them back as he looked Elof up and down. Spears and bows just to deal with this? he demanded coldly in very clear southern speech. One man? The fat man glowered. If he is a man, don't look canny to me. Came at us off the marsh, he did. Can't take chances. I think we may delay butchering him long enough to ask a question or two. Well, the newcomer asked, turning to Elof again, do you understand me? Yes, I do, said Elof. He took a second to study his opponent before saying anything more. The man had attacked in a stance which made him seem small, a hard target, the ploy of a master swordsman. Now that he was standing straight, he was a full head taller than Elof, but much leaner and narrower, hard and ageless. His garb of dark green tunic and breeches, though worn and stained, seemed plainer but sounder than the other's crazy blend of rags and soiled finery. It enhanced a certain dignity in his face. He had the same cast of features as rock or cathal, but less rounded, longer and harder, with a stern straight nose and firm cheekbones and chin, the pale skin gold-tinged by the sun, his hair was a darker, somber bronze-red, his eyes blue-gray as the sea-mist and as hard to penetrate. They had a calm, assessing quality which reminded Elof disturbingly of the master smith, but seemed somehow less alarming. I meant no harm. Elof said. I was lost on the marsh, wandering. I could not survive long out there without fire and shelter. I came to ask for help. With a drawn sword? Elof bridled. Not till your friends set on me, without giving me a chance to speak. I tried to be civil, but never had the chance. I see. He raised his eyebrows at the fat man, who was aggrievedly picking up the pieces of his halberd. Well, it may be as you say, but do not blame these lads too much. 
You obviously know what manner of a place the marshlands are. Travelers are always very nervous of what might appear off them. Rightly so. How did you come to be lost in them? I dwell in them, said Elof, and there was a murmuring among the men. Some drew back, others hefted their weapons. I'm no spook, he said irritably. Over by the causeway. Then what are you messing about here for? growled the fat man. There was nothing to be gained by telling these superstitious creatures the full story. I was exploring far afield for metal and lost my way. Metal? barked the swordsman, with a look like a bird of prey stooping. Yes, said Elof calmly. Iron and old armor for my trade. I'm a smith. Among the onlookers there was a sudden stir of interest, even of relief. The fat man rounded on them, but the swordsman snapped his fingers. The causeway? That's right. I'd heard that there was a causeway smith again this last year or so. And you have a smith sinew, that's for certain. He turned to the fat man. What say you? A stroke of good fortune at last? It'd make a change. If he's what he says, if we can trust him, if he's any good, I'll meet Drank, but at least you knew where you were with him. I mean, what smith worth a damned set up there, of all places? Why don't you try me and find out? growled Elof, cold and hungry, and irritated beyond measure. An admirable suggestion, smith, said the swordsman. By your speech, you're a northerner. Do you know anything of ships? Elof shook his head. I've only ever been on one, and that by no will of mine. I know nothing of their making. The swordsman sighed. Well, neither did our last smith, and you cannot be any worse than he. See, smith, we were damaged in a sea fight, barely limped back to this beach of ours, and the only smith among us dead, not in the fight, but of his drinking. Come and see. By your leave, skipper? The fat man grunted, but let them pass, and trailed along behind with the other men. The woodwork we've managed, said the swordsman, though there are precious few good trees in these parts. But there's the worst of it, there, at the keel scarf. He gestured at a point just under the outward curve of the prow, where a scarf joint, secured by heavy tree nails, joined the long single timber of the keel to the rising four-stem timber. Here were the roots of that tangle of metal, braced against both timbers. Elof, peering past the weeds, could see that the metal had once been a great harpoon head of steel, with a comb of barbs along its heavy shaft. Out thrust beyond the bows, it must turn the whole ship into a gigantic spear, but now it hung sadly askew, the barbs twisted and cracked. Our ramming skeg, said the swordsman. What you northerners would call Yarnskeka, I believe. The Iron Beard. Without it, we've no chance against bigger ships. If you can make that hole for us again, you're welcome to fire and a blanket and such food as we have. Well? Elof stepped forward to peer at the wreck, wondering furiously just who these men were. The fat man and the others could easily be corsairs, but this big swordsman spoke like something better than a brigand, or at least more intelligently. Elof had more sense, though, than to ask outright, at least for now. He bent all his attention to the broken skeg, running his fingers over the twisted metal. It had been solid and sound once, but there must have been one impact too many. Suddenly he straightened up and swore. This was damaged before, wasn't it? The swordsman looked tellingly at the fat skipper, who ducked his head unwillingly. I twere so, a few months gone. Almy fixed it good enough. He did not. Look here, and here, at the barb. These are cracks. But there's rust inside them, and some other filth. He must just have covered them over, so no wonder they've failed you now. And here he's just soldered the break, where it should have been forged fast again. Typical murmured the swordsman. Well, Smith, it speaks well for you that you're so keen of eye. But can it be remade now? Oh, easily enough, began Elof casually, and then faltered. An awful ache of loss and helplessness settled on him so strongly it must have showed. The captain's face hardened, and he looked significantly at his men, but Elof caught his breath. If I had my tools here, that is. 
Naturally enough, I wasn't carrying them when I got lost. Naturally enough, said the swordsman unconcernedly. Down by the fire, there you'll find Almis. I was about to try to use them in default of all else. But I know of this art only from books. I would not set myself against any smith, and least of all a northerner. Will they do? Elof handled them distastefully. They're poor things for the most part, the only good ones among them old and worn beyond belief, and little or no feeling of power or even personality on any of them. Only now, encountering a lack of it, did he realize how strong it had been in his own and the master smith's gear. I can't imagine how your southern smiths manage without it. But the faces around him, even the darker-skinned ones, ranged from baffled to contemptuous. Even the swordsmen bore a look of tolerant amusement, as at a popular superstition. So even a Southron, with some reading, wide reading if he'd studied smithcraft, made nothing of the true craft. If only he could show them. It might be that he could. They'll do, he said. Yes, I can repair it, but I'll need a proper anvil. I'll meet a little block of metal he used, grunted the captain. Popped it on his stump, or anything Andy. That do? Very well, I expect. And a better forge. You can build one here on the beach, with stones, like this. He drew a square box fireplace on the sand. We can improvise bellows of a sort, but if the wind gets up we can pull out a few stones on the right side and channel that instead. Clever, murmured the swordsman. And how long? Elof shrugged. A day? A day and a night? Too long! barked the swordsman, with a sudden lash of anger that triggered Elof's own. That's no damned fault of mine, he snapped, standing up and glaring furiously into the lean hard face, fists clenching. Oddly enough, it was the captain who intervened. Let him alone! Almid take a week, or you or I longer if we did it at all. You want to give him a whack? Make it a fair whack! There's a good chance we can still catch him in that time. Slowly the lean man relaxed, and Elof realized that he had been tense and worried all this time. Many lines smoothed out of his brow, and suddenly he looked only a few years older than Elof, in his mid-twenties at most. So, he said, I agree. We should be grateful for what we have. To work, then, my lad. After I've eaten, by your kindness, said Elof calmly, and slept a bit. I'll need that to give you of my best. Oh, and had my sword back, if you please. I can't do much till the forge is built anyway. The captain growled his wrath, but the swordsman laughed suddenly. Very well. I will go bail for your good faith. You shall eat and rest while we labor on it. That is fair exchange for our rough handling. The sword, though— he turned and scooped it up from the sand, and hefted it admiringly. A fair blade. I confess I covet it. And I did best you of it. Elof frowned. But that only makes me understand your concern all the better. I was going to say you would have it when you were done, but you might rest ill without it. Here. He passed it over formally, heeled forward across an arm. Elof took it and bowed equally formally. You are generous, and I will honor your trust. I will do the very best I can, in the least time. The swordsman nodded. A fair-spoken smith, for your boldness. My name is Kermervan, second in command of this desperate crew, under Captain Ermahal here. May I know yours? Elof, smith of the causeway, now of no guild or master. And all the better for that, I am sure, said Kermervan lightly. Well, Elof, you'll be wanting your food and rest. Mail, do you go and find him some? The rest of you up, about, and find big stones, flat if you can, and bring them up the beach there. Later, when his stomach was full and he was winding himself in a coarse blanket by the fire, Elof thought over all that had happened. It had been a dangerous spot, that, at first. But he had been right to be bold with this Kermavan fellow, who seemed to be the real power in the crew, it had got him what he wanted. Or had it. With a slight shock he realized that the swordsman's generosity and courtesy had effectively turned the whole scene on its head, had been calculated to do so. He was now under obligation to these people instead of the other way round. 
For a moment he bridled at that, but sighed. It would only bind a man of honor, which meant that Kermavan considered him one. It was a compliment of a sort, but a mightily awkward one, when he had no idea who these cutthroats were, or what use they would make of that fearsome skeg. But he simply could not worry about all that now. His whole frame was one leaden ache of exhaustion. The soft sand drifted away from under him. To his surprise, Kermavan was waiting by the new-built forge, tapping experimentally on the little anvil erected next to it. The clear ringing knifed through Elof's head. He had slept no more than an hour or two after missing what might be one night or many. But the swordsman was eager to be about the work for which they first had to detach the tangled mess from the prow. That meant hammering parts of it away above and below to get at the big rusty bolts, and while Elof was perched on a stack of sea chests, straining at one of these, his hand barked painfully against a rod that felt like wood, not metal. Reaching down into the tangle, he found it was a heavy catapult arrow, stuck into the hull timbers, and he worked it loose with his pincers. But as he pulled it out, he let out a gasp of surprise, for he remembered those black and white fletches only too well. Kermavan looked up from the bolt he was working on and nodded. Yes, Smith, those are our enemies, and if I guess right, yours also. It is the Ekwesh we fight, and in that lies our need for haste. Between them, they manhandled the unwieldy ram up the sand to the forge. From what we hear, Kermavan panted, a strong flotilla will be sailing northward along this stretch of coast before night tomorrow, and it would burn my heart to let them pass unchallenged. Elof nodded fiercely and turned to stoke up the forge fire. Then haste you shall have, and anything else I can bring to the work. There were words he remembered, fragments of chants, snatches of verse, that had to do with the striking power of spearheads. If some of those could be adapted to the ram, if he had truly seen more than the firelight in that sword hilt, then a thought struck him, and he turned again in sharp and sudden puzzlement. You say northward? When the Ekwesh are on their way home? But why not attack when they're headed south in the first place, before they've done their pillaging? Then he saw the look on Kermavan's face. Oh, he said. I see. It is the only way they will give battle, said Kermavan, his face sullen and defensive. When there is loot to be gained, profit to be made. They are corsairs, after all, these lads. I cannot change their nature all at once. And they are few, and must lurk here in the cover of these mists, picking off a boat at a time here and there. But at least they will fight. And that's more than anyone else I could find. Elof stood there horrified, the true import of what he had heard only just coming home to him. You mean, the Ekwesh have come this far, and beyond, into the rich south itself, and nobody will resist them, not even there? Not after what happened to the first who tried. Every year they have grown bolder, working their way down the coasts of your lands and nearer to Kerbrahain, that you call Sudany till at last a sizable fleet came to harry our northern ports. The march-warden of these parts, a powerful lord and a kinglet in his own domain, he grew impatient waiting for the syndics to act. He raised his own levies against the raiders without waiting for help from the city. By weight of numbers it should have been enough to obliterate them ten times over, but the levies were cut down to a man, an utter rout and massacre, so now nobody will march against the raiders. But. But we always thought of you Southrons as so rich, so powerful, with high walls to dwell behind and armies no lord would dare challenge. I don't understand it. Kermavan shrugged. We have armies, but no fighters, captains, but no leaders. We have been at peace too long, no bad thing, save that we cannot now preserve it. The syndicacy is all the government we have now, a gaggle of fat men who cannot agree the time of day without a full session in council. The March Warden, being charged with the peace of our northern borders, he had more knowledge of war than most, but that only in skirmishes with reavers in the debatable lands, and coursers, such as, th as we. 
and the syndics squat behind the city walls and find reasons in their purses not to fight, hoping the blow will not fall in their time. He drew a deep breath. And since they cannot vent their fears on the cause of them, instead they do so upon any who... Never mind. Something must be done, however little, to convince the barbarians that they will not have the Southlands to themselves as they have had Nordany. My folk didn't just lie down before them, said Elof sharply, levering at a cracked joint with heavy pincers, surprised at how easily he could forgive the poor folk of Assenby now. They fought. Aye, said Kermavan. When they had no other choice, I would wager. So no doubt will mine when the enemy is at their gates. But by then it will be too late, because he will have dealt with the country piecemeal, as he did with yours, instead of finding it a solid bulwark against him. If they could wipe out the March Warden's troops without crippling loss to themselves, then no one region or town, not even the city itself, can stand against them alone. Elof nodded, remembering the well-fed complacency of Hartheby, while the ruins of Assenby, only a few days' sail away, were still smoking. Was Hartheby yet standing? You have the right of it. So it has been with us indeed. To his surprise, Kermavan shook his head. I blame your land much the less. It has never been united, nor had much chance to be. Its first settlers deliberately chose independence over dominion, and I shall not say they were wholly wrong. Elof looked at him, surprised. This was a man of lore, in his way, and no mere sword-swinger. You seem to know more of the histories of the North than I do. I used to think my master had led me deep into knowledge, and so he did, but along a very narrow path I now see. Tell me something of this lore as I work. As we work, said Kermervan, more cheerfully. And at first he did his best to make his boast true. In the taking apart of the damaged ram his wiry, unflagging strength was a great help, but he had scant breath left for talking. When that was achieved, though, there was little he could do save stand and watch Elof at his filing and hammering and grinding, and take a turn at the crude bellows when needed. Then he did indeed tell many tales as the night wore on, in the tongues of both south and north, in which he seemed almost equally fluent. Elof could only marvel at how little he had known both of either Nordany or Sudany, and the wider world around them. Of the land of Keris, the swordsman told, now a name of legend, no more, and of how the first coming of the ice was there foreseen, and of the many of its two kindred peoples who then ventured across the wide oceans to settle in the eastern lands of this vast country they called Brasehal, hoping that here their children would live free of its malice forever. But that was not to be said Kermervan, the dark burr of the north as deep in his voice as any native's. And when after many generations the ice made its dread way down toward them, there was division in their state. As our Southlands are today, it was centered around the great city known as Strongenburg, in your tongue, the city by the waters, heart and mind of its realm, and to which the other towns— even their first strong settlement on the eastern shore, were as mere outposts. They dearly loved that place, high and fair, mirroring the lost splendors of Keris. But many in terror of the ice now wished to abandon their lands altogether and to flee southward and westward, despite the dangers of the forests and the mountains in the heart of this land which they must either brave or skirt round but they did not know how long that would take, or even if it was possible, or whether it would lead them to habitable lands at all. In the end it came to a sundering of the kindred. Most of one chose to go, most of the other chose to stay. Those who stayed had come originally from the more northerly ranges of Caris, and perhaps yet endured the worsening cold more gladly. Their kings, though, came of both peoples blended many times over. They stayed and tried to persuade or compel as many as possible to do the same, but the others fled. He fell silent for a moment as Elof chanted a scrap of harsh verse over one of the tines of the comb, and he stood staring into the forge flames. Shining steel, spirit of falcon, spear point, mark you my word, 
as a shaft of sunlight cleaves the cloud roof, strike asunder where you are sent. Some call them brave, said Kermavan at last, to undertake so perilous a journey. Others said that by fleeing they were only serving the will of the ice, and called them cowards and fools for choosing to risk terrors unknown rather than helping preserve what they could of their own hard-won domain. Myself I do not know, but I think I would have stayed. As it befell, in the end there was much bravery on both sides, for the ones who fled came across the mountains to these warm southlands only after many trials, and a good half of their number perished along the way. There are tales of high heroism and great sacrifice in the journey, and the forging of the new realm. But in the east also there were heroes. Then, if ever, lived Veda, and many other mighty names. They held the realm together for two generations or more, as the cold grew worse around them, and the ice, and all it brought with it, came sweeping across their northern borders. But in the end it made a great spearhead southward, and the glaciers came right up against the whole proud city by the waters, and ground it to powder beneath them. And there it lies to this day. Then those who were left abandoned, their kings in bitterness, who had persuaded them to stay, and they too fled. Some went to the lesser towns in the east, but a good number went in the wake of their brethren, west and south. Many perished. Some won through, at a cost even more appalling than their forerunners, for they were fewer and ill-prepared. That, too, was a time for heroes. But they found scant welcome in the birth pangs of the new realm of Kerbrahain, for the bitter words and names once given had not lost their force, and some, it is said, yet lived who had endured them. So against heroism must be set great cruelties, and treachery, and villainy on both sides. In the end the newcomers left their brethren, and escaped to the more northerly parts of the lands between mountains and sea, which the first come, preferring warmer climes, had not cared to settle. There, as time passed, they met and mingled with fellow refugees, brown-skinned folk from far westward across ocean and ice and that was the origin of your Northlands. The new settlers made widely scattered settlements, for the northerners had always been the outlivers of Caris and the Eastlands. But without a central city to serve, this left them poor and weak, and though the enmity between north and south long ago grew cool, and there has been trade and a measure of friendship between us for many centuries, still the cities of the north cannot combine with each other to defend themselves, let alone with us. The habit of independence is grown too strong. Elof nodded somberly, watching the two ends of a weld begin to glow in the fire. I remember my own little town. The only link with the world beyond the walls was the guilds and the traders, and the word of headmen and elders the only law. They would never dream of submitting to a greater. Yes, it was only reinforced by the brown-skinned folk, for they were fleeing the bloody rise of the Ekwesh Empire and feared nothing more than creating another. They were peaceful farmers and fishers, not used to looking much beyond soil, sea, and season, and they had paid their own toll in blood to find that peace. The settlers then were realizing how few they were against the South, which they feared, and how slow to increase. Small wonder they made these sturdy newcomers welcome. So today's northerners are a good folk, but ever an inward-looking one, and that is a perilous thing to be when the ice is shaping its malice against you. Elof put down his hammer a moment and looked at him. My master talked as you do about the ice, as if it was a live thing. Kermavan's eyes widened. But it is! He told you no more than that? He shook his head in wonder. Then it was no narrow road your master led you down, but a crooked one. Know what every child of our land learns. There is indeed a living will behind the ice, and a malign one. It, or they, for it is said, there may be more than one, hates all living things. I do not know why, but it does. Most of all it hates us, we, humans, and what little order and civilization we have won for ourselves. 
It may make use of men for a time, but it seeks to drive us back to the level of the beasts, so that it may destroy us as freely as they. Thus it especially hates we of Kerbrahain, furthest from its grasp, strongest against its purpose. The ice is its weapon, slow but inexorable in its advance. Did I not tell you how it spearheaded south to cover the great city? Nowhere else has it yet dared come so far, though it chafes ever at the mountains north of your land. That I know, said Elof quietly, as he drew the pieces from the fire and set them together with a rain of light taps. I have heard it. You have heard? Kermervan shook his head, momentarily lost for words. Then he burst out. But how did you dare go so close? The ice is not empty, but peopled with fearful creatures, fell beasts, and other terrible things that I can give no names to. That will draws them, as it draws all unhallowed things. They ride the ice as they might a ship, and fare ahead as its vanguard, spreading death and terror. They come wherever its power is strong, at times even down to the marshes here, with its meltwaters. How did you dare? Elof was silent a moment. The hammer stood poised in his hand, but did not fall. For he was thinking, remembering, as he had not for a long time, his first sight of the gleam in the sky, and the master smith telling of his pilgrimage, his new apprenticeship, his reshaping, reforging. Upon the Anvil of Ice Savagely Elof smote down upon the well, with blows so fast and heavy that the sparks went dancing and skittering across the little anvil, and the pieces of hot steel seemed to flow together as one. He looked up to see Kermavan gazing at him with keen eyes. I was astray, he said, but nothing more. Kermavan shrugged. Who in this world is truly astray, I wonder? There are other powers than those of the ice, they say. Certainly it was a timely straying that led you to us. He looked questioningly at Elof, seemed about to ask something outright. Elof hastily turned away and plunged the fastened metal into the improvised quenching trough, and was grateful for the concealing cloud of steam that arose about him. There were too many questions he did not yet wish to answer, even to himself, least of all to this strange man who had been careful to say so little of himself. And it was as if Kermervan himself sensed that, and approved, for he added, At least, timely, if I do not keep us from our work. He looked around him, at the first faint tinge of grey in the mist. Dawn approaches. How long? Seven hours, perhaps eight and another hour to refit it, I think. The mount should be reinforced. Kermervan growled. Let us hope we have that long, then. These chants of yours, these symbols you're scratching, will they really achieve anything? Elof smiled as he selected two more strips of metal and jabbed them into the fire. That's to be seen. They are not slowing my work, not by more than minutes. No, those minutes may count. He spoke harshly, in the effort to rein in his eagerness. But go ahead. You must work as you know best how. I thank you, said Elof, and meant it. Once again, a compliment, once again a burden of responsibility. This Kermavan did know how to sway people to his purposes. I think, I think they are worth trying, though they will be less effective on something not new made. You understand it is not the power of the art that I doubt. It is myself. Kermervan, suddenly nonchalant again, rubbed a thumb over his stubbled chin. Then I think you need have no fears. Elof shrugged, turning the metal in the forge. We will see in a few hours. Perhaps. And what then, Elof? You set out to fight the Ekwesh. And you? I? I turn for home. Elof plucked out the longer piece and began to straighten it. Though if you could set me ashore above or below the heart of the marshlands, it would make my path shorter and safer. He hesitated, and did not know why. Kermervan appeared not to notice. We cannot leave this area before we fight, here where there is always mist to cloak us. And we cannot return to it afterward, not for weeks. The fleet may stay and search, or leave a force to trap us. 
so we can only land you if you take ship with us, now. He leaned forward fiercely, and red forge light shone against his keen gray eyes. Why not, Elof? It'll be uneven enough as it is, fifty of us to maybe a hundred of them. Someone like you might well turn the scale. Elof snorted. I'm no warrior. No? If you're not, who is? You're strong even for a smith. And fast. You've some sword play, at least. And you hate the Ekwesh, that's clear. So, come with us. I come, grunted the captain, stumping up through the mist. Got the better of me, and there's not so many as done that, eh, Kermavan? And speaking of that, if you've a moment, perhaps you wouldn't mind fixing some bands on a new Albert shaft. Elof gave a splutter of laughter. That, at least, and ones that won't cleave so cleanly. For the rest, we'll see. Now, somebody put their back to those bellows, or we'll never have this thing straight. The sun stood past noon before he had done, and the mists had thinned to a heavy haze. A new strong mounting was prepared, and the reforged ram swiftly bolted into place. At once the captain had the corsairs scurrying about to raise the mast and reload their gear, but Kermervan seemed unable to tear himself away from the weapon, running fascinated fingers over the dark, menacing gleam of the metal. I take back my words, he said with soft exultation. You have made this a finer thing than ever it was, stronger, sharper. There is a faint, strange shimmer on it. Sprawled, exhausted on the warm sand, Elof took a moment to understand what he was hearing. Then abruptly he rolled over and scrambled up, eager to look but hardly daring. What was the swordsman seeing? Could it be that he also had a touch of the art in his blood? Like fish darting in a pool, added Kermavan, entranced. As if sunlight truly were forged into it as they tell of the Durger smiths of old. Ah, I waste time. But now we've a real chance. He turned away to call for ropes and rollers to be readied. Gingerly, Elof reached out and touched the warm metal, peered at it, into it. Under the greenish sheen of the steel, a light coursed indeed, now strong, now pale, pulsing like blood in veins. The work, crude as it was, had come alive under his hands. On impulse he plucked his sword up from where it lay by his cloak and jerkin on the sand, and gazed hard at the hilt he had made. Clouds gleamed back at him, though the sky above was clear, glancing and shifting in the mesh, vagrant as thoughts. The realization, the honing of hopes he had deliberately dulled, was almost painful, like stirring a limb long unused. But there was no escaping it and pleasure in the very pain. He should have suspected as much the moment he touched the clumsy old hammers and pincers, felt the emptiness in them. He had not even noticed it in his work for Huron. It took power to perceive power, and the lack of it. With a surging yell of sheer joy, he hurled the sword wheeling into the air and caught it, closing his fingers round the cool glitter of the hilt, clutching it to him. What it might be he could not guess, but a virtue dwelt in that hilt. His art was his again, and his long healing complete. A martial sight you are, of a sudden, laughed Kermervan, striding up the beach. Well, Sir Smith, are you then thinking of coming to fight alongside us, or of slinking away to rot in your smithy, assuming you ever find it again? Elof thrust the black blade vertically down into the sand to stand like some sinister outgrowth. How strange that he should have worked some quality into the hilt and not know its purpose. But then, what did he know of his own, now? Go back to the marshes, and live as before? The Fenland had seemed so right for him once, a place of hiding, not so much from the master smith as from his own self-loathing, a bitter purge needed for a mind made sick. He had found punishment in suffering, and made some restitution, perhaps. There were many travellers now safe who would not have been but for him, and in that it seemed he had also found healing. Now, for all their bleak loneliness, the Fenlands had almost become a safe haven, a retreat where he could go on living a simple, useful life, with few demands beyond staying alive, forgetting his cares and fears. But was he right to forget them, now his health and his craft had come back to him? Was it right to go on hiding? 
the world marched on and would not wait for him squatting in the rush beds. What of his vengeance on the Equesh? What of his debt to Rock? What of his pledge to Kara? And what of the grim power he had unwittingly set in the hands of a ruthless man? For a moment he felt bewildered, but a moment only. Then he nodded, at once angered and amused. Whatever strange power had brought him here, it had chosen its time with care. The Equesh were growing bolder, and he aided them who failed to resist them. Whatever good he could do in the smithy, he could do more in the world beyond. And there was so much of that to see, so much to learn, and he was yet young. He turned to Kermervan and plucked the sun-warmed blade from the sand. His path was set clear before him. All right, you Southern pirate, I'll come. But on one condition only, that when this fight's done, if I choose, I'll count myself quit. And you'll set me ashore then within easy reach of a town, and food and gear to get there. Agreed? So be it, barked Kermavan with gusto. We could clasp hands on it, but I've another idea. It's still too clear to launch. The Equesh would spot us leagues off. We must needs wait. That maddens me, so as well pass the time making you some semblance of a swordsman. Shall we cross blades on it? Kermavan's long sword hissed out gray steel glittering before eyes that matched it. Elof grinned, and the black blade gleamed in sullen magnificence. He copied the stance Kermavan had used. Fair trade, for the smithcraft I've taught you. So they swung and sparred through an hour or more of the afternoon, edge on edge chiming through the thickening haze. The loafing corsairs gathered round to watch and laugh as Elof was stung by the flat of the grey blade, or sent sprawling on his face with the surf lapping round him like an anxious dog. They had all suffered under Kermavan's instruction. But soon enough, as the mist came rolling in across the little bay, they ceased to laugh and nodded thoughtfully and laid small wagers against the coming plunder. For Elof's sheer strength told against the subtlety he lacked and the same eye and hand that placed blows so accurately on the anvil he could turn against his opponent. At length, hilts locked, they swayed eye to eye, breath hissing through dry lips. Better, Kermavan gasped. One day, a great manslayer, had you only the will. Sooner beat metal than men, wheezed Elof. The tall man laughed, and was about to answer when there came a shout from the high dunes behind the beach. Sail ho! South away! A black sail! Hands to launch! bellowed the captain, bounding to his feet. Shift your scuts to the ropes! Kermavan dropped his guard and sheathed his sword in one fluid movement and went pounding off to join the other corsairs, dragging Elof with him. A spring cable, rigged between the stern post, a solid old tree stump, and the bow capstan pulled the vessel forward on its rollers, while those crewmen not straining at the capstan bars rushed back and forth taking rollers out from under the stern and thrusting them under the advancing bows. Elof, scrambling over the stern, was amazed nobody was crushed, but it was a practiced operation, and the long, sleek hull slipped into the oily, calm waters of the bay with hardly a splash. The mist curled around her low gunnels and wreathed itself around the legs of the roller crewmen being hauled aboard, as if it wanted to hold them back. Many of the men clutched amulets or made superstitious signs. Even Kermervan rested his forehead against the mast a second, muttering low words. Elof, for his part, simply looked back at the shore, but it was already no more than a shadow in the mist, and even the marshy odor was lost in the myriad smells and stenches of the ship. From tar and damp sealskin sleeping bags to unnamed foulness in the bilges. The captain brought a heavy oilcloth bundle forward, and as he unwrapped it carefully, the bow lanterns glinted on a great beast head, carved and gilded, with staring eyes of red glass and long jaws filled with brass fangs. He reached up and fixed it into a socket atop the forestern, so it rode high over the bows, as if on an arching swan neck. Amakak! cried the crew, and cheered wildly. Elof shuddered. Why do they bear the sea devourer so gladly as an emblem? he whispered to Kermervan. What better sign for a corsair? said the swordsman darkly. A terror 
a scourge and a curse that may very well be our ensign. We are outlaws or exiles who might as easily be slain by our own folk as our enemies. He laughed bitterly. Perhaps we have made our own compact with the devourer. We send him food, or are ourselves sent down to feed him. Why should we not claim his protection? Out with your sweeps there! Fix locks! The oarsmen took their benches, and the long heavy sweeps were passed out over the gunnels and mounted on the heavy pivot pins that served as rowlocks. They were held poised a moment, as if about to row through mist rather than water, but as the captain gave the word and struck his halberd upon the deck, they dipped and strained in perfect unison, and the lean craft lifted its bows and flew forward, the dark glassy water chuckling and gurgling delightedly around the new ram. Someone began to sing softly, and after a moment the others took it up, a slow, rather sad chanty, in time with the stroke. Riding the Waters Fair is she, fair the body of Sathana Sea Maiden. Streaming her tresses, bright as sun, White her breasts, the gull's road cresting. Body so slender, pale as foam, Silken her flanks through sea-swell gliding. Kermervan's clear voice rang out over the chorus. Sathana, come to me. Leave me not drifting, sleeping so lonely, Where tideway takes me, and the cold claws tear. Aye, let em call on Sithana while they may, Grumbled the skipper to Elof. For do you know, Sir Smith, that she's the promise of drowned men? Now we'll needs thrash about till we find the bleeders, And that's chancy business in night and murk. But that's what it must be, added Kermervan calmly for we cannot match the Aquash in daylight and under sail. But they are poor navigators, and sail always by following the coasts, and in that is our hope. They must pass the delta, where there is always mist somewhere, and in that we may have them. He stared out into the thickening fog, where Elof could see nothing. An instant later, Kermervan rapped out an order, and the chant he died away. He rested an ear against the gunwale, as if listening. Passing the headland rocks by that swell, eh, skipper? The captain listened a moment and nodded. Elof felt the gentle rise and fall beneath his feet grow slower and stronger as they moved out into open sea, though there was still only the faintest breath of a breeze. Right, then, added Kermervan. Douse lanterns, muffle your rowlocks, batten down anything loose, and most of all your mouths, for I'll there be no more shouted orders. We want to hear those reaving bastards before they hear us, remember? Stick to it, then, and this voyage will see us all rich men. One subdued cheer answered him, and then a silence thicker than the fog fell about the ship. He turned to Elof. Do not think the worse of me for holding out the promise of riches. I need them myself. How so? His hard fist thumped the tiller of the steering oar. To buy and equip ships of my own. To strike before the raiding, and not have to hover like vultures over the kill. We have engaged four Equest ships so far, and taken three, and I, poor exile as I am, I have saved all my shares, little enough so far, but I was not then second in command. Tonight we may see. Hours passed, and the Corsair beat about, back and forth, searching for some trace of its foe. Kermervan and the captain plotting their position only by the changing sounds of tide and current. A rare puff of wind would thin the fog, but for the most part the sail hung empty and lifeless, bedewed with the damp, while the coursers strained at the oars and grew ever more tired and disheartened. Many said the Equesh must already have gone by them. Elof took turns rowing, then on watch, standing in the high boughs behind the hideous head, one hand tight on the forestay. He glanced down at the ram, cleaving the low swell beneath him, no longer sure he had done right to come, or whether he trusted the swordsman's words. This clammy chill fogged his feelings, forever blank, pallid, silent. Or was it? He leaned forward suddenly, holding his breath, so it would not drown the faintness of the sounds he heard, 
creaks, splashes, rumbling of water under a hull, like an echo of the sounds from the ship beneath him, but far, far away in the paleness of the dawn. Could this somehow be a trick of the mist, mirroring and dispersing sound as it did light? But he listened again, held his breath longer till he almost choked, thought he heard the laughter of harsh voices, as if the echo came now out of dark dreams of his youth. He slipped back down onto the deck and passed word aft to the captain and Kermavan. The oars were stilled, the crew rose and lined the gunwales, listening, and now the sounds grew clearer, drew even closer, till there was no mistaking them. But whither away? puzzled the captain. Ere one minute, there the next. Can't get hold of them at all. From ahead there, said Eloth. Off the port bow. No, starboard and moving up. But that drum's astern. Quiet, hissed Kermervan suddenly, and rounded on the rowers in fury. Back to your sweeps, damn you, and row. Row for your lives. Helm, do north and be ready for anything. Archers, to your posts. They're all around us. The corsair boat surged forward, a momentary breath of wind arose around it, and the mist rippled like a sail and grew briefly thin. Every man on board ducked down in that moment save Kermervan, and he stood rooted to the spot. In the faint light, long, dark shadows, half again their own length and higher in the water, went knifing through the swell on every side, not just one or two, but twenty at the least. Then the breeze slackened, and they blessed the mist as it fell again. There was no alarm, no hail of challenge, no creak of catapult winders. The watch had not noticed them. Kermervan grabbed Elof by the shoulder. Into the bows, you and Mail, and listen out well. There was one running in toward the shore. We can take him right now if we're quick. Boarding party, arm, helm. Elof scrambled back to his perch with Mail the bosun on his heels, and they hung there listening relaying whispered commands back to the helm as dark outlines loomed out of the mist around them. A faint thudding rhythm drummed through the hull under them, and the rise and fall of the oars quickened in time with it. The bows leaped and plunged, hissing through the dark smooth ocean. The corsair craft weaved on an insane race through the fleet, slipping under bows and bouncing over wash. Aft, mail, said Kermervan's voice from behind them. And to your post. We're through the thick of them now, and on his heels. Here? Ahead of them now was a deeper, slower sweep of oars, the slow rumble of a drum and harsh voices chanting. Something or somebody was not chanting but wailing, on a high-rising note of utter misery. Old memories rose bitter in Elof's throat. He turned to Kermervan. Well, where shall I? He stopped in astonishment. In the figure that stood there he saw nothing of Kermervan. A high helm of dully, gleaming metal, richly worked, reared on his head, and below it a mask visor in the form of a face, regal and proud, but with a dire rage and cruelty in its slanted eyes and flared nostrils. A shining steel collar circled the throat, and below that a casing of dark mail from head to toe, set with plates at shoulder, arm, and knee, and bound about with a great belt of leather bearing axe and long dagger. A long fur cloak hung from his shoulders. Mailed boots covered his feet, and steel gauntlets ringed with heavy faceted studs covered his hands, in which a great two-handed sword stood bare. Only mouth and chin were left clear of the metal, and the set of the thin lips accorded well with the vicious mask above. Like the statue of some war-god brought to life in that fell mist, he seemed, or some deadly machine of destruction. Even his voice was tinged with metal. They grow bold indeed, those eaters of man's flesh. They amble home, where once they would have fled. He paced forward, wrapping the cloak about him to muffle the ring of the mail. Nevertheless, they will be ready to fight quickly enough, and they have one deadly way to meet our attack. The very blades of their sweeps are set with steel edges, and kept sharp, so they can be swung along the gunwales of a foe alongside, with terrible effect. No boarding party can pass, unless a way through is cut at once, before their archers can muster. A murderous task, standing and hacking at those sweeps. For that you need a strong sword and a stern will. 
I know, for I took that post in our last attacks, and many perished because I could not lead the boarding party. Will you now take it? Elof looked at him, and after a second he nodded. Where must I stand? he asked, his voice suddenly hoarse. Kermervan led him a little way aft, to where ten crewmen were gathering, bearing all manner of blades and axes, but wearing as armor only light steel caps and studded leather jerkins, many of Equesh type, and small, round shields. He could see how many might die without a fully armed man to lead them aboard. We have armor for you, if you will. No? Then, here's your post, the hard mouth whispered. Up on the gunnels, with you, the moment we strike, and keep a hold on the forward shrouds here. Two sweeps at least we need cut away, a third if you can manage. Then follow us, or stay to fight off any who try to board us in turn. But hopefully we will keep them too busy for that little trick. So, we are ready. Hold tight now, all of you. The mask glared out into the mist, then aft to the tiller. Are we within range of her, skipper? Very well, then. Rowers, to ramming speed! The words were quiet, but there was a great shout in them. The drumming on the deck grew louder, faster, and the rowers flung themselves forward on their oars and back, gasping in great breaths as their backs strained, till the whole ship seemed to blow like one vast sea-beast. It bounded forward, the serpent head reared up at the prow in imitation of its terrible original, and the mist flew by them in shredded streamers. A mad exultation seized Elof, and though he knew the risk, he sprang up to the gunnels, wrapping an arm round the dead-eye to see his bright ramskeg go hissing across the water, like some vast arrow fired at the high inchoate wall of black and white that loomed up clearer and clearer ahead. Then the bow wave under it swelled suddenly and steepened, funneled between the two hulls. The mist exploded upward, and a giant hand plucked at his legs and lifted him off the gunnels. The deck dropped away from under him like a gallows floor. For an instant he hung from the dead-eye by one arm, frantically clutching his sword. Then the deck swooped up to meet him again with a jarring, stinging impact. He reeled, and saw a vast, flat serpent head rise and strike at him. He hewed wildly at its neck. There was a splintering of wood, and the sharp-edged sweep dropped away. He spun round on the shroud, leaned out as far as he dared, and hacked down on the next sweep. The shaft cracked and was driven downward to jam against the planks of the corsair ship, splintering there as both vessels rose in the swell. He was just swinging back to the other sweep when the shroud was plucked like a harp-string in his hand, and a figure swept past him from above, leaping into the gap he had opened, and crashing down on the rail of the Equest ship. With a cry of, Morvan Morlenhall! Kermervan swung his huge blade, and Elof saw two black-clad bodies bounce over the rail and slither down into the boiling water. Behind him grapples were flung, hooked on, and the courses went swarming across to where he cleared a space. Then the next sweep lanced violently forward, and Elof barely managed to swing his legs up under him before it crashed into the deck where they had been, planing great swaths from the planking. His boots slammed down on the haft, jamming the blade deep in the deck, and he severed the head with a blow. On the Equesh rail above came a chorus of yells and screams, and he stared up, unbelieving, as a charge of Equesh warriors washed over the boarding party and broke in eddies of disarray against Kermervan's sword. Now the masked figure was running forward, the boarders behind him in an arrowhead, and against the huge sword nothing stood, not shield or blade or the bodies of men. Kermervan cloved a clear path down the flank of the ship to the stern, out of sight. Elof saw an Equesh archer scramble up on the foredeck for a clear mark, then be pitched overboard, skewered on an arrow shot from the corsair's stern. But another arrow sang down, one of the rowers coughed and sagged over his oar, and the others ducked, still pulling away at their killing pace. Archers were gathering behind the high rail, ready to fan the corsair with arrows and cut off the borders. "'Time we was opping, Sir Smith!' bellowed the captain. He yelled something to his own archers and bounded across the gap. He barely made it, hung by his hands. Two Equesh moved to shoot, and fell with arrows in their throats as he clambered up. 
Shocked as Elof was by the bloodshed, something boiled over in him now. He scrabbled up the shroud till he was above the milling Ekwesh deck, waited a moment as the ships rose and fell, then sprang. An arrow grazed his side as he leaped. He landed, but fell askew and lost his sword. A dark-robed shape loomed up over him. He rolled aside, and a blade clove the deck by his ear. He kicked out hard. The robe collapsed like a tent, and he had his sword and stabbed down hard. The robe doubled up around it, convulsed once with a dreadful choking yell, and was still. He staggered up, staring appalled, fascinated at the gouts of scarlet on the black metal. He, he had shed it. Here was his revenge. And then an Ekwesh with a spear was running at him. He saw the spear rise and fall in remembered butchery and cut violently at it. The spear flew asunder around him. Its wielder stood an instant with a wide scarlet seam the length of his hide breastplate, then fell bubbling in a heap. Torn between horror and exultation, Elof staggered drunkenly down the pitching deck. The Ekwesh ship was being driven relentlessly away from the rest of the fleet as the Corsair roars kept up their thrust, and more and more of the Ekwesh oarsmen had to leave their oars to fight. High on the stern castle, bodies of archers strewn around him, stood Kermervan now, a terrible figure in mail that ran scarlet, raining blows on the Ekwesh who came boiling up from below decks, to be hewn down before they could even join the struggle. Others clambered up through the rowing benches, but were caught by the corsairs as they reached the main deck. The air quivered with weapons clashing, the corsairs' hoarse war cries and the jarring howls of the Ekwesh. Blood pooled on the deck, greasy and slippery underfoot, and Elof saw the headless body of a warrior go skidding right across it and tumble through a hatchway. Hysterical screaming erupted from beneath. Suddenly he was back in the ruins of Assenby, with the old headman dead at his feet, and the women howling around him, being weighed up by those terrible eyes. And then the eyes were there before him, yellow and blazing with insensate hatred. With a horror of madness, he lashed out at them, something bit burning into his shoulder. He saw a dark-robed figure go cartwheeling and spinning away down the deck, thin limbs flying in all directions, and only then knew he had struck down a real man, and no mere illusion. The sword that had grazed his shoulder clattered at his feet and went rolling after its wielder, who lay sprawled against the base of the stern castle. Elof stumbled forward and reached the stern castle just as Kermavan came clattering down the ladders, brandishing his sword, broken halfway down the blade, and hailed him. That's that! She's ours! Elof moved past him and turned over the figure of the man he had struck. The eyes glared back at him wide open and alive for all the great cut that had disabled his leg. "'A chieftain by his robe,' said Kermavan, lifting it casually on his broken sword-point. Something clattered at the man's belt, long as a dagger, and Elof stooped swiftly to snatch it away. But as the cold thing touched his fingers, he stared in utter amazement. A crook-headed shaft of bronze metal it was, a broad ring hooked through its lower end, the strange rich patterns and characters on it half-worn to glossy smoothness by the passage of many hands, many years. He knew it so well, yet saw it now with altered eyes. He clutched it tight, that well-remembered thing, and the wash of cold yellow flame within seemed to shine between his fingers, to tingle against them, so strong was it. Had the old Ekwesh also perceived something, and kept it for that, as something numinous? This, gasped Elof, it came from my town. He was the animal who sacked it. And many others, no doubt. We'll bind this carrion and take him aboard alive, lads. I would have words with him, and we have no time now. All hands to unloading, roared the captain. Move your scuts! Do you want another shipload of these here savages about our ears? Strip this rat pit from stem to stern. The corsairs scuttled this way and that, picking up discarded weapons and armor, stripping the dead of ornaments and prizing up the grills that covered the hold hatchways. Kermervan took no part in this, but went slowly to the rail, leaned on it, and fumbled to unfasten his helm with blood-greased fingers. Elof hooking the goad to his belt, undid the fastening for him, and Kermervan sighed gratefully as he slid the mask off. 
it had left a deep bruised score in his face. Caris, that was sickening, he said, licking dry lips. You looked to be enjoying yourself, muttered Elof, trying with trembling fingers to scrape the blood off his own sword. So might you in the exercise of your craft and mystery, said Kermerban thinly, forgetting for a moment where the sword you make may find a sheath. I am no berserk. I am glad to have returned these beast folk their own physic in full measure. Good weight. Yes. But joy in it as they do, no. This is a larger ship than ever we have taken before, and more heavily crewed. By hell, what's that? There was a sudden outbreak of noise from below decks, where most of the corsairs were foraging, and Elof remembered the screams he had heard. But before either of them could reach the main hatch, there was a trampling of feet, and a horde of women spilled on deck. Fair-skinned women, evidently Southrons, with one or two children clutched among them. At the sight of Kermervan in his gory armor, they stopped short, almost toppling last comers, back into the hold, shrieked again, and huddled together. He looked almost as confused, gestured helplessly, and began trying to explain to them that they were safe and would be taken back home. It was his red hair and clear voice that calmed them, more than anything he said, and the firm way he ordered the corsairs to look after them. They seemed almost as frightened of the corsairs as of the Equesh. At last all twenty-two women were lowered one by one into the corsair ship, some shrieking and struggling in the rope harness. They were simple folk from farming villages, and most had never been in a boat before the raiders had seized them. Great bales of plunder were lowered after them, and last of all the old chieftain. Some of the bolder women mobbed him as he was bundled down, clawing, kicking, and spitting. Then Kermervan swung himself down into the corsair's bows. Two crewmen brought spear shafts forward. With them and Elof, he levered the ram free of the shattered timbers, and the two ships bobbed apart. So easily freed, he marveled. But it bit deep as a dagger tooth, and not a mark on it, not a tine bent out of place. Smith, may I never mock your mumblings again. But Elof was looking up at the Equesh deck, where a dull red glow was rising. The captain bellowed at the rowers, and they pulled away, but before they had gone two strokes distance, flames crackled into the Equesh rigging, burned around the mast, and licked at the furled sail. They pulled harder for all their weariness, afraid of sparks in their own tarry rigging, and as the hulk retreated in the mist, they saw the bindings flare and the high sail come crashing down, to vanish in an instant in a sheet of fire. I hope the devourer likes his meat cooked, said Kermervan dryly. I found fire burning in some kind of shrine upon the stern castle, carefully enclosed in metal and brick. What smoked there as an offering I will leave unsaid. I kicked it over. Now let them search. But you want other ships, said Elof. If you capture these, I cannot use them, and nobody would buy such things. I might infiltrate a fleet more easily. But after the fighting, I need smaller, faster craft like this. Ten, fifteen oars aside, not thirty. Craft that can outrun the Equesh for short stretches, as we must do now, yet carry goods and men enough. He grimaced. And women. I foresee trouble before all's done. But despite his misgivings, the women seemed to settle down well enough, more so perhaps because they had no homes to go back to. The corsairs, too, were quiet, for they had the exhaustion of battle and of rowing to keep them so. But great stores of supplies had been captured from the Equesh, and they were promising themselves a feast ashore. Six had been slain, another two had wounds they would die of, but the rest were luxuriating in the sheer joy of being yet alive. Kermavan and Elof and the skipper took their turns at the oars with the rest, and they kept up a fair speed. They had to row for some hours through the mists, but at last these thinned and blew away, and they were able to hoist sail and make northward for another of their secret landings, a small hidden cove among the tall cliffs of a bay, invisible from seaward. Then Kermervan called Crewman to take his oar and Elof's, and went aft to where the Equesh chief lay bound, guarded from the women's spite by a corsair, too wounded to row. One woman plucked at Kermervan's sleeve as he passed. "'Sir, let us at him, please. He—' 
she choked. There was all our menfolk, even the little ones. Took us off a ship with our daughters, mine only ten. And then that one, he, he came, and he took... Kermavan looked at Elof. There was no girl of that age among the women. Had been none anywhere on the ship. Gently, he detached the sobbing woman's hand. He lives only to tell what he knows. You have looked on horror enough. I am sorry. I will see justice done for you, as befits my station. I, or you, he added to Elof as they waved away the guard. For you have a score also to settle with this creature. Elof shook his head. You may have the high justice. I do not. And, whatever else, I see a sick old man. He stooped over him to loosen his bonds, and was spat at for his pains. You! You I remember now! He spoke the Southron tongue quite clearly, as if he had been taught. Many years, but I forget not. Brat, the great shaman, took! He leered horribly, and his breath wheezed in his throat. Should have slain you then, eaten your liver, and him also. May he rot! For he has brought me to this, me and my clan. What? said Kermavan in grim perplexity. Just by sparing this one's life? No, fool! gasped the old man. He seemed to seethe with his grievance, and be only too willing to spit the venom of it at any who would listen. Great warrior, even you will learn. Face him and learn. I am no fool. Would not have come south so far so soon, but at his behest. Foolish counsel, while so much fat on bones of Northland. Too far, too soon, too little force. Then why did you obey this man's behest? asked Kermavan quietly, kneeling down beside him. Is he of a powerful clan? Clans? The laugh was like nails scratched on slate. He destroys clans, lowers chieftains, brings old ways of Akaiyawasa down. Would have us unite with otter, eagle, frog, our old foes to crush by the force of many, like the ice. Some will do it. I say never. Many I speak for. Till he wields his power, and then all is night, the heads bow before him. Fear none dare resist. Blade that never strikes a blow. My curse upon it, and the curses of all the ancestors of my clan upon him, upon you, filth that you are, dung of the dog, beach carrion, couplers with animals. Meyesa, Seka, he. The chieftain's voice cackled and crowed away into mumblings in his own tongue. Where was your fleet headed next? demanded Kermervan. Straight for home? But the chief refused to speak any but his own tongue, even with Kermavan's sword at his throat, though he still stared around at them all with quick turns of the head and fierce yellow eyes, exactly like an ancient buzzard. He had had his say, and turned stubborn and silent the moment he was asked a question. "'Pain will not move this one,' said Kermavan at last. "'Better make an end of it now. Elof, you have no more to ask of this old serpent?' Elof, Elof heard him, but he had sunk down in a heap on the deck. "'What's the matter with you?' barked Kermervan. "'You heard him,' whispered Elof, clutching handfuls of empty air. "'The man, the great shaman, fear none dare resist, blade that never strikes a blow. Kermervan, he was my master, and it was I made that blade.' The old chieftain heard and understood, for his cackling laughter rang high in the air. Then may your own work skewer you. May the breasts of your daughters fill our cooking pots. But Kermervan was not a man to be trifled with. In a fury of loathing he spun round, and Elof heard the whistle and thud of the sword blade as it struck once, twice, again, and the laughter shrieked away into a whistling, gurgling scream, and was still. The women heard also, and raised a great clamoring cheer, and one voice shouted, He didn't die easy! Throw that offal over the rail, barked Kermervan, and he stooped to Elof and raised him up. 
I do not understand all I heard, but obviously you do. You will tell me more later, when we can be apart. But I say this for now, I see no great evil in you. If something you have made finds an ill purpose, well, who better to unmake it? Think on that. It was two evenings after the attack that they wearily turned their bows in between the high cliffs of the northern cove, hauled its bows high onto the silvery sand, and sank down in utter relief. They built a great fire then, for the cliffs would hide the smoke, and the weary corsair crew slept while the women cooked food and mulled wine from the barrels the Equesh had taken. Then all ate and drank, the women with them, and their mood grew riotous. Elof, who would have sat apart, they embraced as a brother and plied him with wine, praising his courage in great strokes that had cleared their way. He was the youngest of the crew and well favored, and the women also made much of him, the younger ones fluttering around his neck, or drawing him into the boisterous dancing around the fire. And he was nothing loath, for the wine had drowned his darker thoughts, and all his life he had known little of women. Kara's face danced before him a moment in the flames, but the arms round his neck he could feel. The lips against his own were warm, if not so fair. The bodies in his arms were firm, if not so slender. The fumes of the warm wine clouded his mind like breath on glass. He reeled, and two girls bore him up, one thin and red-headed, the other dark and plump, with merry eyes bright with promise. Wine held the whole camp in its grip a potent wall against the terrors of the last days, and in its turn invoked a higher defense and refuge. The corsairs knew few restraints. The women had all but lost theirs in the shock of battle and abduction. Soon bodies lay sprawled across the warm sand, writhing in a different dance, blind to all except inner need. Elof staggered and reeled between the girls, giggling and breathless with excitement. They stumbled away up the beach to a shallow little cave between the cliff roots and sank down gratefully on the dry sand of its floor. Their clothes, torn and befouled by death in many forms, fell away, leaving only living flesh and blood yet flowing, and no barrier between them. Darkness and oblivion rushed in his veins, roared in his head, till all he knew of was the warm flesh enfolding him, the soft, damp skin that trembled and fluttered against his body, the breasts pressed flat against him, or hanging like fair fruit to his hungry lips. He turned from one to another, taking and giving an animal comfort that blotted out all else. And yet as breath grew fast and shallow, as the fire roared, blazed to its height, and the hammer stroke struck searing sparks to weld the linked bodies rigid, it was Kara he saw, Kara he held. Kara was the vision in flames within, that consumed him in an instant to darkly glowing embers, and in the last to sleep. He woke before dawn, slipped out from between the girls, covering them with their clothes, and staggered down to the beach to bathe. The shock of the cold water revived him, and he came out feeling cleansed inside and out, but mortally chill and hungry. He dressed in such of his clothes as he could still bear to wear, found others among the booty and wine, bread and meat among the remains of the orgy. As he strode back along the beach he came upon Kermavan, sitting with his back to a rock and throwing pebbles out into the gray water and greeted him merrily. "'I didn't see you enjoying yourself last night.' Kermavan gazed up at Elof with bleak eyes. "'Enjoying myself? In that?' The weight of bitterness in his voice startled the smith. "'What ails the great warrior, then? Do you not like girls?' "'Of course,' said Kermavan indignantly. "'But not like that.' "'Well, how, then?' demanded Elof, more than a little nettled. At your sword's point? In a flash, Kermervan was on his feet, his pale eyes glaring down into Elof's, and his fist bunched in the smith's jerkin. I was not raised to suffer any taunt lightly. Be glad it is untrue, or I might find pleasure in proving it on your hide. Well, you scorn me freely enough. Were you raised to do that? Where's the harm in all that went on, rough-grained though it be? I saw nobody taken against their will. Kermavan subsided, muttering. 
It profanes something sacred, something vital between a man and a woman that ought to be theirs alone. Respect, regard, cherishing. Out on the sand like lust-ridden animals. But I am sorry I insulted you, Smith. It is simply that you do not understand. What makes you so sure of that? inquired Eloff dryly. I may be village-bred, but I love. I shall cherish her all my life. If I can only find her again. But she and I, we both inhabit bodies. They will have their needs. And those needs may be overwhelming, warrior, especially in the face of what we lived through yesterday. He looked at the lines on the tall man's face, the shadows under his eyes. You slept poorly last night, I would guess, if at all. But I slept, though I have seen less slaughter than you in the world. I sighed the other. I have seen too much, and I fear you and I may live to see more. Forget my harsh words if you can, for you may well be wiser than I. But tell me, you who were village-bred, you who were taken by this great shaman, what have you seen in your time? What is this thing you made, this blade? Tell me, if you will, for I fear it concerns all who oppose the Ekwesh, and perhaps also the ice. Elof studied the face before him, eager yet anxious, with the bright, direct eyes of an eagle. How much would he understand of what must be told? This man of justice, would he understand mercy? But he was right, inescapably right. Told it must be, and at whatever cost. Milio was the swordsman's first reaction. That name is of my people, but there is nothing else good of it. It was borne by nobles of the Old North, some of whom yet lived on in Brehane. But the last was exiled in my father's day, I think. A scholar, but a wicked, ambitious man who maltreated his peasants beyond bearing. Is this his son? Maybe. Or the man himself. There were treatises on the extending of life in his library. All on the forbidden wall. Kermervan's brow darkened with sudden distrust. Dark arts. I have never believed in them, not truly, but... But you have studied them. I have, said Elof steadily. Hear me out. Kermervan nodded, acknowledging that that was just. He hung on every word, choking back the hundred questions that hovered on his lips, until Elof told of the night shapes, of the bell, and the strange warrior party, whose coming it had heralded. Karis, breathed the warrior. Durger, it could only be. The cut trees also, and the mine workings. That explains much, very much. D Durger? asked Elof, puzzled. Hear him, breathed Kermervan, almost laughing. He walks among marvels and does not know them. You have never heard of the elders, the mountain folk? Why, they... But go on. Finish your story. Elof shrugged and told of the sword's power unleashed, his warning, and his strange escape. So you see, we had been carried, somehow, further and faster than a horse could have borne us, to an easy path down. Kermervan nodded. You were taken by secret ways through the mountains, not over them. Naturally, that was faster. But go on. His face was sympathetic as Elof told of their troubled wanderings, his loss and his decision to seek healing in the marshlands. Kermavan stared with greater wonder at the sword when told of its origins, but kept silent. It was only when Elof told of the strange rider that he sat up sharply, as if arrow struck. Raven! You've seen Raven. I've seen many Ravens. There were two that night. I mean the man, the— He swallowed and looked wildly around him. Your visitor, you— He shook his head violently. You don't believe me, I see, said Elof sharply. Well, I cannot prove it. But who is this Raven character, anyhow? I could use a word or two with him. Kermervan was making undignified stuttering sounds. Oh, I believe you he managed to say at last. You would not say anything so ridiculous if it were not the truth. But suppose I said I saw the maiden Sathana swimming up to join us here, eh? Because it's about as likely. What do you mean? cried Elof. 
I mean, you Smith of strange marvels. But then he shook his head and looked around uneasily. I cannot say. I have to think. Later, not now. Not now, groaned Elof. But I have to know what to do now. You see what I have unleashed. Kermavan visibly gathered his wits and considered. Yes, and I can find some counsel in what you have told me. What can be made, as I said, can be unmade, or it can be countered. Make some other weapon, since this peculiar power of yours is with you once more, and go up against it. But how? breathed Elof. I lack the knowledge. Which your former master has. A problem, yes. But do you not see that he also lacks something? The power. The art, or whatever you call it. Or he would have made such a terrible thing himself and never have entrusted it to an apprentice. Perhaps he did not expect it to come so powerful from your hands. But I wonder. That absence of his was so convenient. He may have been tempting you to see what you might produce. He may even have planted the seed of that betrayal of your fellow apprentice in your mind, which would lift some of it from you. But whatever the reason, you have one great comfort, evidently. In this strange art of yours, you are more potent than he. Elof sat gaping like an idiot as the clear, cold voice hammered home its truths. Waves washed through him as they fell against the beach, and he felt something burgeon within him, rising from toe-tip to the roots of his hair, so that it bristled and rose. His hand sank to the goad at his belt, closed around characters he had remembered. Yes, he breathed. It must be so. He knew. So, then your problem is simple. Find yourself a better master and learn what you need from him. But who? Most master smiths would have no truck with a vagrant like me, except old Huron, and he knows nothing of the kind of things I would need. No masters among men, maybe, but there are others. Others? I. And you have met them already, and that alone is like a meeting out of dreams to me, or a childhood fable. Again, your master has kept you ignorant of what might serve you in the world, for it has long been said that in the high mountains bordering both Northland and Southland dwell the elder folk, the stunted ones that in your northern tongue are named the Durger. In my tongue? asked Elof. But before you used it I never heard the name, not even as a childhood tale. Though I was not told many tales, no, not even then. Yet it is known even in our poor cloistered Southlands, where no legends ride abroad to smithy doors. In the wild lands on our inland marches, under the shadow of the mountains and the great forest, only a few dwell, hillmen and hunters, simple at best, more often cloven in mind. Some claim to have occasional meetings on the high slopes with the elders of the mountains, and they revere them more than their own civilized lords. He shook his head. It is said they are the greatest masters of smithcraft, and once taught our ancestors. It is said also that seeking them out is deadly peril. He sighed. But our need is great, and you who are so powerful a smith might find welcome among them, for they are clearly no friends of the man you seek to counter, and once you saved them from him. Most important of all, you know what no others seem to. A region where they may actually dwell. I do, mused Elof. Though the aid I gave them is paid, surely, and it would be a long and dangerous journey alone. So it would. But you need not go alone. I will come with you, if, after all, I have said, you can tolerate me. Tolerate you? Elof looked askance at the tall young man beside him, selecting another pebble to throw with deep care and concentration. He thought of a flying leap between ships in poor light, in armor, that would drag a man down living into Amakak's jaws if he so much as slipped, all to save lives among his crew. But you have a purpose here, among the corsairs. My purpose is fighting the Ekwesh, that tore me from my home and what shreds of prosperity and influence I yet enjoyed. 
I had hoped to lead this ship in time, to buy and recruit others, and weld them into a real shielding force. But last night I saw finally that for all that butcher's work, all the lives lost, I had hardly scratched the surface of their armor. One ship, a thirtieth part of a tenth part of their present fleet, and that barely a tenth of what their force might be if they are united under one banner. That above all I must fight. And I do firmly believe that you have been sent to me to do that. You, Smith, you are my chance, and I must not fail it, or you. I ask again, will you go with me? How old are you, Kermer Van? Twenty-five years. You look older. I am only twenty, twenty-one at most, and hardly fit, it seems, to be running loose in this world. If you will tolerate me, why then, I'll go with you gladly.